Hello and welcome to the show. <laughs> uh, we have covered Return of the Living Dead in so many different ways on this channel. I I'm kind of amazed that we have talked about Return of the Living Dead as much as we have, considering that it's a movie, you know, like one movie. I mean, we have just explored endlessly oceans well we've talked about the sequels too in any case i have gotten several requests from people uh to read the novelization and i thought about it and entertained the idea and thought you know that might be a lot of fun so <laughs> in order to be as thorough as, as we can with our return of living dead fandom we are going to read Return of the Living Dead chapter by chapter. You can think of this as an audiobook. That's the best way to think about it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just take it chapter by chapter. There's 13 chapters. I think I'm going to do two chapters a month. That's the plan right now. We'll see. And we will just we will go through the entire book uh front to cover. And before we get started, we are going to once again just talk very briefly about the back history. For those of you who have not seen the previous streams in regards to this, I, I purchased this. This is from 1985. It's a very old book. It's as old as me. I'm 36 years old, and so is this book. And you'll notice that the cover art is not the poster because this book, uh, I believe this book might have come out before the the cover art came out I, I don't know how else to explain this sort of stock zombie photograph although you would imagine that maybe that's what the tar man might kind of look like in some way shape or form it's really it's a really grisly sort of image and well you know what this is this is the uk version of the book that's what this is this is the uk version i don't know if they ever Printed it in America. It says first published in 1985. It's copyright copyright by John Russo in 1985. But I think this is a British press. Yeah, printed and brown, printed and bound in Great Britain by Anchor Brendan Limited, Tiptree in Essex. Note to readers: This novel is based on the film of the same name and is markedly different from the earlier novel of the same title by John Russo, which it was originally published by Hamlin Paperbacks. And maybe that's why it only came out in Europe, maybe, or maybe why it was pressed in Britain, because there was the American version of Return of the Living Dead. I, I don't know. That's that's a guess. That's a guess for you. That This part of the history is not really covered. But the long and the short of it goes like this. John Russo of night writer of night of living dead writes a sequel called return of living dead that gets that comes out in 77 or 78 78 it's the same year as dawn of the dead you'd imagine that he saw that george was doing dawn of the dead and wanted to do his own follow-up and that's also very you know there was i believe there was some legal proceedings and that's where you get the split where russo and the russo verse is uh living dead and everything that's Romero verse is of the dead. So Romero just retained the dead part and Russo does the living dead part. And Return of the Living Dead is absolutely a sequel to Night of the Living Dead. In my personal opinion, it is absolutely as much of a follow up to Night of the Living Dead as Dawn of the Dead is. It just is separate continuity, I guess. It's meta before meta. And John Russo can't really take credit for the actual story of Return of the Living Dead because what happened was when Dan O'Bannon, who made the film, he wrote and directed the film, when he came aboard after Toby Hooper uh, sort of bowed out, he rewrote the, the script from scratch. Dan O'Bannon being of alien fame, right? He rewrote the script from scratch and sort of uh, just did took whatever George was doing and did the opposite of it. 
Your zombies move slow. My zombies move fast. Your zombies eat flesh. My zombies only eat brains. Your zombies can't talk and aren't very smart. My zombies have sent are sentient and can speak and have memories and all sorts of, of jazz like that. And, you know, plus you got the punk rock thing. Just all this, all this different stuff that makes Return of the Living Dead so special to all of us. And then what happened was John Russo, who had written because he had, I guess he had he had optioned the rights to Tom Fox. Tom Fox is the producer on the first two or three Return of the Living Dead films. He passed away, not of like Fox, like Fox the the movie studio Fox, twentieth century Fox. The guy's name was Tom Fox. He he became the he was the financial sort of right holding producer of Return of the Living Dead. And so what happened was him and Bannon, they were going to make do the movie. Bannon did a page one rewrite of the story. It's really cool. If you can find the original script, it's awesome. There's definitely a couple of little things that aren't in the film as well, uh, particularly a little scrap of a scene with chickens. (laughs) <laughs> where uh, suicide almost runs over some chickens. Really weird to include in the script, but it's there. And so, so they, they, but what they, but what happened was next, John Russo, then for whatever reason, he wrote this novelization based on Dan O'Bannon's script. That's what happens. So it's like this weird sort of, you know, hand washing hand effect. It starts with Russo, then it goes to O'Bannon, then back to Russo again. So Russo adds, he, you're going to hear some things that are definitely not in the film. He adds a little bit of subplot and sort of, you know, injects some of his own sort of, you know, uh, flavor into O'Bannon's story. But it's still an interesting read, and there are some truly terrifying moments. I'm going to try and do mostly a straight read. It's not going to be my read with commentary, although I may break from time to time. I'm not. I've never done. This is my first time doing like an audiobook. <laughs> But why not? Um, let's attempt it. I don't know if I can read with the sunglasses on, so I may ditch them. Uh, let us begin. So <laughs> I can't bend the spine all the way back because it's a very old book. I'm, I'm just going to take these off because I'm not going to be able to see what I'm doing. All right. Chapter one. Freddie Travis was sitting on the john thinking, hoping that his boss wouldn't come hunting for him in the men's room and fearing if his boss did barge in on him, the lack of stink would give away the fact that he didn't really have to take a crap. At age 22, Freddie would have Freddie was having a hell of a time adjusting to his first for real full time job. Like being a nine to fiver was incredibly tough to handle, especially without doing a little speed or popping a couple of perks or something. Man, he told himself, maybe you're trying to get too straight too fast, like going cold turkey. It can really screw up your system. But he was determined to hang in as long as he could take it. Too much more of the street scene and he'd be dead. Up until a few weeks ago, he had been under the illusion that he was on a glide rather than a nosedive, cruising along, not giving a shit, spouting off the motto he had copped from an old black and white gangster flick, live fast, die young, and make a good looking corpse. But now he was scared shitless of dying young. His mind was all bent out of shape from when he and his girlfriend, Tina, had found their pal Sunshine naked on his bathroom floor, all bloated and green and stinking of gangrene, the broken syringe and needle still sticking in his arm. Seeing Sunshine like that and not quite turned, uh, seeing Sunshine like that had not quite turned Freddy into a born-again straight, but it had been the first step in his conversion. He was trying damned hard to get his act together, but sometimes his doubts about himself were enough to give him the shakes. If he didn't have Tina pulling for him, he wouldn't have a prayer. He figured that by now, the rest of the gang would know he was working as a shipping clerk at Unita Medical Supply Warehouse. Tina would have had to come clean because otherwise everybody just keep bugging her about why her old man had been totally splitsville the last couple of days. It was okay for Chuck to know he was a fairly straight dude, almost as unspacey as Tina. 
Casey would take it in her stride too, outside of being sort of a nymphomaniac. Her head was on her shoulders pretty much all of the time. Her head on her shoulders pretty much of the time. But meat and scuzz and legs, they would flip out. To them, any kind of job was really rad. They were punkers through and through. As hardcore as Freddie had been till Sunshine's OD had opened his eyes. They were punkers through and through. And though as hardcore as Freddie had been till Sunshine's OD, he had opened his eyes. He stood up, buckled his jeans, came out of the stall, glancing around nervously, still expecting his boss to pop in on him. When it didn't happen, he decided to fudge a few more minutes. One of the things that had him so damn shaky was that right after lunch, four hours ago, he had been given the job of packing up a human brain preserved in formaldehyde, which had been ordered by a medical college in Duluth. It was a miracle that he managed not to toss his cookies right then and there. Stomach acid still popped up in his throat every time he remembered what a brain looked like. He tried not to think about it, but he couldn't get the grisly image out of his head. Head! Even the word head made him think about the brain floating around in a bottle. When he applied for this job, he had pictured himself packing up wheelchairs and stethoscopes. Nice, sedate, helpful stuff. No way had he imagined that he'd have to handle human organs and body parts preserved in formaldehyde. If he had a glimmer of such madness, he sure as hell would have stayed away from Unita Medical Supply. After washing his hands, he took off his red baseball cap and looked at himself in the mirror. He barely recognized the straight dude that stared back at him, clean-shaven, with his, with his short-cropped brown hair neatly parted and combed, except for the little golden ring in his right ear and the cartoon drawing of a turd on his yellow t-shirt with the caption, I got my shit together, he could have damn near passed for an Ivy Leaguer from the mid-60s. Up until last week, his hair had been in cornrows and pigtails, and his face had been painted in zany designs of orange, purple, and chart chartreuse. But he sacrificed his need for individual ex artistic expression in order to become a cog in the wheel of commerce. Freddie was thankful that his first week at the big, gloomy warehouse would be a short one. Fourth of July fell on a Wednesday this year, so it would make for a nice, long weekend. Starting off on a two-day week was the main reason Freddie had believed he might be able to endure the suffering of easing himself into a routine. But unfortunately, his boss had sounded on him sticking around for some the uh, but unfortunately, his boss had sounded him on stick had sounded him on sticking around for some overtime, and he was scared to say no. Deep down, he understood that he absolutely mustn't blow this job. <laughs> Sorry, I have to take that last one again. Deep down, he understood that he absolutely mustn't blow this job. <laughs> Sorry. He had to prove it to himself. Otherwise, he might end up like his pal Sunshine. In a sudden seizure of panic, he might have been goofing off too long. He barged out of the men's room and almost spa smacked his boss, Frank Nello, in the face with the door. But Nello jumped back with remarkable agility, considering he was 45 years old and about the same number of pounds overweight. Christ, what are you trying to do, kid? Kill me? He complained good-naturedly. I was worried about you. I came to see if maybe you fell in. Constipated, Freddie mumbled. That's my problem. Want some x lax I keep a supply in the office at all times, said Frank. No, thanks. It was a hard one, but I finally forced it out, Freddie lied. <laughs> Sorry. Well, it's past quitting time. While you were on the throne, everybody went home except you, me, and the warehouse foreman, Bert Wilson. He's making his rounds, checking security. Fred clapped Freddy on the shoulder. I don't mind telling you. I like the way you hauled ass today, kid. I had my doubts about you because of that ring in your ear. My advice is to get rid of it if you want to look more mature. Last kid we hired was one of those turned out to... Last kid we hired with one of those turned out to be a friggin' doper. 
We didn't need to fire him. He quit when he found out the kind of medical supplies we were shipping out here don't include drugs. He peered at Freddie sharply to see if the mention of the word drugs might cause the kid to drool out the mouth. But Freddie kept a poker face. He already pegged Frank Nello as a sort of Italian Archie Bunker, a portly, balding clown with a red bulbous nose, likable in spite of his prejudice against anyone under 30 who didn't aspire to own a, to owning a fat mortgage on a ticky tacky house in the suburbs with aluminum siding, a one car garage, a set of rusty swings and seesaws in the backyard for the 2.3 kids. His nose might have turned that way from drinking too much whiskey and beer, but it was a okay to him because he didn't consider alcohol a drug. You got to learn the warehouse kid, Frank lectured. We were too busy today for me to try and teach you the ropes good and proper. That's why I asked you to hang in after quitting time. Now that the shit has stopped hitting the fan around here, we can, we can hear ourselves think a little bit. Believe me, if you want to get ahead, you got to know the layout like the back of your hand. Fred waved his arm around the aisles and tiers of green steel shelving in the big, dusty, barn-like building as if he were a monarch gesturing grandiosely at the splendors of his domain. It was clear that he identified completely with his work here and took great pride in it. His clean gray work clothes were crisply starched and pressed. And there was a red and white, you need a medical supply patch on his breast pocket. Putting his arm around Freddie in a fatherly way, he said, let me give you another piece of friendly advice, kid. No offense now, okay? Sure, Freddie said, trying, to, trying hard to feel just a trace of the warmth that his boss obviously felt for the warehouse. But to him, it felt like a cluttered jail, or worse, a morgue. The few narrow windows in the place were so grimy they almost didn't exist, but merely blended into the walls of corrugated steel reaching up, uh, of corrugated steel reaching up to a corrugated steel roof, and a tangle of steel girders. The naked light bulbs dangling down from the girders had halos around them, caused by dust. In the lack of sunlight and fresh air. Freddie could almost feel himself turning into a ghastly, sickly color like his pal Sunshine. He had to force himself to pay attention to Frank Nello. Get yourself a nice working uniform like I got. Show Bert, Bert Wilson you got the proper attitude. You want to get ahead? That shit t-shirt, that shitty t-shirt you're wearing might be all right for a gag or a Halloween party or something. But... In regular everyday life, a lot of people might be offended by a picture of a turd, even if it's done in jest. I'll get rid of it, Freddie promised, trying not to let despair show in his voice as he felt his sense of individuality being squeezed out of him. He thought that not wearing the t-shirt anymore might be like ditching a good luck charm. He needed the reminder, I got my shit together. Otherwise, he might start believing that he really didn't. You can keep the baseball cap, Frank said. People can get by with baseball caps, but the ring in the ear and the t-shirt you can do without. Gotcha, Freddie murmured. Just then a gray steel door across the aisle from the men's room popped open and Bert Wilson came up from the basement. He was a big, freckled, red-headed man with thick-lensed black frame glasses dressed in the same kind of gray work for work clothes as Frank Nello, including the Unita medical supply patch on the breast pocket. The uniform wasn't company issue, so somebody was copying. And Fred guessed that Frank might be must be patterning himself patter, patterning himself after Bert in order to score brownie points. Hey Frank, it's quitting time, the warehouse foreman boomed. Go home, enjoy your holiday. He jingled a set of keys on a fat ring. Everything's ship shape, tight as a drum. I'm going to stick around for a while, Frank Nello said to Bert Wilson. Got some orders to fill. The kid's going to stay here with me and pick up some juicy overtime. I want him to learn the ropes real fast so he can take up more of the slack. Okay, but lock up the office and turn on the alarm when you leave, will you? And remember, you and the family are invited to my place tomorrow for my annual 4th of July barbecue. Wouldn't miss it for the world, Frank beamed. You're invited too, kid, Bert said to Freddie. Think you can make it? Gee, thanks, but... 
but I already promised to go to my girlfriend's place. Freddie lied. Her folks are expecting us. Okay, well, maybe next year, Bert said. He smiled good-heartedly. I think you're still going to be with us come next year. Frank has a lot of good things to say about you at lunch. Frank had a lot of good things to say about you at lunchtime. Well, thanks, Fred stammered. Bert Wilson left and Frank and Freddie were alone in the huge warehouse. Freddie felt dismal, almost scared. He worried a little over whether Bert's security check was valid. How could anyone really be sure that some freak wasn't hiding somewhere around here? The place was a vast maze of potential hiding places. The stark overhead lighting cast a tangle of black shadows among the tall shelves and aisles of various sized crates and boxes. Anybody or anything could be lurking. Walk down any of these aisles alone and a rabid rat or raving hatchet murderer might jump out at you. Freddie made up his mind to try and stick close to Frank, if possible, while they were working alone tonight. First, let's grab a cup of coffee to get our brains stimulated, Frank said. They went to where the coffee machine was, in the cluttered office that Frank shared with Bert Wilson, where each man had his own gray steel desk surrounded by tall black filing cabinets piled high with company forms and logbooks. Freddie and Frank sipped black coffee in plastic cups as Frank rifled through a stack of purchase orders on a clipboard and Freddie peered over his shoulder, trying to look intensely interested. Okay, Freddie, said Frank. We got an order here for two skeletons for the St. Louis University School of Medicine. See the specs here? Yeah, said Freddie, reading over Frank's shoulder. They want two adult female skeletons with perfect teeth. Frank emphasized, tapping the order form with his index finger. That's an AF-1. You could look it up here in the logbook, but I don't have to because I know it off by heart. I have to learn everything by heart, Freddie asked, failing to hide his dismay. It'll come easy to you, smart kid like you, Frank soothed. You'll see. Mark my words. By the time you fill a couple of hundred forms... You won't need to rely on the logbook too much, except for special items nobody wants, but once in a coon's age. He rubbed his hands together with enthusiasm. Come on, let's get started. Done with your coffee? Uh-huh, Freddie said, gulping it down. Picking up the clipboard, Frank led the way. Two adult females with perfect teeth, he repeated, exuberant in his knowledge of exactly where to find them. As I said, that's an AF-1. So we go to the A section, which is divided into M and F. He stopped facing Freddy, hands on his hips, clipboard under his right arm. Now, what do you suppose M and F stand for? Male and female, Freddy responded. You got it. Bright kid. Come on. He led the way into the A section where dozens of human skeletons were hanging from steel poles by means of wire hooks attached to their heads. The skeletons were wrapped in transparent plastic bags that gave Freddy the creeps. Trying not to think of what they really were, he tried to pretend that they were suits and garment ba bags hanging up on a rack at a dry cleaning establishment. He wondered if sunshine was reduced to a skeleton yet. He guessed not. It would take longer than a few weeks. Probably the flesh was still moldering from the bones eaten by worms. Freddy shuddered and tried to pause the thought out of his mind. He tried to push the thought. Blah, 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 blah. He tried to push the thought out of his mind. There's one with perfect teeth, Frank said cheerfully. Take it down from the rack. Freddie trembled. Got a chill, kid? Frank said. I'm a bit chilly myself. We can turn on the we can turn the air conditioning down. No need for it to be up so high now that there aren't a bunch of guys in here putting putting out body heat, stealing himself. Freddie lifted the surprisingly light human skeleton holding it by its head. Right here, right here. There's the packing crate, Freddy instructed. See, we just put a bed of excelsior in here, unnerved by staring face to face into the skeleton's eye sockets. Freddy was grateful of the opportunity to lower it into the packing crate, which reminded him of a coffin. Now we put some more excelsior all around, Fred said. Freddy helped him, anxious to get the bones covered up. You perspiring kid, Frank said. First you got the chills, then the sweats. You think you might be coming down with the flu? Maybe you ought to stay home tomorrow, even if it is the fourth. 
No, I'm okay, Freddie protested, feeling better now that the pink Excelsior was covering the skeleton. He helped Frank put the lid on the crate. Then, as Frank made a notation on the purchase order, Freddie asked, where in the world did they get all these skeletons? I asked Bert Wilson that question once. I don't know if he was teasing me or not, but he claims they come from India. An international treaty, he told me. All skeletons come from India. Is that right? How come? I swear, I don't have the slightest idea, but sometimes I wonder how they get all these skeletons with perfect teeth. How many people you know die with, a, with perfect teeth? Gotta have a few cavities, right? Frank chuckled. I think maybe they have a skeleton farm somewhere over in India. Overpopulation, Freddie said. Disease, starvation. A lot of Hindus die young. They don't live long enough to get to even get tooth decay. You a philosopher, kid? Frank asked. You're spouting off some pretty deep stuff. <laughs> what? <laughs> he eyed Freddie piercingly as if he had given evidence of being a communist. And then he pivoted and said, come on, I want to show you some stuff you didn't get to see the last couple of days because it was so damn hectic around here. Freddie followed with trepidation, hoping that he wouldn't have to look at any more skeletons. Frank said, you already know where the prosthetic limbs are, right? And the wheelchairs, gurneys, and the beds for invalids, and the oxygen, that's where we keep it. Watch out for the oxygen. It's explosive. Don't smoke around it. Mr. Wilson told me not to smoke anywhere in the warehouse, Freddie said. That's right. But sometimes a guy weak, a guy might weaken and sneak one. I noticed you got cigarettes in your jacket when you hung it up this morning. All I'm saying is, if you are ever going to sneak one, don't do it around the oxygen section, or you might blow us all to kingdom come. I'm not going to smoke on the job at all, Freddie promised. And he was scared enough of the thought of blowing himself up that his promise was sincere, even though he was dying to get some nicotine into his lungs. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, said Frank, but I don't believe you ever had to fill out an order for a split dog. Split dog, Freddie said perplexedly. That's what I said, Frank chuckled, split dog. Here's one. He pointed at a shelf where a black and white mongrel stood mounted on a stand. At first, Freddie didn't notice anything unusual about the animal other than the, the, other than the fact that it was dead and mounted like a taxidermist trophy. But then Frank pulled it out and spun it around, and it was truly a split dog. An embalmed half of a dog split down the middle so that its organs could be viewed in a cross-section. Yipe! Freddie gulped. I admit it's grotesque, but you get used to it, said Frank. They split dog. The split dogs are for veterinary schools. Veterinary schools. This is the only one we have on hand right now. We get an awful lot of orders for split dogs, so you'll be handling them day in and day out. Turn it back around, said Freddy. Turn it back around, Freddie said. If I have to handle them, I'll never turn one around. I'll pretend the other side is whole. Don't be squeamish, kid. It don't pay off around here, Frank advised. You think split dogs are bad? What about the humans? We keep dead humans around here, too. How come Bert Wilson didn't tell me, Freddie stammered. He n never mentioned anything like that when he first interviewed me for the job. I guess he figured you already knew, or at least could guess. After all, this is a medical supply firm. Everybody knows doctors practice on dead bodies. Come on, I have to show you where we keep them. Wondering how he could make his feet go where, when he was half paralyzed with fright, Freddie tagged along with Frank Nello. He tried to bolster his nerve by telling him that he probably wasn't going to see any decomposed bodies. He wasn't going to see anybody that looked like sunshine, all bloated and green. Doctors like fresh corpses to practice on, corpses that were well-preserved. Frank walked Freddie over the big freezer door and opened the door, and they went in. Frank stood frozen in the doorway. Come on, kid, Frank bellowed. I don't want to linger here and catch a cold. I want to show you what's here and get out. Don't be scared to come in. Somebody who's already half dead is safe. Only living people can hurt you. Freddie made him... Freddie made himself enter the dreaded freezer. Frank explained, this is where we keep the fresh cadavers. We sell them to medical schools and to other places, sometimes to the U.S. Army for ballistics tests and whatever. 
Right now, there's only one cadaver on hand. We're low on inventory, but we got a shipment coming in on Monday. Freddy's eyes bulged as Frank slid a large steel drawer part of the way out revealing a dead young man about Freddie's age, all wrapped up in plastic. There were no marks on the body, no indication as to the cause of death. His imagination prodded by fear, Freddie wondered if maybe there was a corpse farm somewhere, like the skeleton farm in India, where healthy people were made to die in untelltale ways so that a continuous flow of cadavers could be insured for medical schools and for ballistic tests for the U.S. Army. Let's get out of here before we catch pneumonia and wind up like this poor stiff, Frank said, slamming the steel door shut. A lot of foreshadowing in this book. <laughs> Freddie gladly backed out of the cold storage locker, trying not to hurry as much as he wanted to, so his boss wouldn't laugh at him for being scared. How many bodies are usually in here? Usually, he asked in what hoped was a conversational tone. Well, we try not to overstock. It's like a restaurant business. You don't want your inventory to lose its freshness. Chortling at his own joke, Freddy clapped. Fre Frank clapped Freddy on the back. Come on back and help me nail the lid on that skeleton, and I'll show you how to fill out the shipping forms. The door to the cold storage locker had been standing open. Freddy closed it, much to Fred. Fre the door to the cold storage locker had been standing open. Frank closed it, much to Freddy's relief, but it promptly came open again. How come you don't lock it? Freddy ventured. I see a, ha a hasp and a padlock there, but it wasn't on when we came, even though Mr. Wilson checked security. We don't usually like to use that lock, said Frank. Too much trouble to always be fussing with the combination. Most of us don't come in here unless we have to, and there's certainly nothing in here a thief would want to bring home. But you got to always remember to close this door. Good, or else it pops open. He slammed the door hard, stared at it, and it stayed shut. Let's lock it, Freddy suggested. No, nah, it'll stay now. I got the right touch. But Freddy remained doubtful as they walked back towards the skeleton they had to finish getting ready for the shipment. Now he knew he was in the presence of a corpse that might not stay locked up. He was truly anxious to get away from the warehouse. In a meek voice, as so as not to piss Frank off, he, he asked, How late do you think we'll work? The only reason I ask is I have a date for 8 o'clock. Frank glanced at his wristwatch. Maybe we'll keep at it another hour or so and then knock off. What's the matter? You don't like making time and a half? I thought I was doing you a favor. Young kid trying to get started in life. Oh, well, I really appreciate it, Frank. Honestly, I do. But Frank smirked knowingly. Got something hot waiting for you, huh? M my girlfriend, Tina Vitali. Last name's Vitali, Frank said. Nice, clean Italian girl. I'm sorry, kid. I didn't mean to. That's okay, Frank. I forgot you mentioned a steady girlfriend. I better watch my mouth from here on out. I don't usually like to talk that way about a nice, clean girl. I understand, said Freddie, hoping Frank's sense of propriety and embarrassment would lead him to atone by letting him get off work in a short while. And that brings us to the end of chapter one. Um, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll close out by sort of just a little discussion. So you notice there already there's a few differences there. In the, the walk-in freezer, there are drawers. In the movie, it's, you know, a hanging cadaver. And they leave the padlock unlocked. And obviously, we all know how the movie goes. You wouldn't be watching this or listening to this book if you didn't already have seen the movie, if you hadn't already had seen the movie. And you also notice some difference in names. There, there's meat. Meat is suicide, I believe. And no, meat is spider. Suicide is still in the script. And legs is trash. And you'll notice that there's this whole backstory about sunshine. You'll also notice like John Russo's writing. He's really trying to sound hip in the 80s. He's trying to talk about like, it sounds like, a, like an older hippie, right? It's like an older 
hippie who's grown up trying to relate to the young kids, I guess, with some of his writing. But some of his writing is quite good. I like it. So uh, I'll keep it short. Uh, tune in next time for chapter two, and that's how we'll do it. We'll just go chapter by chapter with a little bit of an intro and a little bit of a commentary afterwards. Um, thank you so much. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe, and yada, 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 all the rest. Hello and welcome back. Here we are reading Return of Living Dead, the novelization, now a major film. If you're 36 years late on the news, this novelization was written by John Russo, adapted from Daniel Bannon's screenplay, page one rewrite of John Russo's original idea. Um <clears throat> Every I, I think I initially said we would do a chapter every other week, but in the effort of getting through 18 chapters, I think there's about 18 chapters in here. We're going to try and uh, we're going to bulk it up a little bit. So uh, we're going to do a chapter a week. And in this case, because chapter two is so short, we're going to do two and three together. So let's dive right into it. Uh, I will interject slightly, maybe along the way if it calls for it, but I don't want to interrupt the reading experience once I begin. <clears throat> Not wearing the sunglasses because it just interrupts in the reading. And the last thing I will say is I apologize. This is tiny print. I'm in a dark room. It's hard to read. Chapter two, where we last left off. Eh, you know what? You just read the first part. You don't need to know about the second part. Uh, chapter two. To the beat of loud punk music come, coming from Scuzz's Ghetto Blaster, a gigantic metallic radio tape player carried like a suitcase on his shoulder, Tina Vitali and the rest of the gang bopped along the sidewalk in a sleazy, rundown section of Louisville. Tina wasn't saying much. Inside, she was thinking about what, uh, inside, she was thinking what to her were deep thoughts. Like her boyfriend, Freddie Travis, Tina had been forced into some heavy soul searching by the trauma of fund finding sunshine dead from a heroin overdose. Nowadays, she found herself constantly reevaluating herself and her world instead of having pure, unadulterated fun all the time like she used to. Sometimes when she and Freddie were making love, an act that was supposed to lead to the creation of life. <laughs> That's John. There's John Russo for you. She would find herself thinking of how terribly brief life could actually be and wondering if the pain and fear of death were a fair price to pay for a short flurry of joyful existence. One such uh, one such once such thoughts pried their way into her mind. She couldn't banish them very easily. And while she was thinking them, she could not have an orgasm. After faking a few times, she had finally leveled with Freddie about her hangup. He had been touchingly understanding and sympathetic, and this had made her fall more deeply in love with him. But her ability to love was tainted by her torment over whether it was truly worthwhile to love someone for a brief interlude on the way to the grave. Wow. <laughs> If she had the nerve to tell those things to anyone in the gang other than Freddie, forget it. They'd say, hey, you're a groovy chick with everything going for you. So play it cool and stop freaking yourself out, man, because that's how punks talk. She knew that she was a good she knew that she was good looking with her long black hair, prominent cheekbones, full lips and big, firm breasts. But she wasn't vain about her physical attributes. She feared that at 20, she was already an old lady, aged prematurely, not outwardly, but deep inside. In a way, she envied her shallower but happier friends, Meat, Chuck, Scuzz, Casey, and Legs. Remember, Legs is trash, Meat is uh, Spider who had stayed quirky, carefree, and innocent because they had not breathed the aura of sh Sunshine's death. They were a motley, unlikely looking group of comrades moving to their own beat through the neighborhood of slumlord tenants, tenements 
boarded up storefronts and weedy lots full of tumbled down bricks and broken glass. Meat was the only one who was not Caucasian. Uh, his skin was almost as black as a piano key. Wow. He had a reggae cut with long pleated, plated, pleated, plated, I guess is how it's P L A I T E D plated dreadlocks. His shirt and trousers were shiny black too. <laughs> and so were his platform shoes. Doesn't sound like, doesn't sound very punky to me. Although, Again, punk is not a uh, punk is not uh, a uniform, right? Chuck was a straight, middle class, white looking, very square with a sandy crew cut and a sprinkle of freckles in his tan cuffed chinos and striped. Sorry, in his tan cuffed chinos like pants and striped short sleeve shirt. He was like a refugee from the Ivy League of the 50s, and he came off that way on purpose as kind of a campy personal statement about God knows what. Kind of like, uh, what's his face, uh, Jason in SLC Punk. Uh, what's his face, uh, actor. Um, Scuzz was tall and skinny in a green jumpsuit with a matching green mohawk haircut. Legs, his weird, sexy girlfriend, had short, had her short, butchered-up hair dyed blue, she wore bl a blue sleeveless T-shirt stretched tight enough to show her protruding nipples, blue short shorts, blue plastic boots, and blue leg warmers. Casey was almost as straight looking as Chuck, blonde, brash, and bouncy with a sensually voluptuous body. She was wearing tight purple slacks, white sneakers, and a tight white turtleneck. Chuck had a crush on Casey. He had confided this to Tina and no one else. He was too shy to mention it to the object of his affection. Who knew anyway and was stringing him along? So these guys sound like the Power Rangers kind of a little bit. And uh, uh, one other quick note that Scuzz's girlfriend is trash in this. Legs is Scuzz's girlfriend. Meat, who tore Chuck apart, although he tried. Uh, wait, Meat. Wait, uh, we missed something here. Casey sometimes slept with Meat, who tore Chuck apart. Although he tried to be cool enough not to show it. Hey, are we going to party tonight or what? Casey said to everybody, but mostly to Meat. Yeah, we're going to party, babe. Meat drawled. Well, where? Where are we going to party? Huh? Said Scuzz, turning the volume down on his ghetto blaster. Where are we going to party tonight? Casey yelled. Meat picked up half a brick and lobbed it through the broken window of a defunct supermarket, shattering some more of the glass. I don't know, he said lazily. Somewhere, somewhere over the rainbow. That's where we're going to party. We could go to the park, Casey suggested. Nah, the cops will shoot us if we go back in the park, Chuck reminded. Scuzz snickered, showing his broken front teeth, his mohawk haircut blowing in the f faint July breeze. We could take the cops up on it, he said. That would be a real death trip. Ooh, Tina trembled inwardly. I like death, said Legs. I like death with sex, said Meat. How about you, Casey? Do you like sex and death? Meat, fuck off and die, Casey said without malice. Tina, so this is all very fam familiar dialogue, but it's sort of jumbled around a little bit. Tina thought to herself, they wouldn't dare talk like that if they had seen sunshine the way me and Freddie saw him, unless they're unless all their loud, brazen talk is their way of proving that they can still be brave after death has come so close. But it came closer to me. That's why I'm scared to even talk about it, why it plagues my thoughts all the time. Casey, will you have sex with me, Chuck asked, working up his nerve to actually say it, but in a kidding way. Go choke a chicken, Chuck, Casey said. We could go to the rat club, legs piped up sh shrilly and gleefully. Nah, Scuzz squelched. Scuzz squelched. They closed it down, and you got to be 21 to get into head cheese. I'm old enough, said Meat. So is Casey. Yeah, but you're the only one, said Tina, not really in the mood for going to a disco. So how about it, Tina? Meat asked her. Where can we party tonight? Tina suddenly decided she'd rather be alone with Freddie instead of with a whole gang of people. Hey, you guys, she said. A party would be really rad, but I'm supposed to go meet Freddie when he gets off work. Yeah, Casey said. Uh, where are you supposed to meet him? 
at this medical supply warehouse where he's working. He got a job, Scuzz sneered. What a queeb. Don't knock it, Scuzz, Casey advised. He gets a payday. He'll buy us all some dope. Why don't we all pick up Freddy up? Blah. Why don't we all pick Freddy up? I was wondering where he disappeared to. Let's show him that we aren't just we aren't down on him just because he got a job. Hey, you guys, Tina interjected, trying not to sound frantic. I'm sure it would be really rad for all of us to bop over there. But after all, Freddie's bound to be pretty tired. To Tina's relief, Meat backed her up saying, yeah, you're right. Anyway, we got no car. But Casey wasn't so willing to let the issue drop. How are you getting there? She said to Tina on the bus, the stinking, crowdy, crowded and sweaty bus. Shit, I ain't taking no fucking bus because bitched. It costs an arm and a leg. Yeah, all the 50 cents, Chuck jibbed. But no one gave him a laugh. Suicide has a car, Leg shrieked, as if she found a buried treasure. Oh, God, not him, sighed Casey. Why not, Scuzz challenged. Yeah, a car is a car, Legs agreed half angrily. At this point, Tina blew her cool. Hey, you guys, she shouted. This is just me and Freddy. Since when, Casey jeered. Let's all go get suicide and make him drive us over to where Freddy's working. I want to see this freaking metal medical supply warehouse. Maybe it's full of embalmed cadavers or something. Or something. All right, chapter three. Freddy Travis and Frank Nola were in the warehouse office. Freddy was, Fre Freddy was pacing and fidgeting despite his wish to not appear overly anxious to knock off work. Frank was sitting behind his desk, poring over his clipboard full of purchase orders. Outside, there was a rumbling of thunder. Frank said, shit, sounds like rain. Going to spoil the boss's barbecue tomorrow unless it lets up by morning. Frank, Freddie said, what? What's the weirdest thing you ever saw in here? Oh, Freddie, why did you ask that question? Frank put down his clipboard. <laughs> Frank put put down his clipboard and leaned back contemplate contempt contempl uh, contemplating he's contemplating but with an l y at the end and i can't pronounce the word i'm sorry contemptively contemplatively contemplatively his hands behind his head well kid i've seen weird things come and i've seen weird things go but i've seen just one weird thing that has to cap them all Oh, yeah, what's that? Freddie asked. But all of a sudden, he wasn't show, so sure he really wanted to know. By the way, you never should say oh, all of a sudden as a writer. You never do that in writing. You don't say all of a sudden. Maybe it was the thunder and the memory of the corpse locked in the cooler. But he couldn't stop the chills from coming up and down his spine. This book legitimately scared the crap out of me when I read it the first time. Let me ask you a question, said Frank. You ever see any of them movies about corpses coming back from the dead and and eating people? Frank stammered. Freddie stammered and and eating people. Freddie stammered. Sure, I've seen movies like that, but they're just movies. He tried to sound brave, but he didn't quite convince himself as shaken as he had been by seeing sunshine dead. He'd have shit his boots if sunshine had sat up and come after him. Frank said, according to a story I read in one of this, in, according to a story, Frank said, according to a story I read in one of these here magazines, like the National Enquirer, the basic idea for some of those kinds of movies came from a true incident. Nah, go on, Freddie countered with a show of bravado. You've got to be kidding me. No, Frank said soberly. What's more, I got reason to believe in what I'm telling you. It's not possible for the dead to come back to life, except maybe on Judgment Day, Freddy hedged, suddenly making up his mind to go to church more often. I, I mean, those movies, some of them were ridiculous. They showed zombies taking over the world, the whole world. Well, naturally, the movie makers changed some of the details in order to protect themselves and act like they didn't know anything for real. What actually happened was that back in about 1970, there was a chemical spill somewhere in the Pittsburgh area. That stuff leaked into the morgue, into a morgue, 
and a cemetery and made the dead bodies jump around and act like they were alive. What chemical? Freddie blurted out. Stop trying to act. stop trying to scare me, Frank. It's called 245 trioxin. They were going to use it on marijuana or something. Darrow Chemical developed it in the first place for the U.S. Army. They shut it down after the business with the corpses. But the story sort of leaked and inspired some of those zombie movies, which had some of their facts straight and some of them ass backwards. So it's not it's interesting that the guy who wrote or co-wrote the original Night of the Living Dead makes no mention of dropping the name of his own movie in here the way it is in the in the film Return of the Living Dead. That's interesting. So what really happened? Freddie asked. He couldn't help ask. He laughs. Wait, what? Wow. So what really happened? Freddie asked. He couldn't help asking. He was both intrigued and revolted by the discussion, and he still wanted to believe that Frank was merely pulling his leg. But Frank sounded so deadly serious. Well, they shut it all down, and the army took away the contain the contaminated dirt and the bodies, and they managed to pretty well keep it a secret from the public. Shh. So how come you know about it, Freddie pounced? Frank leaned forward, gl gl glowering. Don't call me a liar, kid. I know what I'm talking about. You see, the Army Transportation Depot got their orders crossed, and they brought those bodies here. Along with some other cadavers in transit from one post to another for, uh, for some of them, for some of them ballistics tests I told I was telling you about. I'm sorry, that was terrible. You see, the Army Transportation Depot got the orders crossed and they brought the bodies here along with some other cadavers in transit from one post to another for some of them ballistics tests I was telling you about. Later, some co colonel called up here having a real fit and told us to just let the shipment sit until further notice. And it's been here ever since. We never heard from the colonel again. Probably got killed in Vietnam or something. It'd be his ass if we'd had told on him. But we was scared and didn't know who to tell. Typical army fuck up. They put a bunch of corpses here and forgot about them. Why don't you sell them back to the army for ballistics tests? Freddie asked, being jokingly clever. Because they're contaminated with God knows what, says Frank. Nothing we can do with them. Even if we... The phone rang. Freddie jumped. Frank chuckled at the kid's nervousness as he picked up the receiver. It turned out to be his wife, Alice, nagging him about having a pot roast in the oven. And when he was coming home, he didn't get mad. She was a good wife and a fine mother to their two kids. It was just that, it being a holiday tomorrow. She thought he could leave at the regular quitting time like the other guys. Sorry, honey, he told her. You know, I told you about that new fellow I'm breaking in. Freddie Travis? Well, he's a good hard worker. Freddie grinned at Frank grinned at Freddie. He and I are going to be working here about another hour. Got one or two important items we want to wrap up. Freddie liked the sound of only being here another hour. Heartened, he waited while Frank bullshitted with his wife a bit longer and then hung up, telling her that he loved her and that he would see her soon. Want to see them? Frank said, looking up at Freddie. See them? The corpses. Well, what do you mean? Frank grinned, taking delight in Freddie's squeamishness. They're down in the basement. Come on. Remember, third step's a bitch. He got up and hustled out of the office, and Freddie followed hesitantly after him, wondering why he didn't stay put and telling himself it was because he didn't want to be accused of lacking any balls. So he was going to descend into a basement full of contaminated corpses. Frank unlocked the, st the steel door across the aisle from the men's room, where Bert Wilson had come up from the basement earlier after his security check. Peering from behind Frank, Freddy saw nothing but a black hole. Watch the third step, Frank said. It's a bastard, not a bitch. He, hit, he actually says it's a bastard. He hit a light switch and a bare bulb glowed dusty yellow, casting black shadows. 
down the staircase. Needing to hear the sound of human voices as a bolster against his fear, Freddy asked, you mean they just brought a bunch of bodies here and left them? You know the army, said Frank, starting to descend. And they've been here all this time? About 14 years, if I recall. Cripes! Freddy wondered what he was going to see after being dead for 14 years. What would the cadavers look like? How bad would they stink? Would the flesh be totally rotted from the bones? And might it be better if they were reduced to skeletons by now so they couldn't come back to life anymore? You coming, kid? Frank barked impatiently. Like I said, watch out for that third step. Freddy made himself follow his boss, who was already halfway down before Freddy made a move. At the bottom, Frank turned on another light. There they are, he said with a kind of glee, since he was showing off evidence that what he had told the kid up in the office was literally true. Over in a corner of the vast, filthy, musty-smelling basement stood half a dozen huge metal drums. Freddy stepped over a pile of rusty-looking water to follow Frank for a closer look. Stenciled on the sides of the drums in chipped and corroded white letters was the following information. Priority, Department of the Army, in case of emergency, call 1-800-454-8000. Despite his staunchest effort to seem nonchalant, Freddy stared at the dusty, rusty, corroded drums with a growing sense of foreboding. His heart skipped a beat as he thought about the rusty-looking puddle he had stepped over a few seconds ago. He picked his feet up and tried to see if any moisture had seeped into his sneakers. You didn't believe me, kid. Here's your proof, Frank crowd, crowed. There's bodies in there? Freddy asked meekly. Yeah, I'll show you. Never mind, I believe you. Good things these caps are plastic, said Frank. Good thing these caps are plastic, says Frank. Otherwise, with all this corrosion, they'd be stuck tight to the drums. Whoever designed them must have figured that out. Why would they want the caps so easily removed? Freddy asked fearfully, stepping back a few paces. His heel went into the rusty puddle as Frank tugged and twisted and succeeded in wrenching a filthy brown plastic cap off of one of the metal drums. Because there's kind of a porthole in here, said Frank, so the contents can be viewed and inspected. Come here and look, I'll wipe it off. Shit, said Freddy. I stepped in that puddle. With disgust, he shook his foot hard over and over as if he could shake out the water that had seeped into his shoe. So a little water ain't going to hurt you, said Frank, as he wiped the dirty, greasy porthole with an equally dirty, balled up rag that had been lying on top of one of the other drums. Freddy figured he'd take a quick glimpse through the porthole and that would be that. He forced himself to step forward. Frank stopped whipping and they both Frank stopped wiping and they both looked. All I see is a round black lump, said Freddy with a measure of relief. It could be anything in there. I told you it's a friggin' corpse, said Frank indignantly. We're looking at the top of its head. The chemicals made it turn black like that. We can get a better look if I tip the drum towards the light. Never mind. I don't like being called no friggin' liar. Help me tip this sucker. It's heavy. Reluctantly, Freddy got a hold of the drum. He, st he stared at his fingers and saw that just touching the corroded metal had coated them with a rusty, greasy film. I got a block of wood here, said Frank. We'll tip the... Hold on one second. We'll tip the sucker over towards that bright light bulb over there and then hold it steady, and I'll kick the wooden block under it to keep it in a leaning position. Then we'll have us a good look at what's inside. Freddy eyed some of the rust stains running down the sides of the drum. <laughs> These things don't leak, do they? He asked, desperate for reassurance, although it was perfectly obvious that the drums weren't sealed very well. Well, I guess after 14 years, they can't be totally leak-proof, said Frank. They were made by the Army Corps of Engineers. These guys know what they're doing. 
I'm sure they did the best job. I'm sure that they did the best job that could be done at the time. Uh, I don't know, Freddie said doubtfully. His fingers felt slimy and even stung a little from touching the drum. I thought you were anxious to cut out of here and go see your girlfriend, Frank teased. Let's stop the bullshitting and have a peek inside here. Then we can knock off. They crouched and started to push. When they got the drum tipped about six inches off the concrete floor, Frank tried to use his work shoe to kick the block of wood in place. Right at that instant, Freddie's fingers slipped and the drum rocked backwards in a sideways spin. Damn, Freddie yelled. He tried to compensate and that only made matters worse. The bottom edge of the drum slid on some greasy corrosion that had been underneath it. And that shove and the shove and the shove that Frank had applied in an effort to steady helped make it fall. With a resounding metal thud, it hit concrete. Frank and Freddie managed to jump clear. The drum rolled and smacked against two of the other ones. Then, with a loud crack and a, wel a welded seam split open, and a cloud of yellowish vapor squirted out under pressure. Frank and Freddie staggered back, coughing and choking. They both fell to the floor, clutching their throats losing consciousness the yellow vapor continued to squirt out of the fallen drum with the crack seam the black mummy-like corpse inside began to slowly dissolve boiling away to a black tarry liquid as oxygen replaced the noxious yellow fumes that were gradually escaping as the gas in the drum lost some of its pressure, it no longer spurted so violently. Instead, it fumed up out of the crack in the wheeled, rising up and rolling along the basement ceiling between the beams and towards the suction of a draft in the stairwell. Early, uh, uh, and towards the suction of a draft in the stairwell earlier descended by Frank and Freddy. So it's not going through the ducts. It's going through, it's being pulled through by the draft in the stairwell. The two men lay flat on their, on their backs, oblivious to the gas that continued to waft over and around them on its pathway to the stairwell. The smoky yellow gas floated up the basement steps and crept out onto the main floor of the warehouse. After rising through the open steel door, it then hugged the floor, retaining an eerie, unnatural cohesiveness as if in a mystical sense it felt itself to be the spirit of the corpse dissolving in the drum like the aura of death personified the noxious gas rolled towards the cold storage locker where the door that was not padlocked the door that frank had slammed suddenly clicked open the yellowish gas crawled in and around the side and the bottom edge of the freezer door and up the interior wall into the drawer-like compartment where the cadaver was lying. Remember, the cadaver is not hanging by a meat hook. It's in a, one of those cadaver drawers. Um, the vapor that had spewed into Frank and Freddy's lungs now curled and hovered around the cadaver. Wisps of the fumes entered the cadaver's nostrils and floated between its lips, while the main part of the yellowish aura hugged the cadaver's naked torso, limbs, and head. And in a little while, the cadaver started to twitch as the yellow gas caressed and enveloped it. And that brings us to the end of chapter three. Next week, we will read chapter four. So as you can see, there are definitely some more differences there. You have you you have the, the, the I had forgotten that part, actually. The, the way that the drum opens, they don't just smack it. They uh, sort of roll the drum around and it's greasy. I, I have to say, you know, we la I laugh at, at some of John Russo's writing, but some of his descriptions are terrifying. He really makes you, along with like what we've seen in the movie, he really makes you feel the environment with his descriptive words. So that's not easy to do. So while we laugh at John Russo, you know, then the flip side is, you know, you can clearly say if you're having sex is for procreation. She could not have an orgasm. She confessed it to her boyfriend. The, the, the punks were going to the disco dressed in, in shiny leather. I mean, shiny vinyl. 
you know, like uh, just like no imagination when it comes to to punk culture at the time. And that's why that feels so funny. And then the other thing, the story is slightly different. So in the movie, we never get any mention of the colonel, right? The colonel, the colonel calls up Unita and says, you know, uh, keep a lid on that or whatever, and then never calls them again. Uh, and I think we're going to find out possibly why that might have been in the next chapter. I don't remember the details. N the next chapter introduces a plot element that's really stupid and has no no business being in this. This is an invention of John Russo. The single weakest uh, component to the novelization, which is otherwise, in my opinion, as I said, really scary, really easy to read, really in engorging. And I apologize for, I hope that my stumbling over certain words didn't take you out of the story. Um, and if my interjections as well, take you out of the story, let me know. And we'll, we'll, we'll stop that next time. Okay. We'll see you next week with chapter four of return of the living dead, the novelization peace and hair grease. Cha -cha -cha. Hello and welcome to another edition of from us peace theater. I am your host, Jeff from us. Today, we shall be reading from another chapter of our book here, The Novelization of the Return of the Living Dead, adapted by John Russo, based on the screenplay by Dan O'Bannon. When we last left off in our story, our heroes, or perhaps we should think of them more as bumbling fools, uh, Frank and Freddy, accidentally released a, grow a glowing green gas known as 245 trioxin out of the barrel containing what we will here re refer to as the tar man. The gas, of course, hit our heroes in the face, causing them to pass out, and the gas creeped up into the cold refrigerator unit where it was storing a cadaver in a drawer. What? further could possibly happen let's read and find out chapter four at dacha on the outskirts of moscow moscow now that is something we uh are unfamiliar with in the return of living dead universe what does moscow have to do with anything john russo well let's find out uh on the outskirts on the outskirts of moscow two Englishman and an American were drinking vodka after a sumptuous summer cookout with their attractive Russian wives. The two Englishmen were Guy Burgess and Donald McLean, who in their high ranking posts with the British diplomatic service had fed secret information to the Soviets for 20 years before their cover was blown and they had to escape from England. The American was Raymond Ashton, who, as a Soviet agent in place, in quotes, had so cleverly deceived his superiors within the CIA that he rose to a position of trust and influence, enabling him to subvert and undermine U.S. intelligence efforts. Over a 12-year career, during which time he was secretly in the employ of the KGB, he arranged for the arrest and execution of dozens of American agents operating undercover in communist bloc nations and carried out his devastating mission so skillfully that he was never suspected as a traitor. In 1970, Raymond Ashton was the CIA's chief liaison. Boy, this is really a lot of history here. Very dense. Uh, yeah, so Raymond was the CIA's chief liaison officer with the U.S. Army in Operation Drummer Boy, the roll-up of the Daryl chemical crisis near Pittsburgh. It was Ashton who, with his intimate knowledge of cryptograph codes, succeeded in diverting 24 of the steel drums containing deactivated corpses from their intended destination, the CIA Forensic Laboratory at Langley, to the unit to the Unita Medical Supply Warehouse in Louisville, Kentucky. When the diversion was discovered by Ashton's military liaison, Colonel Peter Hoffman, 
Ashton killed off Hoffman and then fled from the United States to Canada and from Canada to Russia, where he was a welcomed hero and was awarded the Red Banner Order for Outstanding Patriotic Services over many years. That's right. A communist subplot um, in which this was no accident. It wasn't a typical army fuck up. It was uh, on purpose army fuck up to... Uh, uh, release these Easter eggs and no mention of uh, Colonel Glover, as we see in Return of the Living Dead. Raymond Ashton, Guy Burgess and Donald Donald McLean were, were rewarded for their contributions uh, to the communist cause. Oh, boy, this didn't age well. Well, maybe it did. I don't know. Uh, they were each guaranteed a si sizable pensions for life. In addition to the fat salaries they received as consultants to the KGB, their fringe benefits included chauffeur driven limousines and other special privileges normally reserved for commissars, such as access to fine wine, meat, clothing, household goods, and other capitalist luxuries. Remember, in communist Russia or in communist Soviet Union, you don't get any of that good stuff. They lived like nobility on their rent-free dakas. I guess that's a, I don't know what that is. That's like a house of some kind. While the vast majority of Soviet citizens had to wait for years to be assigned a modest one-room apartment. However, they occasionally felt twinges of nostalgia for the homelands they had betrayed, and they attempted to eradicate these maudlin sentiments by drinking too much vodka and by rehashing their past exploits in the world of international espionage. While their wives were in the house cleaning up after the picnic meal, the men talked and drank at the table on the patio. Well, tomorrow will be the big day for you former compatriots back in the States. Guy Burgess said to Raymond Ashton. Why? asked Ashton, pretending not to know. July 4th, Burgess boomed. Independence Day. The day you threw off the chains binding you to our jolly King George III. Who's jolly King George? said Donald McLean with a slurred tongue. Not mine, not yours either, old chap. Not anymore, Burgess agreed. He was a fleshy florid man with a wide fish-like mouth and a, shock, and a shock of thick, purely white hair. Snide and arrogant, he seemed... I just like reading in this voice. Snide and arrogant, he seemed the type that most people would instinctively distrust, which was perhaps why they had bent over backwards to trust him too far. McLean, by contrast, was a picture of civility slanting towards timidness when he wasn't drunk. Short and thin and balding with a small mouth and a weak chin, it didn't seem possible that he could be self-assertive, much less destructive. And this demeanor, he had helped get away with quite a lot. How long now since you, er, uh, er, uh, defected, he said to Raymond Ashton. Fourteen years, said Ashton. Oh, he's American. Fourteen years, said Ashton. Fourteen years since Operation Drummer Boy. He took a hearty sip from his tumbler full of Russian vodka, much stronger than any American brand. He was drinking it neat in that Russian manner, instead of diluting it with ice. A closet alcoholic before defecting, his alcoholism was pretty much out in the open now, especially when he was with his friends. Even so, he still had a more commanding presence than they and managed to look more youthful despite the fact that, like them, he was in his late 50s. His light brown hair did not easily show... Like, do we need all this description? Uh, his light brown hair did not easily show its streaks of gray. His pale blue eyes retained an alert, anthetical gleam, and his body was still lean and hard thanks to a daily regimen of jogging and calisthenics that kept at bay the deteriorating effects of his alcohol addiction. Uh, seems to me it's about time for the drumbeat to start rolling again, Guy Burgess joked, referring to Operation Drummer Boy. Uh, I can't, I don't know who's who. Unless they've rolled it up tight since then, said McLean. After all, they've had 14 years to do it. What do you think, Raymond? Ashton said, Comrade Zortov and I had a discussion about the very topic last week. Burgess and McLe McLean perked up. Gregory Zortov was the first director of the KGB division 
to which all three defectors had been assigned in Moscow. It was unusual these days, removed from the heavy action as they were, for any of them to have a private audience with the first director. So the other two men at the picnic table were keenly interested as to what Ashton could or would say more about what he and Zoltov had discussed. I should think, Burgess prodded, that 14 years would... <laughs> I should think, Burgess prodded, that 14 years be enough time for the CIA or the U.S. Army to locate the 24 missing drums. Yes, our former uh, uh, associates should be quite up to such a task, McLean chuckled, even with them being as incompetent as we know them to be. Burgess laughed. <laughs> but Ashton didn't. Comrade Zoltov and I believe the other... <laughs> Comrade Zoltov and I believe otherwise, he squelched, with underlying anger in his voice and a piercing cold glint in his pale blue eyes. The other two men understood why he was reacting so vehemently. He was the only he was the only one of the three whose final mission as a bona fide spy might still be playing itself out, and it might, even at this late day late date have devastating repercussions upon the enemy. The rest of the work that these defectors were concerned with these days was a dull, timid, and boring, and the insulting, demeaning part, the part that drove them all to drink too much, was that they sensed that their fellow Soviets didn't truly trust them. They had harmless, undemanding, and uninspired desk jobs as if their superiors suspected that they might switch their loyalties back to their homelands if they were trusted with something vital. The vodka and his longing for renewed sense of self-importance caused Raymond Ashton's tongue to loosen in an attempt to impress his companions. He told them that Comrade Zortov confided to me that according to our intelligence sources, the 24 steel drums are still stored exactly where I misdirected them. Neither the CIA nor the U.S. Army has tracked them down in all of this time. I told Zoltov that this doesn't surprise me at all. I must reprog... I, 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 myself, I myself reprogrammed the computer and scrambled... Cryptographic codes. What are these cryptographic codes? After the shipment was on its way, I might have gotten away with it and remained an agent in place if Colonel Hoffman hadn't stuck his nose in where it didn't belong. Even still, if I would have had time to make his death look like an accident. Dot, dot, dot. You were better off defecting, said Burgess, running his fingers through his white hair. We all were. Time was running out on us. We. We'd have eventually been caught. We live well here, said McLean, trying to convince himself as much as the others. Exceptionally well. Where else would we have such lovely wives, 20 years younger than ourselves, and without their pretty little heads screwed up by the women's liberation movement, another decadent capitalist nonsense? I'll drink to that, said Ashton, and they all had a toast and laugh. I still don't see, Burgess mused, how Zotov, Zotov could be so sure that those drums haven't been discovered. The CIA probably located them and got rid of them by now, safely de decontaminated. They wouldn't want us to know, of course, so they probably planted a bit of disinformation in Zotov as failing for it is falling for it. Do you honestly believe that the first director is that stupid? Ashton sneered. I can disabuse you of that notion. Six months ago, KGB agents in America serendipitously entered the warehouse of the medical supply company in Louisville. They inspected the drums and their contents. The corpses are still inside. Wait a minute. So they actually went KGB... I've... <laughs> I forgot this part. So six months ago, KGB agents in America entered the warehouse and snuck in into the Unita Supply medical house. They inspected the drums and their contents. The corpses are still inside, but the drums are old, corroded, and ready to crack. It will happen again, McLean crowd, crowed, clapping, ashen on the shoulder in drunken glee. Yes, Burgess said, if what you say is true. It is, Ashton smirked. 
It is only a matter of time, and the terror will be loose upon our enemies once again. Okay, we're going to chapter five. So that was like the most ridiculous chapter. I, I remember reading that and just being like, what, what is this fucking, like, why did he have to add that? The only thing I could guess is maybe, um, I don't know if this is one of those like deals where you get paid for every, like a like a, like a dime for every word you write. And maybe he just, you know, squeezed out an extra chapter of ridiculousness just so he could, you know, make an extra buck. I can't, can't blame him for that. Chapter five. Tina Vitali hated riding in Suicide's ancient beat-up convertible, which stunk of cat shit even with the top down. Suicide and his mother lived in a claustrophobic slum apartment where they kept 23 cats at last uh, at latest count, although the number was constantly increasing due to the birth rate and adoption of additional strays. Suicide blamed it on his mother. She just loves cats, can't turn them away, he said. And if that explained it uh, as if that explained it all quite logically, he never admitted that her fixation might be considered neurotic, even psychotic, probably because if she had to be committed to an insane asylum, no one would be around to cook and clean up for him. But it was all his mother's fault. Why didn't he allow the cats to ride en masse in his car? Sometimes he'd be cruising along with a dozen or so furry creatures for a company pissing and shitting, screwing and meowing all over the upholstery. Discourages the narcs from shaking me down was the only explanation that Tina had ever heard from suicide, who was an addict and a pusher. Tina wished her friends would have just let her go to see Freddie all by herself. Then she immediately felt then she immediately felt guilty for not wanting them around. But more and more, they seemed weird to her and immature. They wouldn't have forced themselves on her, she thought, if they had sufficient couth. She would have traveled to the Unita warehouse in a nice clean bus. But here she was, crammed in the back seat of a stinky convertible with scuzz, legs, and chuck. Suicide, meat, and Casey were all in the front. Nobody could have asked for a weirder, crazier driver than suicide who weaved all over the road the way he looked uh the way he looked no cop would even bother giving him a traffic citation even for a minor offense they just gun him down on sight his skull had been shaved and then allowed to grow for about a week till it was covered with a uniform growth of stubble about an eighth of an inch long he looked like a lumpy coconut with a flattened nose and black rotten teeth and he was wearing a studded dog collar around his scrawny neck she glanced up at the hev heavily clouded sky as lightning flashed and presumably thunder rolled, but she couldn't hear it since Scuzz's ghetto blaster was going at full volume in his lap. She hoped desperately that the impending rain would hold off a while. Uh, she hoped desperately that the impending rain would hold off while they were in the car because the awful smell would suffocate them if they had to put the top up. To try and numb her olfactory nerves, she took a healthy swig off of some cheap, sweet wine when Scuzz handed her the bottle. Suicide had traded someone for a case of the wine, which had been swiped from a party or a bar mitzvah in return for a vial of angel dust. So here they were, busting along in a convertible that was going to fall apart at any second in the middle of the street. And when the cops came to investigate the accident, they'd have found seven punkers stoned on rot gut wine that they had been passing around and guzzling while they were driving. They'd probably get sentenced to hard labor or firing squad or something. Where are we going anyway? Suicide yelled. Scuzz turned the volume down slightly on his ghetto blaster. It's a party, Casey shouted. To pick up Freddie, Tina interjected. She didn't want this caper to get any further out of hand. She was still clinging to the notion that she and Freddie might be able to sneak off somewhere and be alone. Oh, yeah, said Suicide. What the fuck is Freddie up to these days? He got himself a job, said Tina, leaning forward to yell this information into Suicide's ear. No shit. What job? He's a shipping clerk. Yeah, that sounds like a shitty job. Tina got mad. Well, it isn't president of the United States or the keeper of a cat farm, but it makes good bread. But he makes good bread. Yeah, said Suicide. Maybe he maybe he'll buy some dope from me instead of bumming it. 
Tina almost told suicide that Freddie was getting himself together and wouldn't be needing any dope anymore, but she decided that she'd better keep her mouth shut. If the gang knew that she and Freddie were trying to stay straight, then the gang would pressure them both all the more to get stoned. Hey, listen, said suicide. How come you guys only come over when you need me to drive you someplace? Meat said, because you're too spooky, suicide. Suicide laughed gleefully, taking it as a compliment. You think I'm spooky, he yelled. What the fuck you think you are? And he turned to the back seat, including Tina, Scuzz, Legs, and Chuck in his comment. And when he did so, the car careened into the oncoming lane. And Meat had to yank the wheel hard to avoid a collision with the bread truck. Woo! Just try and get us to the wheelhouse. <laughs> Woo! Just try and get us to the warehouse alive, will you? Meat said when, when the tires, tires is spelt with uh, T. Y R E S. This is definitely the British version because that's the British way of spelling tires, I believe. Meat said when the tires stopped squealing, Are you criticizing my driving su suicide shot back? Yeah, yeah, I am. Meat told him just to show you, just to show who was boss. Suicide abruptly swerved the car over to the curb and it screeched to a halt in front of the Unita Medical Supply Building, almost catapulting his passengers into the windscreen. Or over it. They shrieked and groaned and cuss at him, accusing him of trying to kill them. Eat shit, eat shit, he yelled at them. We might as well have been smelling it in this ratty or rather catty car of yours, Tina jeered. I'm getting out. Without waiting for anyone to open the doors, she stepped out over the side of the convertible and down to the sidewalk, her red plastic miniskirt riding up, giving everyone a shot of her long, shapely legs and slim curvy hips the rest of the gang piled out of the car and they all stood around taking turns swigging wine and staring at the big corrugated steel warehouse with the sign lit up by spotlights and a few and a field of oil storage tanks way out behind it a high chain link fence surrounded the huge gravel lot and loading docks on one side of the black rectangular building Man, what a hideous, ugly place, Meat drawled. His coal black eyes actually glowed. He got such a kick out of pure, unadulterated revulsion. I like it, Legs Pearled. It's a statement. <laughs> I like it. It's a statement. I can imagine Leanna Quigley saying that. Uh, Scuzz put his arm around Legs and turned up the volume of his ghetto blaster. Q uh eyes without a face by the flesh eaters. <laughs> well, let's go get the prick, suicide said. What do we do? Go up and ring the bell or something? Tina put out an arm to hold suicide back. No, no, she said. I better not bring all of you inside. It might freak out his boss. Freak him out? Us? Suicide snickered. Is he some kind of weirdo? Scuzz said indignant indignantly. No, his name is Frank Nello, Tina said. An old-fashioned, I'm not going to say that word because it's not a nice word. Uh, it spells W-O-P, the um, pejorative for uh, slur for someone who is Italian. Uh, an old-fashioned W-O-P like my father. Freddie had to get a haircut to even get hired there. Freddie even had to get a haircut to even get hired here. Now, if we show up looking like the way we do, I just don't want to blow up for him. That's all. Man, Freddy's turning into a queeb. I like that word, queeb. Suicide snarled. Cool, it said meat. Tina is right. We ought to barge in. What We oughtn't to barge in. What time does Freddy get off? Eight o'clock, said Tina. Haircut, suicide cursed. Like nobody tells me to cut my hair. Yeah, that's why you look like a coconut, legs jibed. I love that. That's John Russo's. That's like John Russo's like, that's the worst thing you can think of. Yeah, you look like a coconut. Uh, suicide glowered at her briefly, but kept his mouth shut. He took a lot from her because she secretly had the hot. He took a lot from her because he. I'm so sorry. He took a lot from her because secretly he had the hots for her and was hoping to shoot Scuzz out of the saddle. Chuck had stayed out of the argument all this time as he was looking around, scouting his surroundings. He had noticed across the street from the medical supply warehouse that there was an old cemetery surrounded by a high stone wall. The sign above the arch gate said Resurrection Cemetery. Hey, gang, 
Chuck said, pointing at the sign. We can go wait for Freddy over there. Not too many of Chuck's suggestions were ever heeded, but he felt that it was that this time he ought to score. The idea of goofing off in a graveyard was just the sort of thing to appeal to the zany group, including Chuck's heartthrob, Casey. He was tickled when she squealed. Great, really rad. I dig it, said Meat. We can lay on the grass between the tombstones and maybe do up a few joints till our man gets off work. All right, let's check out this bone orchard out, said Suicide, grinning and showing his rotten teeth. But first, I got to get something out of the car. He unlocked the trunk and dug his hands into a wooden box. What's in there? Chuck asked, co coming to look over. Road flares. What are you going to do with them? Scuzz wanted to know. This is really rad, said Legs. I've always wanted to, you know, defile one. She pointed at the cemetery. I don't want to do anything sacrilegious, Tina protested, her Catholic upbringing making her timid. Also, her memories of how ghastly sunshine had looked in death were so vivid, she could almost picture him, or corpses who looked like him, becoming angry at her and other grave defilers and coming back from the dead to seek vengeance. Come on, babe. Dead folks can't hurt you, said Meat, putting his arm around Tina. I kind of dig graveyards. They're free of malice, you know, real peaceful. The dead folks ain't scheming and dreaming and conniving anymore. They ain't going to rip us off. We ain't got nothing they need except your brains. Tina had admitted there was a certain folksy wisdom, wisdom in what Meat had to say. But she still felt pretty leery as she and the rest of the gang trapezed under the wide stone arch of the Resurrection Cemetery. She wished Scuzz would have, would have had the decency to turn down the volume of the new wave music, that old new wave music in his jukebox, but it was his ghetto blaster, but it was still blasting. He and Legs were both undulating their hips in a sexy jerky dance as they approached the looming tombstones. It was truly an old, old cemetery. In fact, it was overcrowded, even if none of the guests were complaining. The gravestones and monuments seemed to be piled shoulder to shoulder, jostling each other for elbow room. Interspersed were numerous above-ground crypts, like little stone houses, some relatively plain and some utterly ornate. This place is a stroke, Suicide giggled, gesturing mad with a fistful of road flares. Scuzz cranked the volume on his ghetto blaster up even higher, and the new wave beat pounded out over the graveyard, echo echoing from the monuments. Legs started laughing and screaming like a banshee as she skipped and cavorted on top of somebody's grave, dancing and dodging around a huge headstone carved in the shape of a crucifix. Lightning flashed and thunder run rumbled. Tina nervously stole a peek at her Mickey Mouse watch with the red plastic band that matched her miniskirt. Although it was only 7 o'clock, the sky was already fairly dark due to the approaching storm. That terrifies me, by the way. Like th This sort of like description stuff is very scary to me. Still an hour to go before Freddie was supposed to meet Tina. She wished that the rain would pour down right now in buckets. If it did, then she'd have an excuse to run out of the cemetery without the gang teasing her any more than calling her a chicken. She just wanted to be with Freddie, and it didn't seem to be too much to ask. He was the only one who understood her. She loved him and missed him and wanted to be in his arms without anyone else around to spoiling it. So that is chapters... Um, that is chapters four and five of Return of the Living Dead. Um, I'm sorry about my reading. It's hard with this tiny print and the strange phrasing. Sometimes you just want to uh, jump ahead or, you know, sort of interpret the words uh, in a sentence that makes more phonetical sense, flows better. Um, but yeah, so you can see where this is like probably the biggest deviation from the the movie is this like added subplot and besides that there's just like little things that are tweaked and and, and switched around and, and whatnot um as i said you know when i when i when i compound the movie on top of what i'm reading like those descriptions about like the storm they they're very scary to me when i think about the when i think about the storm I, uh, when I think about the tombstones, I imagine the cemetery from the movie, you know, um, 
I guess from time to time, it's actually sort of, it's actually sort of good. I, I usually always believe in reading the book first and then watching the movie. Um, but here's a great example where watching the movie first and then reading the novelization gives you sort of like a, a really clear picture of who you're reading in the novelization, which is based on the movie anyway. So I guess my rule of thumb would be read the book first and then see the movie unless you're reading a novelization and then obviously see the movie first and then read the book, if that makes any sense. Uh, so tune in next week for another two, probably two chapters maybe of Return of the Living Dead, the novelization. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, till next time, peace and hair grease. And welcome back to another episode of Masterpiece Theater with your host, me, Jeffrey Murdergram. <clears throat> You'll have to excuse my voice. I have a frog in my throat, and I will do my best to read to you from the pages of this tomb, Return of the Living Dead, the novelization, which is now a major motion film. My nose is a little itchy from my mustache. I must trim up some of my hairs. Where we last left off, our friends, our punk rock friends, were hanging out in the cemetery waiting for their mate, Freddy, to get off work. I, I really like this line. Uh, I kind of dig graveyards. They're free of malice, you know, real peaceful, peaceful. The dead folks ain't scheming and dreaming and conniving anymore. They ain't going to rip us off. We ain't got nothing they need. Oh, <laughs> that's not the case. That is not the case. But we're now at chapter six, okay? So, um, and begins with Freddie and Frank. Regaining conscious, chapter six. Regaining consciousness, Freddie Travis felt like his head had been banged by two bricks coming together like symbols in a strong man's arms. He groaned and blinked his eyes, watching a kaleidoscope of loud, painful colors dance and uh, dancing and metamorphosizing into a dusty yellow light bulb dangling over his head. When it dawned on him where he was, he panicked rolling over quickly despite the pain, ready to run from the corpse in the drum. But the steel drum was still lying on its side where it had fallen, and there was no corpse. Freddy moaned and muttered to himself, silly, silly to be scared. I fell and I hit my head. I'll be okay. That damn gas is gone now. Do we really need that dialogue? for a character who was by essentially by himself because Frank's unconscious. He staggered a couple of steps and threw up with an uncontrollable rush, vomiting into the rusty puddle of corrosion on the concrete floor. Great descriptors, Mr. Russo. Frank Nello woke up too, groaning and holding his stomach and vomited on the floor a few feet away from Freddy Grabbing a roll of paper towels from a grimy shelf, he tore off a couple of squares and wiped his mouth and then handed the roll to Freddy. Kid, are you okay? Frank said. His voice was harsh and his complexion looked sickly green. Uh, I don't know, Freddy croaked. My head hurts and my throat. Christ, what a stink. That putrid gas sprayed us in the face, Frank said. We're lucky to be alive. Thank God. He made the sign of the cross. Drawn by a compulsion to look at what had harmed them, drawn by a compulsion to look at what had harmed them, Frank and Freddie went over to the fallen drum, bent over, and looked in. The, ga the glass porthole was broken, smashed away. In the bottom of the drum was nothing except some traces of black liquid. Well, what happened to the body? Fre Freddie said in a hoarse whisper. It, it must have just dissolved when the air hit it. Frank speculated. Let's get out of here, said Freddy. Christ, I never smelt nothing like that in my life. I feel like I'm going to be sick for a month. You look awful, kid, said Frank. I guess I do, do. I do too. Let's go up to the men's room and rinse our mouths out and wash our faces. Shit, that stink is even on our clothes. W wait a minute, Frank cautioned. We don't want Bert Wilson to find this mess we made. He'll think we're stupid or something. We got to clean. We got to get the cellar cleaned up. 
for forcing themselves to work, even though they both felt as achy, stiff, and nauseated as if they were coming down with a super case of flu. They squeegeed the floor, pushing the rusty water and vomit towards the drain. Then they mopped up using a ringer bucket filled with a solution of water and industrial solvent. When they were done, Frank said, now comes the worst part. We got to get the drum upright again. I ain't touching it, Freddie blurted. Come on, kid. It ain't dangerous no more. If we don't cover our tracks down here, the boss will know we've done something wrong. With extreme reluctance, Freddie helped Frank stand the drum up, push it back to where it had been originally, and put the plastic cap on. Then he grabbed some paper towels and wiped his hands. Now, nobody will ever know the difference, Frank said. I guess if nobody but us ever bothered with these drums in 14 years, they ain't going to bother with them now. Now, can we get out of here, said Freddy? Aching all over, they slowly ascended the basement stairs. Walking through the main floor of the warehouse, Frank spotted the door of the cold storage room standing slightly ajar. He tried to slam it shut but his arm was stiff and he didn't slam it hard enough the first time. He had to slam it again, grimacing at the pain the exertion brought to his muscles. Christ, my joints are aching like I have arthritis, he said. Are yours? Yeah, said Freddy. We need a hot steaming shower. There weren't any showers in the men's room, but at least they could wash their hands and faces and rinse out their mouths, gargling in the sinks. Toweling off, Frank said, I guess I feel a little better, but not much. I'm still sick as a dog. They came out of the men's room, and Freddy sniffed the air very cautiously. I can still smell that foul gas. It must be clogging my nasal passages. Either that, or it's all over everything. Frank said, maybe before we cut out, I better spray some deodorant around here. He went back into the men's room and came out with a giant can of Lysol. He started to walk around, spraying everything everywhere feeling dizzy frank leaned against the men's room door suddenly from back among the tiers of the warehouse shelves came a loud yipe followed by a crash frank spun around and freddie jumped even though their bones hurt when they moved so abruptly what was that frank said sounded like a dog said freddie dog how did a goddamn dog get in here frank started to move in the direction of the sounds freddie said stop listen Both men stopped in their tracks. They cocked their ears. The yiping had stopped, but now they heard a faint panting. Stealthily, they advanced down through a semi-darkened aisle of packed equipment. As they turned a corner, they came upon a big black and white mongrel lying on its side on the floor, breathing heavily. How'd that damn mutt get in here? Frank said, angry and confused. Bert must have screwed up on his security check. Poor thing. What's wrong with it? Said Freddy. They went to the dog and crouched over it, sensing something was very strange about the way the animal was lying there. So utterly collapsed, it looked like a shell of itself, a base relief. Careful, it might have rabies, Frank said. But Freddy started to turn the dog over. It yiped and snapped at him, and he screamed and jumped back as soon as he saw what it really was. A split dog. Dun, dun, dun. A veterinarian... A veterinary specimen had somehow come back to life off of its mounting stand with a bar of the stainless steel stand still sticking through half its body and wedged between the slats of a packing crate in such a way that the dog couldn't get completely free. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Frank yelled. The dog shrieked with its one lung and writhed, writhed, writhed in agony on the mounting bar. Aghast, Freddy backed away, flattening himself against a tier of steel shelving. What are we going to do, Frank? He pleaded fearfully. Frank summoned his courage, mumbling and making another sign of the cross over himself. We got to kill it. Put it out of its misery. He looked around for a killing device and seized up a broom. I'll use this as a club, he said, unscrewing the handle from the brush. He started beating at the split dog, trying to smack its head, but it just shrieked louder and wriggled around like crazy. Freddy couldn't stand it. Stop, he yelled and grabbed Frank's arm. Let me go. We got to finish this animal off, Frank shouted. If I wasn't so achy and weak, suddenly there was a shatteringly loud crash from another part of the warehouse. 
followed by a, a howl of agony. Frank and Freddy spun around, leaving the split dog writhing on the floor. The howling and screaming continued. This is terrifying to me. Um, the howling and screaming continued, accompanied by wall-shaking bangs. In the huge corrugated steel building, all loud noises were exaggerated, taking on extra dimension of urgency and alarm. Frank and Freddy hustled towards the terrible sounds. When Freddy realized where they were coming from, he stopped and tried to hang back, grabbing Frank by the sleeve. No, stop, Frank. The cold storage locker, Freddy pointed. The heavy, the heavy locker door was actually shaking from the screaming and the pounding. And naturally, it had come ajar. But what was inside that hadn't come out yet? Why? Suddenly, Frank realized the answer. Oh, the cadaver in the drawer, he yelled. It can't get out. It must have come to life like the dog, and it's trying to crawl out of the drawer. Run, Freddy screamed, pulling Frank by the arms. But Frank wouldn't go. No, got to lock the freezer. Pulling himself free of Freddy's grasp, he dashed to the locked door and snapped the big old padlock on the hasp. Then he backed away, trembling, muttering, Oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. We're fucked, Frank. We're fucked, Freddy lamented. What are we going to do? We got to think, think. Frank ran, ran his thick fingers through thinning hair. Come on, let's go to the office. Get away from all this screaming and pounding. The screaming and pounding of the cadaver in the cold room and the whining of the split dog were muffled by a few decibels when Frank shut the door of the office. Frank slumped behind his desk looking dazed. Freddy sagged into Bert Wilson's big swivel chair, not giving a shit about asking permission, whereas before his recent sickening and frightening experiences, he would have been too timid to impinge, good word, impinge, on the warehouse foreman's domain. From outside, making itself heard above the screaming, whining, and pounding came a resounding rumble of thunder. This is terror. Okay, the scenario here is terrifying to me. Freddy stammered, are, are we going crazy? Frank looked up, his eyes red and swollen, his face pallid. No, the shit from the tank, the goddamn chemical got all over everything, and it's bringing all the dead things back to life. I don't believe it. Look, kid, I know it sounds preposterous, but we've seen it with our own eyes. We got to call the police, Frank. No, we can't call the police. Do you know what they do to this company and my job? I get canned. Worse. I'd lose my pension for Christ's sakes. Frank, this is no time to worry about your friggin' pension. We're in some deep shit here. Who knows what that chemical is going to do to us? We've been contaminated for God's sake. I ain't calling no friggin' cops. So again, in order of people whose fault, well, this book sort of changes that because we know who's really at fault. But I guess Frank, when I look at this, Frank has a lot of liability here too. Then what about the telephone number on the side of the drums? where it said to call in case of emergency. If we get, if we call the, nah, if we call, if we call that, we get the army. Do you want the army coming after us? If we're contaminated, they won't screw around with us. They'll probably put us in a steel drum and store us in the basement with the other poor saps. Freddie moaned and shook his head, cradling it in his hands. I can't stand it, Frank. What are we going to do? It's hopeless, hopeless. I'll have to phone the boss as much as I hate to, Frank finally said. He picked up the receiver and dialed. Freddie started talking in a rambling, stream of conscious way, mostly to himself. My pal Sunshine, who me and Tina, when me and Tina saw him there all cold and green and bloated, I'd have done anything to make it so it never happened to him, to have him back with us laughing and smiling and even shooting up if he wanted to a little bit, as long as he didn't do too much or get hit with any bad smack. I actually prayed that I'd wake up the next morning or the morning after and Sunshine, he wouldn't be dead but I wouldn't want him to come back like that awful split dog or that dead guy in the cold room. In a way, Sunshine is lucky to be gone, in heaven maybe, and then not have to go through the pain of dying ever again. The phone must have rung for a long time at Bert Wilson's house after Frank dialed. Freddie looked over him and saw he was still waiting with the receiver to his ear, his head hanging down. Finally, he must have because Freddie heard him say into the mouthpiece, uh, Bert, this is Frank. Hey, I really hate to spoil your 4th of July holiday, but I'm afraid we got one hell of a problem on our hands. Dot, dot, dot. Chapter 7. 14 years ago, 
when Horace Grover, okay, so Colonel Grover is in it. In the book, it's Grover. In the movie, it's Glover. And obviously, you have Grover, Bert, and Ernie, all names from Sesame Street. When Horace Grover was first assigned uh, to Operation Drummer Boy, he was a first lieutenant, and now he was a full bird colonel. And he had still not tracked down the 24 steel drums containing corpses from the Darrow chemical disaster, which had been diverted by the traitor and defector Raymond Ashton. At about the time that Frank Nello was telling Freddie Travis that he absolutely would not call the number stenciled on the side of the drums, the number that would have put Nello in touch with Colonel Horace Grover and enabled Grover to locate the long lost contraband, AKA the Easter eggs. The Colonel was driving his sleek white Mark Mark seven along the coastal highway from Camp Pendleton, California to San Diego, where he and his wife had a luxurious Spanish style via with a villa with a view of the sea. The villa and the Mark seven were prerequisites, not of his army salary, but of his wife's inherited wealth. He liked to live elegantly, much as it galled him to have his expensive taste paid for by a woman he no longer loved. He was a bitter, disappointed man, greedy without being shrewd, ambitious without being clever. He didn't even care much for his mistress, who was quite plain. Rather, rather than thinking he might attract someone prettier if he lost weight and improved his own disposition and outlook, his idea was that he could afford to shack up with a nicer piece if he could spend more money on her. But there was a limit to how much knocking around he could get away with as long as his wife controlled the purse strings. He figured he would be a two-star or even a three-star general by now if it weren't for the stagnant frustration of Operation Drummer Boy. It had stymied his career, slowed down his promotions. While nobody could directly blame him for not being able to find the missing 24 drums, they weren't about to pat him on the back for it either, and they couldn't get a transfer away. And he couldn't get a transfer away from the operation. He had tried desperately to do so, but the need for secrecy was always cited. Anybody knew taking over the thing would have to be clued in, and it was best not to let the awful, embarrassing facts meander any further. So Colonel Grover was stuck in a thankless, probably futile assignment where he could be. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that where he could be a convenient whipping boy for the big brass if the snafu ever became more snafu'd, which became likelier and likelier with each passing year as those drums sitting somewhere were bound to corrode and corrode and eventually leak and crack. Pulling into his driveway, he detested the sight of the huge satellite dish antenna on the roof, spoiling the looks of the via. It was there because of Drummer Boy. He had to be in constant touch with the operation, even when he wasn't at Camp Pendleton, where he was currently stationed. Even a 50-mile drive down the coast didn't free him from the, mo the millstone around his neck that was far worse than any ordinary millstone because subconsciously it was weighted by 24 corpses and 24 lost steel drums. He used the automatic garage door opener to stow away, because that was a fancy device back then, to stow away the, the, the Mark 7. When he came into the kitchen, he greeted his wife Ethel with a peck to the cheek. He knew that he ought to give her a real smooch and a big hug so that she wouldn't suspect that maybe he hated her, but he couldn't bring himself to go to those lengths because she so utterly repulsed him. He found her body ugly and totally unsexy. She was short, flabby, and stocky, just like him. Oof. Boy, what a what a superficial people, huh? He tossed his gold-braided army hat on a chair and asked, and she asked him about how his day had been. He should have smiled warmly and mouthed some pleasantries, but he didn't. Instead, he heard himself saying, What do you think? The usual boring, demanding bullshit. I'm sorry, dear, said Ethel. It goaded him that she prided herself in being understanding when she really didn't understand a damn thing. What's for dinner? He probed. Your favorite lamb chops. I had them for lunch, he snapped. Taking a mi It's pork chops in the movie, I think. Uh, taking a mild pleasure in seeing the blank look on her chubby face melt to dismay. He tossed his army coat on top of his hat in the chair and walked through the living room into his study, a plush room of luxury leather and dark wood paneling that his wife had that his wife had lavished 
money on, especially to please him. The big window here behind his roll top desk had a wonderful view of the Pacific Ocean. So I actually kind of really like this chapter because it really sort of, you know, fleshes out Glover and his wife's relationship. You could see some of this in the context of their dialogue in, in the actual film. Otherwise, it's just basically just a filler scene. The colonel admired the view for a second and then crossed the tan shag carpet to the drinks cabinet and opened it. Inside was an extensive array of electronical communications equipment. He removed a car key from his wallet and slid it into the console, checked his watch, picked up a special telephone and pressed a button. He got a coded tone sequence and then a password cue from a relay desk at Camp Pendleton. This is drummer boy Eagle, he said, checking in from station three at 1800 hours. I'll be home all evening. When he signed off, he poured himself a half tumbler of Jack Daniels neat and then turned around to see his wife looking at him, a mousy, timid expression on her face. He felt himself get hot under the collar. She had come into his study where she was never allowed to intrude. He wanted to smack her or at least cuss her out. But with a great effort, he held his temper. Even poor, timid wretches could only take so much abuse. And he had remembered that she was a rich, timid wretch that he could not get along with. Uh, that he could not. That he could not get along without for the time being. It's nerve wracking to live around so much equipment all the time. She ventured. They have to be able to reach me twenty four hours a day, wherever I am. You know that, dear. Too bad they don't have a cell phone. A cell phone would can't, would would cause this. Doesn't that stuff operate on microwaves? What if it's dangerous? It could give us cancer. He chuckled mir- mirthless, mirthlessly. Operation Drummer Boy is giving me cancer, all right, but not for microwaves. She penetrated even deeper into his study and put her arm around him, giving him goosebumps. Dear, she said, I know how hard you're working and what a strain you must be under. You're a very understanding wife, Ethel. I appreciate you, and and I love you. One of these days, when we find the missing drums, we can have all the communications equipment taken out of here. But when will they be found? Christ, Ethel, I don't know. It's maddening. Maddening. They could be anywhere. Anywhere. When his wife retreated from the study, he shut the door and sipped his Jack Daniels, gazing out at the ocean, wishing he had never heard of Operation Drummer Boy. He had thought of the traitor Raymond Ashton, probably languishing in comfort somewhere in the Soviet Union after diverting the steel drums and murdering Colonel Peter Hoffman, who used to be Grover's commanding officer when he was a first lieutenant. Death and destruction to all communist traitors and defectors, Colonel Glover said out loud, raising his glass in a toast towards the Pacific Ocean before downing the whiskey all in one gulp. An unabashed patriot, he said, God save America, as he wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. And that brings us to the end of Chapter 7. Tune in next week when we go into Chapters 8 and 9. Um, So yeah, like, do we even really need that scene either? It's like kind of like a filler scene, but still, for anybody who loves this stuff like seeing them talk like seeing any extra info any extra story um is something that we all crave even if even if it's mundane and boring i would say to an extent so you know um we're we're coming up i think next week we'll probably hit it to a, a part of the book that i found so terrifying i mean just spine tingling and terrifying to me personally and i am really excited to uh read it again to me it's it's the most frightening part of the book and like i said russo he has his moments man he has his moments with the written word and then other times with dialogue not so much i'd say uh written descriptors and uh certain backstory details are russo's um Russo's, uh, you know, what he's good at and what he's really bad at is just like li- literally communicating dialogue that just doesn't even need to be said, frankly, in the scene. So uh, we'll see you next week. Make sure to like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff, yada, yada, yada. Thank you so much. Peace and hair grease. 
Hello and welcome back to another chapter of From This Peace Theater. Is that what I'm calling? <laughs> Whoa, totally botched that one. Welcome back to another edition of From This Peace Theater. We are reading the time held classic Return of the Living Dead, the novelization, now a major film, the novelization written by. John Russo of all people. And we're on chapter eight where we last left off. Where did we last leave off? Um, we last left off with Colonel Grover or Glover, as he's known in the movie Grover in the, in the book, um, who is just needlessly shoehorned into the story, probably because he's in the script that John Russo is writing from. Well, as we know, John Russo has decided to inject his own elements like, a whole communist uh, subplot. Um, yeah. So anyway, chapter eight. It was pitch black outside, except for the occasional stabs of forked lighting from the impending storm. Legs and meat were sitting by a tombstone, polishing off a bottle of cheap wine that the gang had earlier been passing around. Legs said rather famously, I might add, do you ever fantasize about being killed? Meat turned towards her, noticing how, in a flash of lightning, her blue hair and blue regalia looked ghostly and unreal. Being killed, he said. No, I don't fa fantasize about it. I ain't the sort of that. It ain't the sort of thing I get off on. It didn't matter what he had said. Legs went on talking in her spaced out, awestruck way as if they were on the same wavelength. Did you ever wonder about all the different ways of dying, you know, violently, and wonder, like, what would be the most horrible way to die? I'd like to fuck myself to death, Meat said. <laughs> Leering into darkness. Does that mean masturbating? <laughs> masturbating to death? How about it, babe? Want to get me started? Meat. Be serious, she shrieked. Can't you ever settle down and have a plutonic philosophical discussion? Playing along with her, Meat said, I'd hate to burn to death. It must hurt like a bastard. Warming to the subject, legs purred. Mm-hmm. All your flesh blackening and curling away from your bones. Like when you toss pieces of cardboard into the fire. Not only would it feel bad, it would look bad. Remember how Freddy used to say? Live fast, die young, and make a good-looking corpse. Yeah, that was before he had found Tina. That's before him and Tina had found sunshine. Yeah, said Legs. Those two haven't been the same since. Like, I can understand feeling bad when a friend dies. I felt bad about sunshine, too. We all did. But Freddie and Tina, they made, like, a really heavy trip out of it. Know what I mean? Like... They let it bum them out entirely too much, if you ask me. Boy, John Russo knows how to write for the teenagers, huh? It's different for them, said Meat. They saw Sunshine dead. We didn't. It's funny, said Legs. We used to tell Sunshine he was such a screw-up. He would even managed to screw up his own funeral, and he did just that. He lived fast and died young, but I guess he didn't make a very good-looking corpse. Meat remembered entering the funeral parlor. <laughs> Meat remembered entering the funeral parlor and saying a prayer over Sunshine's closed casket. Not being able to be, view his friend in death made it hard to believe that death had truly occurred. When he had pictured the person in the closed coffin, his mental image was close to how Sunshine had looked in life: blonde, cocky, slightly emaciated but with perfect white teeth and a superb smile that had given him his nickname. Yet Meat knew that Sunshine didn't look that way anymore. He was probably decked out in a conservative suit and tie instead of greasy jeans and motorcycle boots and Hare Krishna beads, and his skin was probably still all festered and puffy and green like Freddie and Tina had said. If Meat still believed in his parents' old-fashioned Bible pounding, shrieking and groaning, him shouting, uh, that's not a fun word to say. N e g r o Baptist religion. He could have been com comforted by the thought 
of sunshine arising on judgment day, his body made whole and beautiful to frolic in eternal bliss in the presence of God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But Meat was an agnostic, and it was one of the things that had gotten him thrown out of his parents' house. He could no longer talk talk to God with any confidence that anyone up there was listening. So the prayer he said for Sunshine's corpse was one that he made up, not out of any prayer book. I think that's beautiful, man. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. Pronouncing his deep personal wish that Sunshine would receive the best of whatever there was to enjoy or to receive after earthly life, if there was anything, and that his survivors and loved ones would remember him well and not judge him too harshly and not suffer too much in their grief. That's a, I think that's a fantastic prayer, frankly. As Meat turned away from the coffin after silently expressing these sentiments, he was attacked by Sunshine's mother, a frail, red-eyed, surprisingly strong little woman who flailed at him, screaming and striking his face and body with her bony fists, accusing him of being the no good. Oh, geez. I don't remember that word. The no good N word dope fiend who had corrupted her son and brought him to an early grave. That's right. There's an N bomb in here. Wow. The other white folks in the funeral parlor weren't in any big hurry to subdue sunshine's old lady and calm her down. Meat's face was bleeding from being clawed, and he was pretty shook up when he pushed his way out to the street. Recalling it, so there's some interesting backstory here. Recalling it as he sat with legs, leaning against a tombstone, he swigged down the last of the wine and asked her, you think any of us are in any way to blame for what happened to Sunshine? No way, legs snapped. No grit, no guilt trips for me, buster. I mean, said Meat, Maybe we could have tried a lot harder to get him off the hard stuff. We did try, but he would not listen. If you ask me, he had a self-destructive personality, Legs giggled. <laughs> I guess we all do, the whole gang of us. But Sunshine was a lot worse. He was a lot further gone than the rest of us. I don't know. Maybe he got what he wanted. Maybe he's happier now, you know? Happier, said Neat. Like, if there's a heaven. Oh. You don't believe in it? I'm not sure. Well, anyway, said Legs, an OD would be such a terrible way to go. Sorry, an OD wouldn't be such a terrible way to go, all blissed out. You'd be gone before you even realized you were tripping away. For me, the worst death would be for a bunch of horrible men like cannibals to mob me and start eating me alive. I saw that in a movie once. So did I, said Meat, recalling how the scary movie had been. He shuddered, glad of the darkness, so that legs couldn't see him being uncool. First, the cannibals would tear off my clothes, legs said. She giggled playfully. Meat heard her squirming around. Then, in a flash of lightning, he saw that she was unbuttoning her blouse. Hey, suicide, he yelled. Let's get some light over here. Legs is taking off her clothes again. Giggling from somewhere deep in the cemetery, suicide lit a highway flare. And like an altar boy holding a sparkling candle, he, had, he led a per procession comprised of Chuck, Casey, Scuzz, and Tina, over to where Legs was doing her spontaneous strip tease. In darkness you will find me. I'm dance among the dead. Uh, he, ja <laughs> he jabbed the wire prong of the flare into the ground at the foot of the tombstone and the sputtering orange light illuminated Legs' well-sculpted torso naked in the darkness to the beat of some wild electronic music coming from Scuzz's ghetto blaster. She began to do a slow, seductive dance. Take it off, babe. Take it all off, Suicide drooled. He jumped around, clapping his hands, the pointy metal studs of his dog collar glinting in the shimmering orange flare light. Following his lead, the whole gang started to clap to the beat, except for Tina, who hung back, eyeing the warehouse across the way and wishing that Freddy would come out. Getting carried away by her lap dance, her dance, I don't know why I said lap dance, and by being the center of attention, Legs leapt to the top of the tombstone, balancing herself on its wide, scalloped edge. 
Undulating slowly, she caressed her uptuned breasts, leaning back, massaging and squeezing till her large nipples hardened and jutted. Then she unzipped her, pl her blue plastic shorts. Yeah, 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 yelled Suicide. Get down, get down, babe, said Meat. Legs peeled off her plastic shorts and tossed them into the darkness, nude except for her plastic boots. Oh, my, this is making me hot and bothered. I'm, I've got the vapors. Nude except for her plastic boots and her blue leg warmers, she spread her long, slim, beautiful legs and began to arch her pelvis and shimmy her hips slowly and deliberately as if she was having sex impaled by some invisible presence whoa oh wow said suicide is this how you is this how she gives it to you scuzz what do you think said scuzz wanting suicide to envy him man man let me have a turn with her suicide pleaded get out she ain't that kind of girl said scuzz the thrusts of legs pelvis were coming faster and harder and she was losing and she was losing the beat of the music her eyes had a glazed look and she was biting her lip and moaning, continuing her frantic undulations on top of the tombstone. Tina couldn't watch. It was embarrassing. Legs was actually reaching an orgasm all by herself, right in front of everybody. In the sputtered orange glare, the whole scene was unbelievably bizarre and unreal and, and, well, sacrilegious. Legs really was defiling a cemetery. It almost seemed like she was copulating with the spirit of the dead, an evil, lustful spirit that must have arisen from beneath the tombstone she was dancing on. Even though Tina thought she had completely shed the rigid religious tenets of her childhood, the concept of sin was heavily ingrained in her subconscious. Denying this, she told herself that she wasn't square any longer. There was just certain kinds of behavior that she couldn't go get on with. It wasn't square to be turned off by pointless disrespect and mockery of other people's beliefs. What Legs was doing fell into the category Tina felt, and she had an atavistic, never heard that word before, sense that Legs would be or ought to be punished for it. Ooh. Tina had been raised a strict Roman Catholic in an Italian-American family, uh, Per parochial school I'm not familiar with that and a, and the whole bit including a great deal of pressure from the nuns when she was a senior in high school to make a decision to enter a convent but then as her parents would say she had fallen in with the wrong crowd what really had happened in her own opinion was that she had started to think she had bought a paperback of mark twain's letters from the earth and the single irre irreverent Humorous, satirical, and iconoclastic, iconoclastic book had pierced the dogma of her upbringing with a crack of light and fresh air. But when she tried to express some of her new questions and feelings, the nuns and priests were outraged and told her parents that she was in danger of becoming a heathen on the road to hell. Tina's mother and father promptly clamped down on her to force her to be the good, obedient little girl that they had thought they were raising. Because she had a streak of spunk and rambunctiousness, the fierce effort to suppress her only led her to a more determined and at times a more foolhardy rebellion. She stopped reading and studying and started running around. The intellectual quest that had started the trouble was abandoned and largely forgotten, trampled in the climate of passion and confrontation. Tina became a street brat, defying her parents' conservatism, by a pursuit of his diametric opposite, unbridled hedonism. She had been born with a good mind that could have been developed with enlightened guidance and stimulation. Instead, although she possessed a capacity for subtle perceptions and delicate refined emotions, that capacity was dulled and blunted by the frantically superficial lifestyle she had fallen into. Finding Sunshine dead had been enough of a jolt to make her question at long last how and why she was wasting herself, but she wasn't strong enough to break away completely, and maybe she never would be. 
The nearest object of any hint or plausibility of strength was Freddie Travis. Along with her, he had been changed by a shocking experience. Perhaps together they could continue to change for the better. She clung to her love for Freddie, averting her eyes from legs wild, naked, cavorting, wishing her boyfriend would come out of the warehouse. <coughs> I was holding that coffin for so long. You know, it's fascinating. It's so interesting to read. This is what's interesting is this is John Russo's sort of this is his perception of what punk is as a 40 something year old man. That's what this is. And he's been charged with writing about punk rockers, but really he's writing from the perspective of uh, someone who is so far out of touch with uh, youth and adolescence and angst. And this is what you get as a result. All this stuff, the, the, the religious stuff, you know, um, uh, needing to be punished for getting naked and, you know, uh, talking about um, uh, people dying. I don't know. Chapter nine. Oh, Bert Wilson was fuming, but Freddie hardly cared. He was too sick and exhausted. Bert was in plaid Bermuda shorts, a yellow windbreaker and a floppy golfer's hat. Just picture that for a second compared to how he is in the movie. A floppy golfer's hat, a yellow windbreaker and Bermuda shorts. His freckled face turned as red as his hair as he listened to Frank Nello lamely try to explain what had happened. You did what, Bert Moan? You opened it? You stupid morons? You idiots? You screwed up my warehouse and my barbecue. With an angry gesture, he pushed his heavy black frame glasses up his nose. What, like, like this. When Bert had first showed up, he had bitched about the impending rain and the employees who couldn't handle a tough situation without crying to the boss for help. But this was before... Frank showed him the split dog writhing on the floor and took him to the padlock cooler to hear the screaming and the pounding. Now Freddie suspected a certain amount of Bert's cussing out of himself and Frank had to do with the boss's need to deny the veracity of the inhuman part of the situation. The whining of the split dog and the screaming and pounding of the corpse could still be heard through the office door. Well, Frank Nello said sheepishly, sheepishly smacking his desk top with the palm of his hand. What are we going to do? Bert started raving again. Do do we're going to be sued by Daryl Chemical and be investigated by the government and become very, very famous and lose our business and go to jail. That's what we're going to do. As he raved, he paced all around the office, glowering and flinching with every scream of the cadaver in the cold room. On the other hand, if we do not wish for all those bad things to happen to us, we will destroy all the evidence and shut our mouths. Frank pounced upon the suggestion. Yes, that's it. Let's do that. Yes, I agree, said Bert. It's the only way. But before we commit ourselves to such a drastic course of action, I have just one itsy bitsy question. Are you absolutely certain that the person screaming out there is a dead cadaver? Oh, open the door and find out, Frank challenged with a ghastly, unfunny grin. So it really, uh, open the door and uh, find out. Why don't you? <coughs> Bert wiped sweat off of his brow and wiped his hand on his Bermuda shorts. All right, all right. I believe you. I don't have to see it with my own eyes right now. I saw the split dog. At least I think I saw it. And if I'm not actually going nuts and dreaming all of this up, all right. He ran his hand through his wavy red hair, dark red from sweat. Well, if it is a reanimated body, we have to kill it. Freddie blurted out, how do you kill something that's already dead? Shut up. I'm thinking, said Bert, still pacing feverishly. Christ, Frank, what the hell? What the hell did it say in that National Enquirer article you showed me some years back? Some years ago? N nothing. Nothing about killing them. But in some of... The ghoul movies, they killed them by destroying the brain. It's interesting how he mentions that there was a National Enquirer article about it. I'd like to read that. The brain, right, said Bert. Well, what the hell do we have here that can destroy a brain? I mean, plenty of stuff. <clears throat> Frey said, well, what did doctors use to get into skulls? He couldn't help 
thinking that as much as his own skull ached, he might have to do an operation on himself to kill the pain. Doctors use surgical drills, said Frank. But as much as that frigging cadaver is jumping around, who's going to hold it down and drill it? Frank shuddered at the mere thought of entertaining such a notion of entering the cold room, let alone going into hand-to-hand combat, combat with a cadaver. Come on, said Bert Wilson. I got something that's just the ticket. He opened the office door and barged out. And since he was their boss, Frank and Freddie reluctantly followed him. Hanging on the wall outside of the office was a big red fire axe with a big pointy spike behind the blade. Bert seized it and handed it to, handed it to Frank. Frank, you take this. boy. Bert said. Apprehensively, Frank took hold of the axe, eyeing the spike and the sharp blade, wondering whether he could actually do a job with a weapon such as that or if it could somehow be turned against him. Now listen carefully, said Bert. Freddy, you're going to open the cold room door. Frank, when that cadaver comes out, you brain it with the axe. Well, what if it's still in the drawer? It may still be in the drawer, Frank pointed out. If it is, Freddy will have to pull the slide drawer open, and the rest of the plan stays the same. You brain it with the axe, Frank. Well, what are you going to do, Bert? I'm going to supervise. I didn't get us into this mess. We have to put that cadaver out of its misery. The screaming and pounding got louder and louder as they advanced towards the cold storage room. I imagine when I think about it, like we know what it looks like in the movie, but I imagine for some reason in the book, I think about that first cadaver that they revived in reanimator and like the screaming has to do with like what it must be like to be dead one moment and then like comprehend that you're no longer dead and that you're a cadaver and screaming in terror as a result of being in pain of being dead. I don't know. Oh, th- this is the stuff that, that chills me to the bone. Truly. You, you do better. You got us into this. You kid go over by the door. Sweat popped all over Freddie's face. Like Frank, he felt terribly weak and he ached in every muscle and joint. His stomach was so nauseous. It felt like his insides were rotting, but he stationed himself by the freezer room door as Frank hefted the ax. Bert Wilson said, the combination on the padlock is 34 left, 9 right, and 12 left. He backed up close to a huge wooden packing crate that he could hide behind. Freddy got a grip on himself and spun the combination dial on the padlock. Clickety, 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 left, right, left. Then with great caution, he pulled the padlock open and lifted it out of the hasp. The screaming and the pounding from inside the cold storage room increased in intensity, and the door came ajar all by itself. Freddy jumped back, but nothing leapt out at him. It must still be in the drawer, said Frank. Thank God. He crossed himself for the umpteenth time today and transferred the axe to his left hand to do so. Christ, don't let go of that axe, yelled Bert, peeking from behind the crate. This is a bad time to take the Lord's name in vain, said Frank. Go on, go on cried Bert. Go ahead in and do it, Freddy. Let's just let's just lock it up again, Freddy suggested. If we could get a hold of a grenade somewhere, we could just come back and toss it in there. Where the hell are we going to get a grenade? Bert says. Said Bert. Bert scoffed, I should say. This is a medical supply warehouse. For God's sakes, be brave, kid. Now is the time. You got to have some real guts but he did all his talking from behind the packing crate. Now, that was a good line, John Russo. I'm not going to slide open the drawer unless you come in and help me, Freddie said, suddenly not giving a shit if he got fired for insubordination. His fear of his boss was submerged by his fear of the cadaver. The thing may not be in the drawer, he added. It may be lurking, just waiting for me to go into the cold room. Shit, let's stop bickering and get this over with, said Frank. My friggin' nerves can't take it anymore. But he had to think twice about the fact that the screaming and pounding from the cold room had stopped. Freddy could be right. The cadaver might be lurking. With a sudden summoning of courage, Frank used the axe handle to nudge open the freezer door. It squeaked as it slow, slowly sl- swung on its hinges. Freddy screamed, ah! The pounding started up again, more ferociously. 
To their great relief, the three men saw that it was the drawer rattling. The cadaver was still in the freezer compartment, struggling to get out. This makes it a lot easier, said Bert. All we have to do is slide. This makes it a lot easier, said Bert. All we have to do is slide the drawer open enough to smash its head with the axe. He came out from behind the packing crate. Go on in, you guys. I'll be right behind you. Mustering his last ounce of bravery, Freddy said to himself, I can go in there. I got my shit together, but his legs were so weak and his knees wobbled as he approached the waist high drawer that held the cadaver. Bert stepped up beside him, his mouth hanging open as if he wanted to throw up. Frank took position squarely in front of the drawer with the axe raised up. Do it for God's sakes, Frank urged. Don't think about it. Do it before I change my mind and shag ass. Love it. Shag ass. That goes on the t-shirt. Freddie and Bert each took a grip on the drawer and uh, Freddie and Bert each took a grip on the drawer opposite sides and started pulling out. The screaming corpse stared up at them, hideous looking, with a ye- with yellow jaundiced skin and dry eyeballs. Ugh! The idea of yellow jaundiced skin with dried eyeballs. At first, just the head was visible, then the dead puckered hands got a clawing grip on the stainless steel top of the freezer compartment frank swung the axe as hard as he could in his weakened condition the pick end of the axe cracked through the cadaver's forehead but it didn't die instead it screamed kicking and clawing bucking and thrashing like a demented man with quadruple the strength of ordinary sane mortals frank lost his balance and felt still clutching the axe handle staggering backwards and because the pick was still embedded in the head of the cadaver frank's movement momentum pulled the drawer open and the cadaver rolled out so he had the pickaxe in still in the he basically used the the stuck pickaxe to pull the cadaver out of the drawer if, if i'm visually understanding this correctly um winded frank let go of the drawer Bert and Freddy jumped and yelled. The screaming dead man, writhing on the floor, got hold of the axe blade and pulled the spike out of his forehead, then hurled the axe aside, banging it off the steel freezer. Frank lay dazed where he had fallen. Bert and Freddy both got to their feet unfrozen at about the same time and bumped and wedged into each other in their effort to flee through the doorway. The dead man jumped out at the two men, knocking them both the rest of the way out of the cold storage room. Sounds like a Three Stooges sketch. And retaining a grip on Bert, choking and clawing him. The dead man started to sink his teeth into Bert's face. But Frank stumbled out of the cold storage room and got a chokehold on the corpse. Then Freddy recovered enough to help Frank. And Bert managed to roll free, yelling, It bit me! The son of a bitch bit me! He ran into the cold storage room and got the axe. By the time Frank and Freddy had the cadaver momentarily subdued, wrestled wrestled to the floor with its arms twisted up behind its back. It was snarling and snapping at them with its teeth. Bert yelled, hold its shoulders to the floor. Frank and Freddy did their best to pin the naked, struggling dead man on his back in one spot. Bert then took careful aim and swung the axe. Pow! Crunch! The pick end of the axe bit into the cadaver skull. I love that. The axe bit into the cadaver skull, taking a much deeper bite than before because of the damage already done and because Bert wasn't in as weakened a condition as Frank. The spike went all the way through the skull, nailing the cadaver to the wooden floor. It let out a tremendous howl and bucked and thrashed even more violently. No blood flowed from its wounds. Frank and Freddy hung on. With the axe pinned in its head, the cadaver squirmed around like a butterfly on a pin, screaming, Bert, I can't hold this much longer, Freddy cried. Bert ran to the warehouse shelf ripped open a cardboard box, and and frantically unwrapped a surgeon saw for sawing bone. He yelled at Freddy and Frank, Hang on tight! Frank and Freddy threw their entire weight over the the length of the corpse's body, pressing its torso and legs as flat as possible and pinning its arms down. 
Bert got down on his knees and started sawing off the struggling thing's head, cutting into bloodless flesh and screeching neck bone. Finally, the body was separated from the head. The body relaxed and twitched. The tongue lolled from the side of the mouth. With great relief, Frank and Freddy stood up, and immediately the cadaver's body jumped up and ran off, leaving the head still pinned to the floor by the axe. Christ, Bert yelled. Jesus, protect us, Frank murmured. Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, Freddy mumbled. The cadaver's body, like a headless chicken, ran right into a tier of shelving and fell down. But it got back up again and kept going, turning a corner. We gotta tackle it, cried Bert. The three men went after the headless corpse and leapt up, pummeling it to the floor and subduing it once again. Rope, rope, get the rope, Bert yelled. Frank let Freddy and Bert to, Frank left Freddy and Bert to hold the corpse down while he found some coils of hemp. Quickly, they tied up the bucking and thrashing dead body. Christ, why isn't it dying, said Frank. Bert said, you told us if we destroyed the brain, then that would be it. It works in the movies, Frank said. It ain't working now, said Bert. The movie was just fiction based on fact, Frank reminded. They examined the body, still writhing, the head still nailed to the floor, snapping and snarling. So how do we kill it? Frank wondered out loud. The three men stared at each other, considering the implications. We'll have to destroy it completely, Bert said, until there's nothing left. Acid, Frank exclaimed. What kind of acid do you dissolve a body with? I think you need to talk to Mike, uh, Walt, and uh, Gustavo in Breaking Bad. Um, Bert told him, sulfuric acid should do it. Better, better yet, aqua regia. Freddy said, what if it doesn't dissolve everything like the bones? Bert ran his fingers through his hair, thinking desperately. Cremation might be a better answer, he said finally. Cremation! That's the ticket, said Frank. Oh, well, when will this ever end? Fred Freddie moaned. My girlfriend Tina's going to hate me if I ever see her again. She was supposed to meet me outside at eight. I hope she didn't wait. I hope she went home. Your girlfriend is the least of your worries, kid, Bert, said Bert. But Tina was very much on Freddy's mind. He just wanted to be her. He, If he could find his way out of this nightmare. How the hell were they going to cremate this thing, said Frank. How the hell are we going to cremate this thing, said Frank. We don't even have an oven. Ernie Kaltenbrunner, said Bert, the embalmer at the morgue next to the cemetery. He has a crematorium over there, Frank asked. Yep, a crematorium, that's good. But do you think he'll go along with it? He and I are poker buddies. But what the hell are you going to tell him, Bert? Can you trust him? I, I have to. I just have. I just hope he's at home. Or better yet, working late over there. Let's go to the office. I'll phone him in. Do I have to go to the crematorium? Asked Freddy. Yeah, kid. You're in this all the way, said Frank. Me and you, we got to stick together now. You know? He gave Freddy a wink as if they were both privy to some deep secret that didn't include Bert Wilson or anybody else. Are you still sick? Freddie asked. Yeah. Sick as a dog. Sick, sick as a split dog. Frank chuckled, trying to make light of it. Me too, said Freddy. He considered just cutting the hell out of there, quitting his job, letting Frank and Bert take care of the creepy business at the crematorium. But there were two other factors that were preventing him from splitting. One was that he was amazed. One was that he was amazing himself, proving himself. By the amount of bravery he had exhibited so far, he was getting back his self-respect and he didn't want to flush it down the drain. What a <laughs> whatever. And the second factor was that he sensed the kinship with Frank Nello that Frank had tried to convey with a wink of his eye in a subtle metaphysical way that Freddie felt deep, felt deeply, but did not consciously understand Ever since that gas squirted in their faces, he and Frank were bound together. Sufferers on the same journey, changing, evolving, facing the same dread. Ain't that the truth? Ain't that the truth? So that's chapters uh, eight and nine. Uh, not too many differences. Uh, Bert, <clears throat> Bert's appearances is a ginormous difference. 
there's some change in dialogue. We get some more backstory. We get some backstory on Meat, a.k.a. Spider. We get a little backstory on Legs, and we get a little bit of backstory on Tina. And frankly, all three of their backstories are, are variations of the same theme, but not in like a super deep way. Again, I think it ties back to Russo's like struggle to try and write like teenagers, you know, which is not easy. You know, when you're writing in the voice of another character, you know, if you are not one of said character, like if, you know, you are, if you are a gas station attendant, who's writing a novel about a lawyer, you have to write in the law in the in your character's voice. And if your character's a lawyer, he's got to sound lawyerly. You know what I mean? And so I feel like that's something that that Russo struggles with. And he's not a, a punk rocker. And he's not a young guy. And he's it's it, it's hard for him to sort of find the voice of these characters, even though it's already spelled out for him in the screenplay very well, I might add. Um, my favorite, again, I thought it was last week or maybe I thought it was even the week before. It's a lot deeper in the book than I thought it was. Um, we are approaching absolutely one of the most terrifying moments in the book and movie, frankly, uh, to me. And it's, it's two words and we'll, when we get there, I'll talk more about it. It's two words that are said that just absolutely terrify the crap out of me. When, when I think about like who's saying them and the context of the story and yada, yada, yada. Um, so thank you for joining me. Uh, we will see you next week uh, for chapters 10 and 11. Until then, peace and hair grease. Hey, what's going on? How are you guys? It's another Monday, which means it's time to read another two chapters of the novelization of Return of the Living Dead, the novelization of the major motion picture uh, written by John Russo. Now, up to this point, the chapters we've been reading have been pretty short, but we just, wow, this one's going to be a little bit longer than usual. I'm not going to lie. I was a little like, oh, I'm just going to jump into this. It's going to be real, real fast, real, real easy. And no, not the case, but um, where where did we last? What did we last leave off? Where did we last leave off? Um, we we had uh, we had Bert and Frank and Freddie, you know, driving the uh, the, the pickaxe into the cadaver's skull and seeing that it's not working. It's not dying. They're going to need to figure out a way to dispose of the body. And they figure, you know, there is a crematorium across the street in the resurrection funeral home. It's run by my old friend Ernie. Let's go. Let's let's uh let's let's knock on the door and see if he's working late tonight. And unfortunate, fortunately at the time, but unfortunate for all parties, he was indeed. Chapter 10. Ernie Coltenbrunner age 36, a wiry, sandy-haired man with a bony face and wide, thick lips, had been having a busy evening even before he got a phone call from Bert Wilson. Mind you, he's only 36, which is actually my age. Wow, I'm as old as Ernie. But, you know, Ernie's supposed to be a Nazi in hiding in the film. So he's way, 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 way younger. I mean, he would be in his... 60s he should be in his 60s in uh in the movie something like that in order to be what he was 50s 60s um but yeah he he was having a busy evening even before he got the call from Bert Wilson he had to get a banker and his wife both embalmed patched up and laid out for Thursday morning 4th of July was tomorrow Wednesday if Ernie expected to have any part of the holiday free for himself he'd have to stay at the mortuary till the wee hours tonight working on the two corpses now bert wilson was coming over here in some kind of trouble that was going to eat up even more of ernie's precious time he tried to get done as much as possible before bert showed up it wasn't a piece of cake the banker and his wife morton and helen dowden 
had both been killed in a terrible car crash. Ernie had their nude, mangled bodies before him side by side with a work aisle in between on two separate embalming tables. Morton Downey's body was in two pieces. In the twisting, shattering impact made made upon his Cadillac by a grocery van that had lost its brakes on a high-speed highway, his torso had been completely severed by the jagged windscreen and uh, that had been transformed into a gigantic rip saw, tearing him apart diagonally beneath the rib cage. That might be some of John Russo's best writing. Some of it uh, in this in this book. This is where John Russo really really shines. And this is obviously not in the film. We get this whole backstory. This this little addition of 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 these people. Surprisingly, there were only a few cuts and scratches on his face, arms, and legs. Helen Dowden was a different story. Both of her hands had been cut off. Her nose was missing. In its place was a blood caked hole. Judging from the rouge and the lipstick that she still wore, her face had received a lot of cosmetic attention in life as a woman were as women were wont to do. What? That doesn't make sense. And it was going to require even more in death. <clears throat> the Dowdens Grief-stricken, beautiful, 20-year-old daughter had insisted that she didn't want a closed casket funeral. She would pay whatever it cost to make mom and pop look good. She had given Ernie Colton Brunner eight by ten portraits to work from. He could see that they had been a handsome couple and could take professional pride in restoring their attractiveness under such challenging circumstances. He could picture them graciously mingling at the country club affair they had been driving to, both with thick white hair, expensively barbered, and coif, coifed, coiffed, like that word, coiffed, coiffed, both with blandly amiable smiles on their ruddy faces, and both with fashionable, well-tailored clothes on their slightly overweight bodies. He decided that he would try and make them appear as though they had arrived at the country club suited and gowned and had taken a notion to lie down for a moment in the presence of other guests. The first thing that Ernie did was to scoop out Morton Dowden's internal organs and pack them in a seal in sealable plastic bags laced with disinfectant. Then he packed co cotton batting. Then he packed cotton batting into the abdominal and chest cavities to prevent seepage of fluids as much as possible. When this was done, he wired and stapled the corpse's torso back together, looping the wires between the legs around the groin and stapling them to rib bones. Then he sewed the flesh together using a fine but strong thread of monofilament and making neat, close, close, stitches to further ensure against leakage. Finally, he slipped a wide elax elastic corset padded inside like a piece of large sticking plaster up over the hip and around the torso, protecting and reinforcing the repair job. You're good as new, Morton, Ernie told his patient. He turned his attention on Dowden, stapling and stitching, her severed hands so that they were firmly reattached. There, Helen, don't worry about this not looking absolutely neat, he consoled her. You'll be wearing a lovely pair of elbow length evening gloves. And so long as you don't tell and so long as you and I don't tell anyone, they'll never guess your secret. Ooh, this is macabre. Embalming Helen Dowden wasn't any special problem. He inserted the injection needle into the cart uh Corotoid, carotoid artery and the drainage needle in the jugular vein and got the pump going, replacing blood with embalming fluid. The circulatory system was a closed circuit, enabling the machinery to do its job without any disruptions, except for the vessels severed at the wrists, where incisions had to be watched for leakage, and the hands, which had to be separately injected with embalming solution. The difficulty with Morton Dowden was, of course, that his circulatory system had been aborted, ripped in half with the rest of his body. 
it meant that Ernie had to embalm all of the body parts separately. However, because of the severity of the wound, these are in quotation marks, the severity and wound, virtually all of the blood had been drained. So it was a matter of making sure enough embalming fluid got to the tissues. Ernie had barely completed the embalming of the husband and wife when the night bell rang. He opened a drawer in his Martitian supply cabinet and pulled out a large black Luger that he kept for personal protection. And then he went out the side door of the embalming room, looking through the peephole and saw Bert Wilson standing outside in the floppy golfer's hat that he usually wore to their sun Saturday night poker sessions. Now, I think what is lost on our friend John Russo is that the 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 subversive idea that Ernie is supposed to be a Nazi carrying that Luger. And instead, he's now like a 36 year old. I mean, it's just again, I think it totally goes over John Russo's head. Bert jumped back when Ernie opened the door. Christ's sake, you're going to shoot me or something. Ernie glanced down or Christ's sake, you're going to shoot me or something. Ernie glanced down at the Luger, but forgot to point point pointed aside. Got to have this for self-protection against the creepos who hang out around this neighborhood at night. Sometimes I hear funny noises in the cemetery across the way. People carrying on, playing loud music. You'd think that they would have some respect for the dead. Um, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, we had some tombstones overturned, graves desecrated. Tonight, I thought I heard some weird sounds and saw some sparklers or something. But if I called the cops who's ever whipping it up over there would be bug out as soon as they heard the sirens. And if I took the time to check it out, I'd probably shoot somebody crazy kids could be scoring dope over there for all I know. While Ernie was yakking, Bert gingerly nudged the muzzle of the Luger away from his belly. And Ernie took the hint and put the gun back in its drawer. You look green around the girl, the, the girls, you look green around the gills. Ernie said, do you want some hot coffee to perk you up? No, no, no coffee for me, Bert said, turning a bit greener when he followed Ernie into the area where the patched up bodies of Morton and Helen Dowden reposted, reposed on the embalming tables. Well, I'm going to have some, said Ernie. He went to the Mr. Coffee machine and poured himself a steaming cup. Sipping it, he stared at the place where Helen Dowden's nose ought to have been like an artist con contemplating his next brush stroke. Got to make her a new one, he said. She won't be able to use it for breathing, but I don't think she'll mind as long as she looks good. He took another sip of coffee and he gave Bert a sharp, probing look. Sorry to have to tell you, you hit me on a busy night, Bert. You mentioned an urgent problem on the phone? Bert cleared his throat. <clears> throat> Listen, if I had to, if I asked you to keep a secret, a very important secret, could you? Sure, what is it? Ernie, I need your help in a big way. You know you can depend on me. You know that. What's wrong? Uh, I've got a couple of my men outside. Mind if I bring them in? Sure. What's the big deal, Bert? They're going to bring in something with them. I have to warn you, Ernie, old pal, old poker buddy. What they're going to bring here is pretty horrible. Bert, level with me, said Ernie, suddenly much more worried about what he was letting himself in for. Did you kill somebody? In a way, I wish I did, said Bert, smiling a mirthlessly en 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 enigmatic, like, you know, um, like a question mark of a smile. En en enigmatic. Try saying that word. I wish to God I had killed some. I wish to God I had killed what I tried to kill. Now, we just talked about how um, great some of this set up for Helen and Morton Dowden was and it's great because it like puts like it like draws characterization to what otherwise would be two corpses which is awesome it's good but then like we lose all of the nuance in the film in this exchange because in the movie you can see that that Ernie is like stressed he's like Bert says I gotta let my guys in I think I forget what the lines are and Ernie doesn't want it he doesn't want a big he doesn't want people coming in and here it all that nuance is lost in in the, that we see in the film and that's what you get from performances from really talented actors and in in this way it comes off wooden 
In any case, this last bit, though, is really is really freaky. Did you kill somebody in a way I wish I did, said Bert, smiling a mirthlessly ign- ign- I'm not going to say it. Uh, I wish I had killed what I tried to kill. Uh, it looks like I, I was I skipped a chapter, so uh, it's not as long of a reading as I thought. It's we're, we're on chapter 11. Tina Vitali couldn't believe it. Legs was actually letting that ignorant slob suicide put his his thing into her when while she was dancing naked on the tombstone he had taken his shirt and pants off and had stood in front of legs with a big erection wearing nothing but a studded dog collar then she had leapt onto him wrapping her great legs around his scrawny pimpled butt now they were going at it like mad right on top of the grave meat and Casey had wandered off somewhere, probably doing it on top of some other grave and Chuck and Scuzz were leaning against the tombstone, toking a joint and watching suicide and legs doing it in the sputtering glare of the road flare that was half burnt out. Tina felt all the way burnt out. She couldn't watch this scene any longer or she would freak out. She'd go totally bananas and have to be locked away somewhere in some funny farm. Suddenly, she didn't like her friends and knew that she didn't want to be like them. She had a clear vision of what she would become if she didn't break away, and it wasn't a pretty picture. Only half realizing what she was doing, she found herself slowly stepping backwards, backing away, melting soundlessly into the darkness. Then she turned and walked faster lightning flash and thunder boom she hurried her pace towards the stone arc of resurrection cemetery when she passed under the arc and back out onto the sidewalk it was like she was leaving her past behind her except for freddie travis he was the only one she needed to take with her into a brighter saner future she heard a door slam and when she looked down the block at the side lot of colton burner's funeral home to her great amazement she thought she saw freddie It was Freddy. He had just slammed shut the back doors of a white van with Unita Medical Supply written on it in big red letters. But what would he be doing at a funeral home? Freddy, Tina cried. Freddy. He turned, surprised at the sound of her voice and the clicking of her high heels as she hurried towards him. He recognized her for sure as she passed under the street lamp. They fell into each other's arms and kissed beside the van in the glare of the yellow bug light over the side door of the embalming room. Freddy, she she murmured. Oh, Freddy, I'm so glad to see you. But what are you doing here? Uh, I, uh, special, special delivery, he stammered. At a funeral home? I wouldn't have thought that any, I wouldn't have thought that anybody in there would be beyond the help of any sort of medical supply. I would I would have thought that anybody in there would be beyond the help of any sort of medical supply. You don't understand. It's will you be getting off work soon? It's well past eight o'clock. I can't wait for us to be together. There's so many things I want to tell you about. I mean, it all came together for me today. This is going to be a brand new start for us. I can just feel it. Uh, About that. Yikes. She hugged Freddy again and planted a big smacker. Just then, <laughs> lightning and thunder erupted in a tremendous flash and roar, and Frank Nello came out of the embalming room. Feeling like a peeping Tom, he stood by watching Freddy and Tina kiss, a long, drawn-out one with their eyes closed. When they finally came up for air, he said, I take it this is your girlfriend, kid. Uh, yeah, Freddy stammered. Tina Vitali, meet my boss, Frank Nello. I, I know I'm not doing all the voices that I was doing before. I just suck at that. Pleased to meet you, said Tina. Freddie and I have a date tonight when he gets off. Do you mind if I wait for him in the van, Mr. Nello? Better not do that, Frank said nervously. It's going to rain is all she meant, Freddie said, pleading. That's okay. Forget I asked, said Tina, wondering what why Freddie was acting so strangely. The embalming room door banged open and Bert Wilson leaned out, glowering. Frank, Freddy, come on. Damn it. The stuff you lugged in is squirming all over the floor here. We got no time to piss around in the parking lot. Er, uh, sorry, but my girlfriend just showed up, Freddy apologized. 
We'll get rid of her till later. Uh, boss, Frank Nello said to Bert, we can't let her stay out here. There's going to be a downpour. And I don't believe we want her inside either. Why don't I give her my key so she can wait for Freddie back at the warehouse? We got everything cleaned up back there. She can't get into any trouble and she'll be out of our hair till we get to do what needs to be done. Can she be trusted? Bert demanded, glowering at Freddie. Sure, boss, Freddie said. And what's interesting here is this little like exchange is not in the film. This is written. And while I love to have any piece like, you know, any other, I mean, it's cool to hear it, but you know, if you're, if you're, you know, trimming a movie for like running time, this doesn't need to be in there. What they do in the movie is perfect. It's a cinematic, you know, she goes looking for Freddie. She goes to the base, she finds the star man. Um, we are approaching one of the absolute most terrifying scenes in the book for me, something truly terrifying. Um, that I've been talking about a long time. And finally, I think we've got, we've gotten here. We've gotten here. Uh, <laughs> give her the damn keys. Then Bert said wearily and get in here. I need you two guys for moral support. He went back in slamming the door here. Tina Frank said, handing her his key ring. It's the big one here, the front door, pull it shut and lock it after you go in, then wait for us in the office. Oh, thank you. Said Tina. No problem. Said Frank, me and Freddie are buddies. We've been through a lot in just two days, right, kid? He winked and went into the embalming room, leaving Freddie alone with Tina. She said, that's weird. You started. She said, comma, Freddie, tell me the truth. Is something goofy going on? Are you in trouble? No, he lied. Why? The guy in the Bermuda shorts, bleh, the guy in the Bermuda shorts mentioned something squirming on the floor in there. I can't imagine what he meant. But it gave me the creeps. Believe me, Tina, it's better if I don't tell you what he meant. So please don't ask, okay? Just go to the warehouse and wait for me. Everything's going to be okay. I promise. He took off his red baseball cap and handed it to her. Wear this in case you get caught in the rain. I really got to go now. The sooner I get this over with, the sooner I can be with you. He backed away from her and put, her, put his hand on the doorknob. Bye, Freddy. I'll be waiting for you. So please hurry. I wonder if John Russo kind of like ships Tina and Freddie. You know what I mean by ships, like relationships, like he, you know, like that that thing that they that all the kids are saying these days. Um, bye, honey, he said, and went into the embalming room and closed the door behind him. Tina stared down for at the Tina stared at the door for a moment and then decided to just walk to the warehouse as fast as she could to try and beat the rain. She put the red cap down over her long black hair, thinking what a touching gesture it had been for Freddie to give it to her. At a loss to picture exactly what kind of squirmy things on the floor he had to deal with before he could get off work, she found herself silently saying a Hail Mary for him as she walked. It was the second time she had prayed in many months. The first time had been for sunshine even though she had rebelled against the dogma of her Catholic upbringing, the need to pray occasionally overwhelmed her in times of trial. But because she remained a doubter, she didn't really know if giving in to prayer at these times was a strength or a weakness. In this rundown section of Louisville, the nighttime streets were totally deserted. To Tina, it was creepy, and the impending rain made it even creepier. Sometimes, as she walked, she could smell steaming garbage and stale urine coming from the alleys, while in the distance she heard faint, tantalizing sounds of livelier, prettier sections of the city. Every once in a while, the pools of light cast by widely spaced... Every once in a while... The pools of light cast by widely spaced street lamps were augmented by horrendous flashes of lightning that for a few shuddering seconds made everything as bright as daylight. Approaching the warehouse, Tina saw lights burning in a couple of grimy windows, the huge black barge of a building looking forbidding inside instead of the huge black barge of a building looking forbidding instead of comforting. She considered just sitting on the concrete steps out front and not going inside unless the rain started to come down. 
She felt spooky and suddenly cold. Don't be silly. There's nothing to be afraid of in there, she muttered to herself and put Frank Nello's key in the steel door with a deadbolt lock. She hesitated and turned the key. No sooner had she pushed the door open than she heard a hoarse, desperate voice coming from somewhere deep inside the warehouse. Help me, please. Help. <coughs> please help me. Again, terrifying. Ter this is terrifying. No sooner had she pushed the door open than she heard a hoarse, desperate voice coming from somewhere deep inside the warehouse. Hoarse and desperate. Help, please help me. Tina jumped back. She almost slammed the door and ran, but the voice sounded so piteous, so desperate. She'd never forgive herself for abandoning someone who needed her help. It could have been one of Freddie's fellow workers who had some kind of accident when nobody was around. The voice cried out again, help, please, help. It was getting weaker and hoarser and more desperate. Responding to its urgency, Tina stepped quickly into the warehouse and shut the steel door, but forgot to turn the knob that must be turned to secure the deadbolt from inside. Where are you? She called out. I'm here. Where are you? She moved through the dark shadows past the office door into the bay with its tiers of shelving and stacks of crated medical supplies. Down here, the weak voice croaked. Tina found her way to the cellar door. Oh, my God. God. Then she heard the voice once again pleading for help. She opened the door and saw nothing but blackness. <laughs> Sorry, she groped for the light switch and found it, and the naked light bulb came on, illuminating the deep, treacherous, treacherous stairwell. Hurry, I'm down here the pitiful voice whispered. Tina peered into the cellar, craning her neck, repulsed by the smell of dampness and dankness. But unable to ignore the sufferer who must be down there, she held her breath and started down the stairs. This, to me, is the single most terrifying part of the whole book. Why on earth they did not shoot this and film this in the movie I think if they had, it would elevate this film somehow even more than it already is and make it absolute. I mean, this is terrifying. This is this passage might even be more terrifying than when I was 10 years old watching this movie for the first time, scared out of my wits. That's how terrifying that passage is to me. Meanwhile, Freddie Travis was listening to an argument between Burt Wilson and Ernie Colton Brenner. Freddie and Frank had carried several big, heavy-duty brown plastic garbage bags from the van and had deposited the, the writhing, squirming bags in the middle of the embalming room floor. Ernie had taken one look at them, and he refused to cremate them. There's something alive in those bags, he had told Bert. His green eyes flashed angrily. You've got nerve. You've got a nerve, friendship or not. I am not about to just burn something alive without knowing what it is, or even with knowing what it is for that matter. Ernie, I can't tell you what it is, Bert had wailed. I'm asking you to trust me. What's in these bags definitely needs burning. But Ernie had refused to trust Bert that much and had reached and they had reached an impasse. In the lull, Ernie had gone about his business making a new nose for Helen Dowden that was remarkably like the original one. The new one was made of dermawax, molded and blended in, into her face. It looked good enough to breathe out of. 
Freddie was both fascinated and repulsed by the mortician's clever work every time he stole a glance at it. The brown plastic bags had continued to squirm on the floor, and Freddie kept a nervous watch to make sure none of them edged closer to him. He was stationed alongside Frank Nello, midway between the bags and the embalming tables. After sculpting the new nose, Ernie Coltenbrenner, why does he keep calling him Ernie Coltenbrenner? Why does he just say Ernie? Uh, took hold of one of Helen Dowden's arms and started bending it. It appeared to be stiff, and it was with an effort that he massaged and bent it a little at a time. Bert Wilson, who had fallen silent in his effort to think up a fresh approach to talking Ernie into cremating the contents of the plastic bags, spoke for the first time in several minutes. Ernie, w what the hell are you doing? Breaking out the rigor mortis. Oh, yeah? Rigor mortis uh, starts in the brain, Ernie explained. Then it moves to the internal organs and finally settles in the muscles. See, he pinched Helen on her bicep. It wears off after a while, but you can see it wears off after a while, but you can break it out manually by flexing the muscles. I have to do this if I want to get her and her husband in shape for laying them out in natural poses. I see, said Bert. He cleared his throat. Ernie, you got to burn these bags for me, please. I'm asking you as a pal and a poker buddy. Not without knowing what's inside, Ernie insisted, continuing to flex and massage Helen Dowden's body. I like this too, this sort of back and forth. There's no time for this in the movie, although I kind of wish they had. I mean, a little bit of back and forth push and pull uh, before we finally get to see what's inside would have uh, elevated it even further. John Russo has some good ideas. He does. He does. Far and few between, but when he does, he does. Okay, okay, Bert said, approaching Ernie and putting his hand on his shoulder. I'll tell you what's in the bag so you'll understand why we can't risk opening them. Rabid weasels. That's what's in there. Honest. What? Said Ernie. What are you doing with a bunch of rabid weasels? He stopped flexing Helen Dowden's naked right leg and stepped over a pile of squirming bags gazing down on them bert gingerly stepped behind ernie sticking close to him i'm trying to explain to you ernie they came in as part of a shipment they weren't supposed to be rabid but you know how these things happen frank and freddie were looking on almost disinterested in the discussion except for their desire to get the grisly business done and get out of there I'm still sick as hell and my head hurts, Freddy whispered to Frank. Do you feel the same way? Frank nodded glumly. Rabid weasels, Ernie Colton Burner mumbled disbelievingly and bent to untie one of the brown plastic bags. Watch it, Ernie. You don't want to get bit, Bert hastily cautioned him. Ernie scooped up. Ernie stood up, blinking his eyes questioningly at Bert and said, frankly, I do not think I believe you poker buddy or not bert shouted i'm telling you there's rabid weasels in those bags and we have to destroy them it's our friggin civic duty for christ's sake unperturbed ernie suggested why don't you call the animal shelter if this story got out it might hurt my business you know rabies and everything i think you're overreacting said ernie so what you don't run a pet store so some lab animals got rabies take them to the pound that's all well we can't, Ernie. You, you got to take my word for it. Be, be a friend, for Christ's sake. I, I wouldn't involve you in this if I didn't need to. If I had any other way out, I'd... If they are rabid weasels, you can't just burn them alive, said Ernie. It's too awful. At least let me kill them first. He went to the drawer and... He went to the drawer in the supply cabinet and took out his Luger. Just have your two men here carry them out to the parking lot, and I'll put... I'll put them out of their misery. See, in the mo in the in the movie, Freddie's sorry, uh, Ernie's eagerness to to euthanize the rabid weasels is you know in you know indicative of the fact that he used to be a Nazi, as well as the use of the the, the crematorium. You know, uh, it's so genius. It's so well done. In uh, Daniel Bannon, it was a goddamn genius. He really was. Bert looked nervously at Frank and Freddie and then back at Ernie. I don't think that would work, he shrugged. What do you mean? Why not? Ernie, can you swear to keep a secret? I don't know. Depends on what kind of secret. 
you have to swear or I can't tell you, but I promise I won't make you part of anything illegal. All right, said Ernie grudgingly. I promise. Bert took a deep breath. Well, old pal, old poker buddy, old pal, it's not rabid weasels in the bags, he confessed. Ernie stared at the struggling bags, taking a tighter grip on his Luger. Bert went over to one of the bags and tugged loose on the cord that held it shut. He pulled the plastic apart a little and revealed a hand, clenching and unclenching. Holy shit, Ernie said, jumping back. Sorry, but this is the only way you're going to believe me when I tell you the truth, Bert said. And he picked up the bag and emptied its contents onto the floor in front of Ernie. A human arm sawed off at the shoulder, fell to the floor, and started writhing. The hand, separately severed, was still clenching and unclenching. Then the hand twitched and leapt and managed to grab Ernie's ankle. He let out a strangled scream. I love that. That's a great adjective for scream. He let out a strangled scream and tried to kick the thing off. Freddie and Frank watched, too sick to move, but Bert quickly knelt and put the severed hand away, pulled the severed hand away from Ernie's leg, tearing his sock in the process. Yick, said Ernie. Bert tossed the hand and the arm back in the bag and tied the cord. Ernie was white and shaking, leaning back against one of the embalming tables. Better sit down, old pal, Bert said. I got quite a story to tell you. Meanwhile, Tina had come down the steps in the warehouse basement. The third step had almost made her fall. It was an old plank, you know, and totally an old bitch. Third step is always a bitch partially splintered and wobbly it had creaked and shifted under her high heeled shoes and she had barely managed to keep her balance then more cautiously she had descended the rest of the steps at the bottom she peered into near darkness wondering why she was hearing nothing more from the croaky injured sounding voice She found another light switch and flipped it on, amazed at the filth and the clutter all around her. Suddenly, something moved in the shadows behind some rusty drums. I am, like, shivering right now. Tina stiffened. Hello? She called out tremendously. Are you there? I'm here to help you. Something started to shuffle out of the shadows. Tina squinted, trying to make it out, and then she gasped. A huge intake of air that filled her entire chest cavity, and her eyes got as huge and round as saucers. Rooted by fright, she found herself staring at a horrible monstrosity. The body that was in the cracked drum had somehow reconstituted into a black tarry loathsome skeleton it spoke in a voice like vomit the true voice of the creature undisguised by its former attempt to sound mortal brains brains it said in a lustful croak shuffling towards tina raising its arms to clutch and embrace her She turned and ran for the stairs, dashing up them, gasping and panting in horror. On the way, she kicked off her high-heeled shoes, which would only impede her effort to save her life. When she hit that third step, the one that's a bitch, from the top, it came down on her with all of her weight. Sorry. Uh, Coming down on it with all of her weight, it gave way, splintering with a loud ripping noise. Tina's leg plunged right through as the step caved in, tearing her flesh and jamming her to her hip. The stinking black corpse started climbing towards her on all fours, muttering, Brains! Brains! She hung in her helpless situation with one leg poking poking through the stair cavity, 
kicking and trying to find purchase. She clawed at the stairs and the walls, twisting to look at the monster coming after her. Brains, the thing croaked. Impelled by fear, since she couldn't extricate herself from her trap, Tina pulled her other leg through the splinters of the broken step and then lowered her body and let herself drop through the stairwell. She landed with a thud on concrete beneath the steps and lay there gasping and moaning, trying to pull herself upright. The rotting, chemically mummified corpse started dragging itself back down the steps. Tina struggled to crawl away from the hideous thing and finally staggered to her feet as the corpse reached for her croaking. Live brains! No! Tina screamed, limping deeper into the basement. I just have to stop here for one second because... The descriptors here are just this again. All right, I, I take it back. This is John Russo's best writing. In uh, his description of the tar man is perfect. The a loathsome creature, you know, I love that it reconstituted from like goo. Uh, you just get such a image knowing what the tar man looks like and knowing the way that Russo describes him. It's like the perfect fusion, and it is terrifying. She dodged and hid among the piles of dusty, grimy debris. And just when she thought she was doomed, she spotted an old janitor's closet with the door ajar. She darted into it and pulled the door shut, hoping that the creature wouldn't know she was in there. To her great relief, the door was made of steel and could be locked by depressing and turning the knob from the inside. She did this just in time, a few seconds before her pursuer started tugging and twisting. Then she cowered in the darkness. The thing started pounding and pounding, trying to push the door in. Tina screamed, Freddy! Freddy! Desperately hoping that he had returned from the funeral home. She stood up and groped for something to defend herself with. Her hand struck a cord and she pulled it. The closet bulb came on. She looked frantically all around her and saw nothing but an old mop, a squeegee, a ringer bucket, and some cleaning supplies. The pounding on the door kept up ryth rhythmically, repetitively. Bang. Pause. Bang. Pause. Bang. Pause. Sobbing with fear, Tina covered her ears with her hands. Then suddenly... The pounding stopped. Not knowing whether to be relieved or more scared, Tina pulled her hands away from her ears. She darted her eyes around, all around in another frantic survival scan. This time she noticed that the steel door had a peephole in it. Apparently it had once been used as the front door of an office till it had been appropriated for this basement closet. Timidly, Tina put her eye to the peephole she caught a glimpse of the blackened corpse shuffling among the piles of junk, shoving things inside, apparently on some kind of shoving things aside, apparently on some kind of search. With dread, she realized what it must be looking for, a tool, an implement, something that could be used to pry open the closet door and drag her out. Freddy, she screamed, Freddy, with heightened terror. Absolutely, absolutely terrifying. If I have one criticism of this passage, it is that, like, give the tar man some more dialogue besides brains, brains, brains. That's my only criticism. Because that first part, oh, my God. Ah! Freddie and Frank were listening as Bert finished telling Ernie Coltenbrunner the events that had led up to the request to use the crematorium. So now you know, said Bert. What's in these plastic bags is a, a split dog all cut up, a corpse that we dismembered with a friggin' bone saw because they would, wouldn't stay dead. Because they wouldn't stay dead like they were supposed to. Now will you let us cremate the damn things? Trying to digest all the fantastic details. Ernie stared at the squirming bags. Why me? He said mournfully. Why does it always have to be me who's dumb enough to stick around and try to operate a class funeral home in a dying neighborhood 
where I seldom get to deal with upper crust people, loyal people like Morton and Helen here. He looked at the cadavers and then back at the squirming bags. If I hadn't seen that dismembered hand grabbing my ankle, I never would have believed you, Bert. I'm still not sure I really saw it. Well, you did, said Bert. You saw it all right. So me and Frank and Freddie. So get your oven fired up, will you, Ernie? Yes, yes, I suppose there's no other choice. Follow me, Ernie said. Bring those bags with you. They went down the hallway into the crematorium. While Bert, Frank, and Freddie lugged the plastic bags full of animal and human body parts into the room, Ernie turned the knobs that ignited the gas jets with a loud thump. Then he opened the door of the oven and pulled out a long, sliding, stainless steel rack. Pile all the bags on here, men, he instructed. Bert said, this will destroy everything, right? Nothing. I want, we want nothing left over. Oh, everything will go, Ernie assured him, including the bones. Oh, the bones are no problem. The hardest part to burn is the heart. Freddy shuddered, lifting the bag containing the cadaver's trembling torso onto the oven rack. The heart is tough to burn? Why? asked Bert. The heart is tough to burn? Why? asked Bert. It's just a big, tough muscle, said Ernie. But we don't want any part surviving, Bert said. Don't worry. I'll turn it up hotter for the heart. And the split dog, that has to go too. All of it. All of its parts. Even if it's half of a heart. All of it will go assured Ernie. So there won't be anything left then? Bert nitpicked. Nothing but a little itty bitty pile of ashes. Well, we don't even want the ashes, Ernie. Then I'll turn it up higher and we'll burn the ashes too. When Fred, when Frank said all loaded up and Ernie slid the stainless steel rack into the oven with its squirmy cargo, he slammed the door, which had a porthole in it so that the work of the flames could be viewed Frank and Freddie hung back, too sick to look, but Bert and Ernie watched, anxious to make sure that the crematorium handled its grisly chore. The gas jets curled up and around the flopping, struggling bags. The plastic quickly burned off, revealing the limbs and the body parts of the cadaver and the split dog. The human head and the half of dog's head were screaming from the heat, and the other body part sections were rolling and twitching like mad. The hair and fur started to singe, and the flesh of it, the flesh itself began to sizzle, curl, and blacken. Black smoke poured from the chimney of the crematorium. Uh oh. The fat columns of black, oily smoke rose to the sky, reaching the dense, dark rain clouds that had been hovering all afternoon and evening. When the putrid smoke mixed with the clouds, there was a blinding explosion, a veritable hydra of electricity dancing all over the ominous sky. With this burst of malignant lightning, the rain that had held back all day began to come down. For some strange reason, it seemed to concentrate itself in the area of the Colton Burner Funeral Home and the Resurrection Cemetery. The rain saturated the graves, splattering the tombstones and monuments. The droplets pelted the blades of grass and soaked down into the earth. As the moisture pounded on the turf, it seemed to steam, making clinging bundles of vaporous mist, blackish yellow earth-hugging clouds, as malignant looking as thick bundles of smoke pouring from the crematorium chimney. When this unusual rain collected in puddles, for instance, in the depressions of sunken ancient graves, it began to corrode the earth. It began to eat its way down, loosening and dissolving the packed soil and soaking into the coffins beneath. The chemical-laden water hissed as it sank through the ground and seeped through the coffins, seeking the long dead flesh that the coffins held. Every now and then, forks of lightning that normally might have struck tall trees or power lines actually came down low between the trees or other choice targets and smashed the earth, splitting it apart, making it easier for the ugly yellow rain 
to reach the buried coffins. When this rain started, Scuzz, Legs, Chuck, Casey, and Meat ran from the cemetery. Scuzz's ghetto blaster blaring, and Legs was pulling her clothes on as the gas stumbled and darted among the tombstones. In a blinding downpour, they groped their way to the exit under the stone arch and piled into Suicide's convertible. Suicide tried to start the engine, but got nothing but a grinding sound and no turnover. Legs said, hey, my skin burns. Me too, said Scuzz. Turn that box off. It'll track fucking lightning, said Meat. Scuzz turned off the loud music. My skin stings, said Casey. It's that rain. It's like acid rain or something. I saw a puddle of it look that looked yellowish. Oh, shit, Legs bitched. It's all over me. A towel. Somebody give me a towel. Yeah, you think you're in a hotel? Suicide leered. Oh, crap. I wonder what's in that rain, said Legs. Suicide kept grinding the ignition till he, could, uh, till he couldn't get a peep out of the battery. Then he said, fuck it. This car ain't going nowhere. Hey, by the way, said Meat, where the hell's Tina? I ain't seen her since back in the cemetery. She must have split, cut out on us. That wench's head, that wench, that wench's head is screwed up, said Suicide. She went looking for Freddy, said Chuck, and she found him. How the hell do you know, Scuzz jeered? Because I tailed her for a little, well, because I tailed her for a little way when she tried to sneak off on us. He was sneaking up behind her. Freddie was down by the funeral home unloading a van with you need a medical supply on it. Tina went and met him, and he must have given her a key to the warehouse to go in and wait for him. It's so ridiculous. I mean, they just like inexplicably run for Unita in, in the movie. Um, my, my son and daughter are running around upstairs. You might hear them screaming, blowing off steam before bed. Tina went and met him and he must have given her a key to the warehouse to go in and wait for him because i saw her open the door and go in the unita vans still parked down there by the funeral home see it yeah yeah said suicide using his hand to wipe mist from the windscreen so he could peer through the battered rain hey do you guys hear something Uh uh-oh casey piped up all of a sudden hear what said meat i don't know something like maybe the wind howling only stranger and weirder they all fell silent and listened as hard as they could. It's coming from the cemetery, Meat yelled. Wind down the window, suicide. Shit, we'll get drenched again, Legs complained. Um, it was hard to hear anything distinctly above the noise of pelting rain, but they all thought that they heard distant, muffled moaning. The sound seemed to come up from somewhere deep like below the ground, soft, almost too muted to hear. There was something clawing and there were some clawing and scratching sounds and something that sounded like nails or boards being pried loose. That is scary as fuck. It, it, <clears throat> it was hard to hear anything distinctly above the noise of the pelting rain, but they all thought they heard distant, muffled moaning. The sound seemed to come from somewhere deep, like below the ground, soft, almost too muted to hear. Then there were some clawing and scratching sounds and something that sounded like nails or boards being pried loose. The fucking corpses are coming out of the graves. Suicide joked, letting out a mad giggle. <laughs> but nobody else laughed. They were too worried that the strange sounds that they were hearing were indicative of exactly what Suicide had put into words. Wind the windows up, Legs cried. That shit and rain stings. That shit and rain stings. I can't keep dry anyway, said Casey. There's a leak in the roof right above my head. I got to get out of here, said Chuck with, claustrophob with claustrophobic ferocity. Let's go over to the warehouse and see if Tina will let us in so we can wait out the storm. If she's there, she better let us in, said Suicide. All this is her freaking boyfriend's fault. If that queeb, Freddy, never got such a dopey job. Fucking A, said Scuzz. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be here. Damn right, said Suicide. 
the whole gang piled out of the convertible and dashed across the street through the downpour, their shoes splashing in deep puddles of yellowish water as the tall boys take a walk played. Meanwhile, Tina's situation had gone from bad to worse. Locked in the basement closet, she had watched the rotting corpse-like creature shuffling around in the shadows, hunting through the junk and the rubble. Sometimes she couldn't see him at all, and sometimes she could only see parts of him because he was outside the periphery of the peephole. For a while, she had dared to hope that she might remain safe. She couldn't imagine what he might find that would enable him to get at her. But then he came shuffling towards her, and she caught a glimpse of something frightening in his hand, an old, rusty crowbar. She screamed as his foul, stinking black shape loomed closer, blotting out her view through the peephole. She heard the crowbar being wedged between the door and the jab, and with a creaking, prying noise, the jab started to bend. In a matter of moments, the tongue of the lock was going to be popped loose. Thinking to herself how true it was that there were no agnostics in foxholes, Tina started to mumble an act of contrition. Oh, boy. While Tina was praying, Chuck, Casey, Meat, Scuzz, Legs, and Suicide came pounding up the front steps of the warehouse main entrance. Without bothering to ring the bell, Meat twisted the doorknob and was surprised when the door came open. Right, that was the whole thing about the lock. I mean, it's like it's like Russo needs to explain. He has to explain all this stuff to us. That's what it is. Like He has to explain all these like little things. The movie doesn't worry about this stuff, and it doesn't matter. The gang immediately rushed inside, brushing the rain off themselves. Legs said, my skin really burns. Ouch, ouch. Well, if you were taking a bath once in a while, Casey joked. Chuck shouted, hey, Tina, are you in here? Tina's voice came back in a reply, a distinct shout. Yes, here, help me. I'm in the cellar. Oh, God. Because she sounded so desperate, the whole gang broke into a run towards the sound of her voice, towards the basement door. They were all yelling once as they ran. Is that Tina? Said Meat. What's she yelling about? Said Casey. Where the fuck is she? Meat wondered. Through the door, said Scuzz. Watch out. There's a broken step. Suicide pushed Scuzz out of the way and took the lead. He and everybody else charged down the basement stairs after stepping gingerly past the place where there was a splintered gap they hit the bottom of the steps in time to see the blackened figure of the corpse prying open the door of the closet where Tina was cowering. As the door banged open, Suicide yelled, What the fuck? The rotting chemical mummy turned its head. I love that. The rotting chemical mummy turned its head and looked at Suicide. He and his friends stared, not sure what they were seeing. Some kind of dirty, filthy, horrible, rotten... Tina took advantage of the moment while they were all frozen to run for her life out of the closet when the mummy turned to grab her. She was gone, darting and banging into junk boxes and barrels. As a second choice, the mummy came after suicide, croaking his favorite word, brains. Suicide was so terrified his legs went wobbly and he slipped in a greasy puddle while the rest of the gang... <laughs> while the rest of the gang backed away. When he scrambled and slid on the slippery concrete floor, the stinking corpse grabbed him by his ears, yanked his head up, and bit into the top of his stubbly shaved head, like eating a melon without slicing it first, or an egg into the shell. Crack! The chemical mummy had powerful jaws, even though it seemed to be half rotten and dead. Suicide screamed horribly, but briefly, as his whole body twitched, his arms and legs jerking spastically in a death reflex due to having a piece bitten out of his brain. Chuck, Casey, Meat, Scuzz, and Legs stared in mind-popping horror at what was taking place in front of them. Tina screamed and circled behind them, running past them and up the stairs. They were left looking on stupidly at the at the monster as the monster took another bite out of suicide skull chomp shit said meat 
he picked up a block of dirty wood and hurled it at the corpse, hitting its shoulder and succeeding in drawing its attention. It looked up at Meat and the rest of his pals. More brains, the monster croaked, sounding stronger than before it had made a meal of suicide. <clears throat> Meat and the gang bolted for the stairs. They leapt up and stumbled en masse, scra scrambling across and over the gapped out step. The last one out of the basement, Meat turned and slammed the door shut. Help me, he screamed. Bar this door. Don't run away, you fuckers. While Tina was fighting for her life and Suicide's brains were being devoured, Freddy was feeling sicker than ever in his stomach and his head. He watched Ernie Coltenburner open the door to the crematorium over and jab around inside with a poker while Bert Wilson peered anxiously over his shoulder. Is the heart gone? Bert asked. Yep, all burnt up, said Ernie, leaning his poker against the wall, against the oven and slamming the door. Are you sure? Bert pressed. It's all gone right up the chimney. Thank God it's over, said Bert, vis visibly relaxing. I never heard such a weight. I never had such a weight lifted from my shoulders. Thanks to you, Ernie. Don't forget now, you're invited to my barbecue tomorrow. Think you can make it? <laughs> it depends, Bert. I'll try, but I might be too pooped. I still have to get Mr. and Mrs. Dowden looking pretty for their debut on Thursday morning. Well, I'm not going to forget I owe you a big one, uh, said Bert. Then he looked over at Frank and Freddie. They were sitting side by side, slumped on a little bench on the far side of the crematorium, both looking extremely ill. Hey, what's wrong with you two guys? Bert blurted. Cheer up. The worst is over with. I feel like shit, said Freddy. I'm really sick. Me too, said Frank. I feel sick too. Bert squatted in front of Freddy and Frank. Sick how? Freddy said, I've got a headache that would kill a horse, and I just want to puke. I'm so weak, and I can hardly move. Yeah, me too, said Frank, but I'm cold on top of it. I got a terrible chill. He shivered violently, hugging his arms tight to his body. It's that stuff. We breathe that stuff. What stuff, said Bert. What are they talking about, said Ernie, coming over to have a look at the two greenish-looking men on the crematorium bench. When the drum cracked, said Freddy, this gas squirted out. It hit us right in the face, and I know we breathed it. It knocked us out. We were out cold for a while. Christ, said Bert. We told you about it before, said Frank. This ain't the first time you're hearing about it. I know, I know, said Bert, pacing nervously once again. I didn't think the effects were still on you. Were still on you, that's all. Bert and Ernie both found themselves edging uneasily back a few steps away from Frank and Freddie. Man, we better get to a doctor, Freddie moaned. Yeah, I guess so, Frank agreed, holding his stomach. Bert says... You guys can use the company van. Drive to an emergency room. Suddenly, Frank stumbled to his feet and ran down the hall to the embalming room. He rushed through it, flinging open the door. He stuck his head out into the rain and vomited. Thunder and lightning and wind raging all around him. No sooner did he come back in than Freddy stumbled out and vomited too. Bert and Ernie hung back, watching fretfully. Frank wiped his mouth on the sleeve of his gray, you need a work shirt. Gotta call my wife, he mumbled. Gotta tell her I'm going to the hospital. Me too, said Freddie. Gotta let Tina know where I'm at. Maybe you guys can tell her. If they, if they had cell phones, they could just text. They could just text their loved ones. Ernie spoke, spoke up firmly. Listen, you two guys can't go running around in this storm. You're too sick. You're in no condition to drive. I'll call an ambulance. Get paramedics, said Frank. Why don't you two guys sit down over there? Bert suggested, pointing to a couple of folding chairs against a far wall parallel to the embalming tables, which still held the nude corpses of Morton and Helen Dowden. This would put the corpses between Bert and his two sick employees, who repulsed him more than the corpses did, since he didn't understand the disease they had and feared it might be contagious. Ernie grabbed a wall phone and dialed. Can I have the number of the city paramedics fire department? What's the number? He wrote on a scratch, a scratch pad. He wrote on a scratch pad, then hung up and dialed. Uh, hello. Yes. Can we get some paramedics over here? 
He listened and they gave and then gave the address of the funeral home. Tell the paramedics to come around to the side door to the embalming room. We've got two men poisoned here. We don't know what kind of poison. No, it wasn't embalming fluid. It didn't happen here. Tell the paramedics to hurry, okay? He hung up. They're on their way? At, they're on their way? Asked Bert. Yep, suppose, they're, they're supposed to be, said Ernie. Frank and Freddie were both doubled up, side by side on folding chairs, holding their heads and moaning. And that brings us to the end of chapter 11. That was a long, that was our longest reading yet. We're at page 93. It's not a long book. We're about, we're over halfway through because there's only, the book is only 170 pages. So we're, we're more than halfway through. You could, you could see it right there. We're more than halfway through. And um, yeah, that is the, that is the most terrifying part of the, of the entire, the most terrifying, you know, part of the book for me really is that part. I mean, there's more scary stuff later, but you know, just dealing with that tar man and just seeing like how gross he is, the, the language that Russo uses to describe him. It's, it's scary stuff. And, you know, John Russo, he does, he gets like, uh, tripped up on like small details, like leaving doors unlocked. We don't care. We need to read like a half a paragraph by of that. Give us more tar man. You know what I mean? And of course they don't call him the tar man in this, in this version. But um, his description, chemical mummy, uh, just, oh, my God, uh, loathsome creature, um, the, the talking, the, the, the luring down in the basement, the darkness. I could just see the darkness of this dark, deep, dark basement combined with what we've seen of the actual Unita basement in the movie. It's terrifying. So I uh, hope you enjoy that. I apologize. Like I said, my, the, you can hear a mouse fart in the basement all the way up from the attic in this house. The, the walls are very thin. I don't know if you heard my two small children running around with their mother um, uh, frustrated and angry that they're running around uh, after bath time when they're supposed to be in bed, but that is definitely what I heard upstairs. And like I said, I don't know what the quality of the recording is. And I don't really care to, to you know, uh, pretend like I didn't hear it. That is what I heard. And that's probably what you all heard too. Whatever. I don't really care. Um, well, I care enough to tell you is my point in case you hear the muffled screams of small children. <laughs> um, in any case, if you're a parent, you know, you know, you know, the deal, you know, the deal. If you're a parent, um, we'll see you next week with, uh, two more chapters. And I mean, we're, we're, we're closing in on the end of this book. I, I I'm having a lot of fun reading it. Um, I'm sorry that I retake sentences and stumble over my words, but I think we've done a pretty good job thus far. Um, Okay, we'll see you next time. Peace and hair grease. Well, hello, everybody. It is that time of the week, Monday night, when we read another two chapters from our favorite book, Return of the Living Dead, the novelization by John Russo. Last week's uh, episode was really long. Uh, this week's might be equally as long because we have two chapters to read. It's the same sort of situation where one chapter is short and the other one is long, but we will just dive in and just tackle it. Um, where we, where do we last leave off? They, uh, our, right. They, the, uh, suicide bites it, or I should say the tar man bites it in, into suicide's head. Suicide gets eaten. Um, Tina gets rescued. They make the decision to burn up the body and Frank and Freddie aren't feeling very well. So there is, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. Rigor, rigor mortis might be happening. They, they call some ambulances. I'm about to sneeze in one second and <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I hate it when that happens, but it does. I am only human. Um, chapter 12, after the gang ran up the basement stairs, chased by the chemical mummy, Tina was the first one to come back and help meet barricade the door. She acted not out of bravery, but out of fear. His yells for help had stopped her impulse to flee by making her hope that if that horrid thing could be kept in the basement, she would be safe from it at last. Unfortunately, the basement door could not be locked without a key. Meat was struggling, pushing with all of his might to stop the monster from coming through. 
but the knob was twisting and jerking and the door was coming away from the jab, clutched by fingers of blackened, shriveled flesh. Tina spied a big fire axe leaning uh, uh, in the corner and chopped at the fingers, hacking and slashing till several of them fell off, writhing and squirming on the floor. Squirming on the floor. That's that's italicized. Uh, That's not in the movie, though. Uh, the the, ch- the chopping of the fingers and I love how the, the tar man goes from barely being held together by goo to suddenly now being very strong. I mean, well, the fact that he's even biting into suicide's head, but listen, as a young boy, I was still terrified. It didn't matter. It didn't matter whether it was possible or not. It was. She chopped and fought Tina's shook up brain made the connection. Freddie was dealing with squirmy things too back at the funeral parlor. Ah, So she put two and two together. Losing its fingers did not stop the monster from trying to come through. It kept pushing, and it was all Meat and Tina could do to shove the door shut again. Help us, you chicken shit bastards, Meat yelled. Scuzz, Chuck, Casey, and Legs finally started contributing to the fight for survival. They shoved a heavy packing crate in front of the door, and Meat and Tina helped slide it firmly into place. In replacing their own bodies with the crate, the door came open a few inches. And once again, Tina had to chop at the monster with the fire axe till it retreated enough to bang the door shut and wedge the packing crate solidly against it. I do like the heightened tension that we get from, and we don't really get that in the movie. This is a nice little uh, flourish that, that, I don't know if that's in the script, but it's a nice little flourish. Nails, meat yelled. Casey, legs, fine nails. Uh, while Scuzz, Chuck, Meat, and Tina use their combined weight and strength against the door and the crate. I mean, that's a little ridiculous. That, that part, That's a little ridiculous. Legs and Casey went scurrying through the warehouse, down the aisles and corridors of the supply-laden shelves. They found a hammer and spikes beside a packing crate. Spikes. Uh, beside a packing crate in which a human skeleton was lying, packed in Excelsior. While the rest of the gang pushed against the basement door and the packing crate barricade, Meat drove spikes right through the boards of the crate and into the wall so the door could not be opened again, even though the mummy kept pounding on it and croaking, brains, brains. After a while, the gang felt the gang all felt safe enough to stop shoving so hard and then to move to the uh, move back from the barricade. They were all out of breath, frightened, and disheveled. Oh, God, oh, God, what was that hideous, horrible thing Legs babbled on? What are we going to do? What the fuck are we going to do, said Meat. Suicide is down there, Chuck moaned. He's gone, man, said Scuzz. It ate his head. He thought for a moment and scowled angrily. Hey, man, my box, man, it's down there, too. That goddamn monster got my box, the, the ghetto blaster. Maybe it digs music, said Neat. Shit, somebody better come and kill that thing so I can get my music box back, Scuzz whined. Neat said, I don't hear nothing down there. My box was turned off, man, said Scuzz. I turned it off back in the car. I'm not talking about your fucking box, Neat snapped. I mean, I don't hear the monster anymore, you dumb shit. Maybe it went back down the stairs, said Tina. Maybe there's another way up here, Casey said, panic-stricken. Let's get out of here, said Chuck. He turned to Tina. Where's Freddy? Still at the funeral parlor? I saw you rapping. I saw you rapping with him over there. Tina nodded slowly. She didn't say what was on her mind, but she was terribly worried for Freddie, scared that he was dealing with something similar to the Terry, the Tari, the Tari mummy that had devoured suicide. Meat said, all right, listen, we'll go over there to that funeral home and find Freddie, and then we'll call somebody from there. I don't want to call no cops, said Scuzz. The cops are just going to blame us for everything and kick our asses. Chuck said, hey, get fucked, Scuzz, with your cop paranoia. We're in deep shit here. Tina said, let's go, let's go. Suddenly, this is it's so funny. This is so Scooby-Doo-ish. And it's also like, I, the one thing I do like in the movie, I like that they, you know, uh, they overreact and just nail the door shut. There's no struggle. We don't need the struggle with, with the Tar Man because the Tar Man's not strong. That's stupid. Suddenly she had to, <laughs> but people coming out of the ground is not stupid. Suddenly... She had to get to where Freddy was to make sure he was okay. She touched the top of her head. It was bare. At some point during the struggle, she had lost Freddy's red baseball cap 
and that loss seemed like a bad omen. It was probably down in the basement with the monster, along with Scuzz's ghetto blaster and Suicide's dead body. Back out into that hideous rain again, Legs complained, and my skin is already stinging all over. Can it? Can it? Let's move, said Meat. But just as the gang burst out of the front door of the warehouse, the entire sky erupted in the forked tongues of angry lightning. And with a loud crack, a telephone pole was struck and crashed down, ripping power lines and dragging them into the rain-drenched street. Holy fuck, Meat yelled. He and the rest of the gang froze, awed by a tremendous electric electrical display caused by live cables whipping and sparking, turning puddles into stinking clouds of yellow vapor. The street was impassable. See, that's a, that's a great touch. Why wasn't that in the in the in the movie? The telephone pole had fallen. Well, it's cost too much money. The telephone pole had fallen diagonally across it, smashing down some heavy tree branches in its path, adding and adding them to the mess of electrified debris. How the hell are we going to get to the funeral parlor now? Scuzz cried. Cut through the cemetery, Meat shouted. He led the way. I mean, in the movie, you don't even, I, I get it. You know, in the movie, you don't need it. it. They just run out. They're scared. They run back into the cemetery, and that's what happens. And they're not even aware of the funeral parlor at that point. Uh, cut through the cemetery, Meat shouted. He led the way, skirting the damage caused by the lightning bolt running past suicides convertible and under the stone archway. The rain kept coming down in sheets. The wind blew in gusts. The wind blew it in gusts. Lightning flashed and exploded. When meat glimpsed what was lit up by the lightning, he stopped in his tracks and everybody else stopped with him. The graveyard was running with mud, slippery, slimy, horrible mud. And it was if the mud had been bulldozed, overturned. Gravestones and monuments were tilted and knocked over. Instead of an even surface of drenched grass, the cemetery resembled a field that had been madly plowed and excavated by a maniac and then diluged with water. Meat and the gang huddled under the overhanging eaves of large stone mausoleum whose roof and walls had been split and cracked open. They were stranded by the lake of mud. Holy shit, Meats said. We're going to have to swim to get through there. I, I like, man, I really like this addition of detail that we don't get much of in the movie. Like, that's so great. Suddenly, out of the darkness and the rain came a horrible moaning sound. This is not something I want to be reading alone in the basement at 10 o'clock at night with everybody else asleep in my house. This is terrifying to me. It was like the sound of a mass hunger, <gasps> a chorus of ravenous moans. Meat and the gang wheeled around, facing the direction they had come from. Lightning lit up the cemetery, and 10 feet in front of them, the gang saw a pair of rotted hands clawing their way out of the liquid mud. That sight was horrible enough, but what was beyond the hands was even more horrible. A group of rotted corpses, about a dozen of them, were shuffling across the graveyard, wading into the slime, groaning hungrily, brains brains some of them rasp rasped like the mummy in the warehouse basement the rotting hands continued to claw till the corpse's head popped up out of the mud filling its lungs with air the half submerged corpse let out a terrible howl of agony we got to make a break for it meat said in a tight fear ridden voice run split up whatever it takes we got to save our asses even as they stood there with little hope of surviving the onslaught of the hungry corpses. Their situation was getting worse. Other groups of ghouls were approaching them from other parts of the cemetery, drawn by their lust for living flesh. I'm cutting out, man, Scuzz yelled. He took off running, oblivious to the ooze and the water that he had to splash through, and abandoning his girlfriend, Legs, who tried desperately to catch up with him. She slipped and fell sideways, and the corpse, halfway out of its grave, made a lunge at her, grabbing her by the ankle. 
She screamed and squirmed, slipping and sliding, unable to gain any traction as the moaning corpse pulled her down into the slime. Because of the darkness and the blinding rain, none of her friends saw what happened to her. They were all fleeing for their lives, trying to avoid the deepest, sludgiest mud that would suck them down like quicksand. In their effort to escape, they had two advantages that they didn't know about. One was that the corpses moved slowly, not having full efficient use of their limbs because of their dead, rotted muscles and ligaments. The second advantage was that the army of ghouls was partially diverted by legs. The prey who had already been caught, they advanced upon her as she struggled and screamed while the rest of the gang plunged headlong through the swampy, uprooted graveyard. The half-submerged corpse clung to her legs while the others shuffled and crawled towards her, surrounding her, dozens of hands reaching for her in the driving rain, rotting, melting arms, grabbing her, pushing her head down deep into the sea of mud, drowning her screams. Absolutely terrifying. This is terrifying. And... um. Yeah, man, I mean, it's more realistic that they don't run, but it's so terrifying in the movie. To see them move fast, fast-moving corpses, absolutely terrifying. But still, this is good. This is where, again, Russo shines. He, It's so funny. He goes from, from being, like, so goofy and fumbling over, you know, tripping over his feet with some of this dialogue and these words and these ideas, and then there are other times where he's just... He, he's just cooking. He's cooking and he he can't be stopped. And these these are some of those moments, I would say. Uh, so well done, Russo. 13. The paramet oh, the 13. I think I remember this chapter and it's I remember why it's so long. Chapter 13, the paramedics who were dispatched to the Colton Burners funeral home had been playing cards at the station, hoping to get through the rest of the evening without making any more runs, except the kind that counted in scoring for gin rummy. But they knew since this was the start of an exceptionally long 4th of July weekend, it'd be a miracle if nobody else on their beat got maimed, lacerated, bludgeoned, shot, or hit by a heart attack. Then they had received the call about two guys being poisoned and had set out on their ninth run of the day, which at least was not run of the mill. Don Burchock and Stan Feldstein, the two paramedic, we're about to get so much backstory about the two paramedic guys that are on screen for two seconds of the movie. Uh, the two paramedics sped to the scene of the poisoning call in their long white ambulance, lights flashing and siren wailing, through a heavy downpour, both men were in their early 30s, both Vietnam veterans, having received their medical emergency training in the U.S. Army. Both had men die in their arms, horribly wounded. After trying to patch together soldiers who were ripped to shreds by landmines, grenades, and mortars, they might be expected to have a certain blasé attitude about the lesser forms of civilian tragedy. Great. That's a great sentence. Both affected such an attitude, but never, re but neither really felt it, and neither would admit to, would admit, would admit it to one another. So they each thought they were the only one with a secret soft spot. Don Burchock, driving the ambulance on this run, was an abuser of alcohol and amphetamines. His pretty wife had left him because of it, taking custody of their two children. He wasn't entirely sure why he was hung up on booze and pills. The drugs never completely staved off his battlefield nightmares and his feeling of being a failure as a civilian. Uh, before going to the NAM, he had studied acting and had illusions of becoming a movie star. Sometimes when he didn't get stoned for a while, he was still almost handsome, especially if he wore a hat so his hair, hair loss didn't show. Um... But when he was on a binge, he looked like a fading has-been, sallow and sunken and washed out, 20 years older than his real age. Sometimes he thought that it was his job. His job was destroying him. It turned out to be harder for him to look at dead babies and pretty women all cut up in domestic situations uh, or domestic settings that were supposed to be that, that were supposed to be peaceful than to deal with the ugly casualties of war that at least were to be expected. 
Stan Feldstein, Birchock's partner, was disturbed by the exact, exactly the same paradox. But whereas Birchock had confided his feelings to nobody, Feldstein had confessed to his fiance. She had understood and consoled him and encouraged him in his ambition to go back to college and stop driving an ambulance as soon as possible. Feldstein was studying for a degree in education. When he finished his student teaching next January, he was going to get married and start working as a biology teacher in the Louisville school system. Makes sense. As Birchock wheeled the ambulance around the corner into the block where Colton Brunner's funeral home was, he saw the power lines down, down up the street and the sparks flashing in the heavy rain. The street lamps and the house lights up there were out, but the Colton Brunner's end of the block still had electrical service. The funeral home had lights on inside and outside as the ambulance pulled into the lot. Not bothering to pull ponchos or... Uh, not bothering to pull ponchos on over their white uniforms, Birchock and Feldstein jumped out of their vehicle, leaving the lights flashing. They ran to the side door and rang the night bell. A guy in a yellow windbreaker and a floppy golfer's hat let them in, and they brushed the rain off themselves, noticing how the rain in this part of town seemed to sting their faces and arms. You're the paramedics, Bert Wilson asked pushing his heavy black frame glasses up his nose. He peered at the red crosses on the white boxes they were carrying. We ain't Santa and his reindeer, said Birchock, glancing around. Are you the fellow who called us? And then we get dialogue like that. No, I'm Bert Wilson. Ernie Coltonbrenner placed the emergency call. He owns the place. He's busy with a couple of his uh, clients. Who took the poison, Birchock asked. Those guys over there, said Bert, pointing at Freddie and Frank who were sitting side by side in the folding chairs against the wall parallel to the embalming tables, which were now empty of their former cargo. Birchok and Feldstein came over and looked at the two poisoned men who were wrapped in blankets, shivering. The blankets of pale blue satin looked suspiciously like the kind used in coffins, and Birchok and Feldstein guessed that they had been provided by the funeral director and were probably all that they had on hand. Frank and Freddie had gray, greasy complexions. That is a really, really yucky descriptor. Gray, greasy complexions. Purple circles under their yellow bloodshot eyes. What did you guys take? Feldstein asked. Frank and Freddie moved their mouths a little, but neither answered right away. It was like they were too weak to think or talk. Bert Wilson answered for them. It was some kind of industrial chemical, something in the drum. What drum? Where? Barked Birchok. Uh, we're not sure, Bert stammered. Can you find out, Feldstein asked? Your friends' lives may depend on it. How do you expect us to help them if we don't even know what they took? Birchok complained. Uh, I can make some phone calls, Bert hedged, but nothing before morning. Shrugging resignedly, Feldstein uh, knelt and opened the lid of his medical emergency kit. Let's take some vital signs, he suggested to Birchok. Try to get some idea of what we might be dealing with here. The paramedics put digital readout thermometers in Frank and Freddie's mouths. Birchok wrapped a blood pressure cuff around Frank's arm while Feldstein took Freddie's pulse. The medics were immediately puzzled by the readings they were getting. They fumbled with the various instruments, shaking them, trying them, trying them again. Birchok swore, damn, can I borrow your stethoscope, Stan? What's wrong, said Feldstein. Taxpayers pay good money to outfit you guys, and you guys come here with faulty equipment, Bert Wilson muttered. Birchok shot Bert a mean look, but ignored him and spoke to Feldstein. I can't hear anything, he said, moving the stethoscope all around Freddy's chest. Are you sure it's the stethoscope? asked Feldstein. What do you mean? I can't hear a pulse through this one either. I can't hear a pulse through this one either. What the hell is going on here? said Birchok. Are we going crazy? Let's switch patients. Freddy. Frank and Freddie stayed slumped in a sort of stupor, their skin grayer and their eyes yellower and more bloodshot than before. What do you mean? What's wrong? Freddie said in a weak, hoarse whisper. Dear God, help me get better, Freddy, cr Frank croaked. He tried making a sign of the cross but couldn't lift his arm. Birchok and Feldstein kept moving around, trying different things with their equipment. No blood pressure, said Feldstein. No pulse, said Birchok. 
Freddie croaked. What do you mean no blood pressure, no pulse? Yeah, Frank rasped. Shh, Feldstein cautioned. He was trying to hear anything, even something weak, through his stethoscope. He and Birchok bent over their instruments in silent concentration. Frank and Freddie stared at the medics with growing horror. Suddenly, one of the thermometers, uh, you know, you, you shouldn't use suddenly when you're writing. You never use the word suddenly. This was told to me. You don't use the word suddenly. Suddenly, one of the thermometers, suddenly is a visual cinematic verb. You show that cinematically. You never describe suddenly. Suddenly, one of the thermometers beeped and then the other. The paramedics took them out of their patients' mouths and held them up to look at them. Birchok and Feldstein turned and saw disbelieving expressions on each other's faces. Are you sure you guys know what you're doing? Bert Wilson said indignantly. Shut up, Birch Birchok snapped at him. Then to Feldstein, he said, what reading do you have? 70, said Feldstein, shaking his head in befuddlement. 70 what, Freddy croaked. The confusion was making him scared, and he was beginning to suspect both paramedics of incompetence. 70 degrees, said Feldstein. What's that, Freddy P Frank? What's that, Frank piped up weakly. What's that, Frank piped up weakly. Room temperature, Feldstein explained. Yeah, that's all I'm getting. 70, said Birchok. It can't be the equipment. It wouldn't all go bad at once. Something really goofy is happening, happening here, said Feldstein. You don't suppose some kind of new disease, like AIDS, maybe? Wow. This is written in 1983 or 84, and they're actually, I mean, it's kind of crazy. Like, I mean, that's what people back in the day, when there wasn't enough information, like, you would look at it. Oh, that is so brutal, man. So brutal. Whew. AIDS. Like, I mean, that's that's real. And there was no cure for it either. I don't know. I don't know why I'm talking about this. What? What are you guys saying? Freddie said in a weak, hoarse whisper. But the paramedics ignored him. They backed off a few paces and discussed the situation in hushed tones. Meanwhile, Ernie Coltenbrenner was admiring the fine job he had done on Morton and Helen Dowden, who were laid out in matching bronze caskets side by side in one of the large slumber parlors on the main floor of the funeral home. Morton was in a black tuxedo and Helen was wearing a lovely blue gown with matching blue evening gloves their silver white heads of hair were beautifully co coiffed coiffed and combed their faces were tan and healthy looking turned slightly to face the visitors expected on thursday ernie had cosmetized cosmetized hmm. ernie had cosmetized i don't know i can't pronounce that cause like you're saying cosmetic cosmetic tized Cosmetized, cosmetized. Ernie had cosmetized the cuts on Morton's face using Dermawax and blended it in with Sutan flush dusting powder applied with a fine bristled brush. He had put a touch of rouge on the cheeks to contribute to the appearance of good health. He had glued down the eyelids because they had kept peeping open apparently not adequate, adequately secured by the rigid plastic eye caps inserted underneath. He was, <clears throat> he was particularly proud of the job he had done on Helen's nose. It looked exactly like the original, blended perfectly in her own flesh with the same satin sutan dusting powder that Ernie had used on her husband. He also used rouge, and ruby lip gloss to emphasize her serene, mature beauty. Since her, since her gown was rather low cut, he had more work to do, making the flesh of her arms, shoulders, and neck the same shade as her face. Wishing to see the Dowdens exactly as they would appear to their visitors on Thursday, he turned on the rose-colored spotlights above the caskets. Then he had noticed a fleck of lint on Helen's right eyelash, just as he picked it off, he, he heard a loud hammering on the front doors, so loud that he was afraid the glass would chowder. Drawing his Luger from under his belt, he headed for the foyer. The lobby was dark as Ernie came through it. His gun raised. The loud hammering on the glass kept up. He saw silhouetted figures banging and screaming. He ducked behind an armchair. 
training his gun on the figures on the other side of the glass. With his free hand, he reached over and turned on the outside porch light. He saw some weird, water-soaked creatures, Tina, Meat, and Scuzz. They terrified him, especially the one in all green with green mohawk hair. The black one wasn't any beauty either with his long dreadlocks flying up as he jumped up and down, flying as he jumped up and down. The girl looked like a chip. The girl looked like a chippy in her red plastic miniskirt with her long black hair plastered to her face in disheveled strands. She yelled, please help us, mister. We're being chased. Oh, God, please stop banging on the glass or I'll shoot. Ernie yelled, please. I'm Freddie's girlfriend. The girl cried. Is he still here? What's your name? Ernie challenged, pointing the Luger. The trio on the porch had stopped pounding and yelling, but they kept glancing around as if they expected to be pounced on from behind. Tina, my name is Tina, said the girl. Let us in. It checked. Ernie remembered Freddie mentioning the girls named Tina, the girl named Tina, who had come to him earlier, just as he and Frank had finished unloading the van. Cautiously, he emerged from behind the chair and crept towards the front door, keeping his Luger at the ready. He said, all right, come in. But if you make one funny move, you're all dead. Warley, with their hands up, Meat and Tina and Scuzz edged into the lobby. Meat said, don't shoot us, man. We, we ain't the danger. It's what's after us. Are you crazy? Ernie said. Are you on drugs? I like the line. Are you on PCP? Doesn't he say that in the movie? You got to lock the doors, Scuzz blurted. You got to lock all the doors, Scuzz blurted. And the windows and call the cops. They're out there. What? Said Ernie. Who? Who's out there? Tina grabbed Ernie by the arm, too scared to care about his gun. Do you hear that? She asked him with a wild look in her eyes. Hear what? Scoffed Ernie. I don't hear a darn thing but rain and thunder. Shut up and listen, man, said Scuzz. They all quieted down. The rain was loud, but behind it could be heard a faint but chilling screeching and moaning sound, a babble of eerie and anguished voices. What is that? cried Ernie, starting to become a believer at last. It's monsters screaming, said Meat. Hungry monsters. What? What monsters, you say? Ernie tried to think if there might be some connection between what he seemed to be hearing out, out there and the creepy, crawly cadaver parts he had recently cremated. They all came up out of the ground, Tina said in a dot, dot, dot. Hushed, incredulous tone. They all came up out of the ground. And, they're, and they came after us, maybe a hundred of them. Out of the ground, said Ernie. They came after us in the cemetery, said Tina. We had to run from them. They must have killed legs because she didn't make it back to the warehouse with the rest of us. Then me and Scuzz and Meat, we decided to try and still make it to get to Freddy. We had to circle here through the alleys, the side streets. Jesus, said Ernie. If what he was hearing was true, then that must be happening all over. Hundreds of corpses might be coming to life. Where's Freddy? Tina pleaded. Where's Freddy? Tina pleaded. Take me to him. Is he okay? When Don Burchock and Stan Feldstein finished huddling and discussing the two strange cases that confronted them, they performed a couple more tests to see if they could obtain any response that was near normal. Burchock tapped Freddy's knee with a rubber hammer. No reflex. He tapped Frank's knee and got no reflex, no reflex there either. Meantime, Feldstein shined a tiny light into Freddy's pupils. He shook his head in consternation. Burchock shined a light into Frank's eyes. He shook his head too. Both paramedics shut their lights off. They shrugged at each other and then they faced their patients. Burchock said, look. You have no pulse, your blood pressure is zero over zero, and you have no pupillary, pupillary response, no reflexes, and your temperature is 70 degrees. In a horrified croak, Freddie said, what does that all mean? Frank hissed, are we going to be okay? My wife, she's holding supper for me. I, well, said Burchock, if we're going by the responses we're getting, my partner and I would have to conclude that, technically speaking, you're not alive, except you're conscious. So we don't know what that means, except obviously we have to get you to the hospital. You saying we're dead? Freddie croaked. 
wait a minute, said Feldstein. Let's not get let's not get carried away here. We haven't made any diagnosis. We're, we've never seen any case like yours. Obviously, I didn't mean you were dead, said Burchock. Dead people don't move around and talk. It would probably help immensely if we knew what kind of poison you think you took. Be that as it may, we're going to get a couple of stretchers and radio into the hospital. Hang in there. We'll be back in a jiffy. The two medics trotted uh, trotted to the door and threw it open, ignoring the wind and the rain that whipped into their faces. They trotted out. Frank and Freddie stared at each other when they saw each other's gray skin and yellowish bloodshot eyes. It increased their feeling of panic. Bert Wilson came over and looked at them, keeping a safe distance. The best thing to do is to get you guys to the hospital, he said, wanting to be rid of them. They'll run tests, finds out what's in your bloodstream. Listen, I don't think you guys really have to tell them it happened over at the warehouse. Where it happened is not germane. Know what I mean? Just then, Bert heard Ernie Coltenburner call, call to him from somewhere up uh, in the upstairs of the funeral home. Uh, Bert, can you come here for a minute? Uh, where are you, Ernie? Bert yelled back. Up in the lobby. Come here alone, will you please? <clears throat> you guys just stay here and take it easy, Bert said to Frank and Freddie. Wait for the stretchers. You'll see. You're going to come out of this just fine. He pivoted and skipped up the steps to the lobby where he was start startled to see Ernie holding his Luger on three hideous looking punks, one of whom turned out to be Freddie's girlfriend, Tina. But she looked so scared and muddy and half drowned that Bert almost didn't recognize her. I didn't want to barge in with this ugly looking crew if the paramedics are still around, said Ernie. This one here claims to be Freddie's girlfriend. Is she? Yeah, said Bert. What's going on here? What's going on here? Ernie said, Bert, we have a problem. What do you mean? Meat started ranting and raving. Mister, the graveyard out there is full of people and they're coming up out of the ground. They were chasing us. They killed one of us. They eat human brains. They... Suicide got it, said Scuzz. They took his skull off, bit right through the top like it was an eggshell. Well, what? Bert stammered. Out of the ground, said Tina. They're horrible, and, they're, and they scream, and somebody's got to do something. Mister, they're sure as hell out there, said Meat, and there's one of them out over there in the warehouse. They've been eating people. In the warehouse, Bert said flabbergasted, wondering if his heartaches were ever going to end. That medical supply house, said Tina. You need a medical supply. You're the boss of it, aren't you? Where my boyfriend Freddie works. Is he safe? Bert leaned against the back of a wall, feeling weak. Putting his hands over his mouth, he mumbled, Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I think things are out of hand, Bert, said Ernie. Mister, there's a hundred of those things out there, said Meat. Freddie, is he safe? asked Tina. Will somebody take me to him now? Don Burchock and Stan Feldstein were dashing through the rain to their ambulance when they heard the choruses of moans and saw a group of shadowy figures coming towards them out of the darkness into the fuzzy, misted lights of the parking lot. They stopped and stared, getting drenched by the yellowish rain, trying to see if there were other hurt people who needed their help. When the shuffling figures came closer and their features became discernible, Burchock cried out, Christ, Stan, those people look worse than the two guys we just examined. Maybe it's an epidemic, said Feldstein, some kind of weird disease unleashed here. The people risen from the graveyard came closer, moaning and screaming, and in a flash of lightning, Burchock and Feldstein saw rotting clothes and dead, decaying flesh. They're rotting, cried Burchock. Leprosy. We're dealing with an epidemic of leprosy, Stan. That's a great line. That's a great explanation for what they would be seeing. Must be an especially violent, uh, must be an especially vir virulent strain of it, said Feldstein, his mouth gaping open. You and I might already be infected, Don. Actually, if they're standing in the soaking yellow rain, I think even if they weren't killed or whatever, they would probably, what happened to Frank and Freddie would happen to them as well. The moment you're in the rain, you're exposed. They they were all doomed, probably at slow a slower rate of degradation than say what the, what Frank and Freddie went through breathed the gas directly. Um, you and I might already be infected, Don. Let's get out of here, Burchock cried. This is too big for us to handle on our own. But we promised to take those two guys to the hospital, said Feldstein. We can't just run out on them. They're depending on us. But there's too many more of them now. Burchock ran for the ambulance, but Feldstein didn't move. He was torn between a sense of duty and his urge to cut and run. 
The decayed people were coming closer and there were more of them approaching from all directions, hemming into the two paramedics surrounding them and their ambulance. Oh my God, that is, that's terrifying. His hand on the door handle, Birchok yelled, come on, Stan, there's no time to be a fucking hero. You can't, <clears throat> you can't play Florence Nightingale to all these lepers. <laughs> brains, brains. The surrounding mob began to chanting. The, the surrounding mob began chanting. That's scary as fuck. They're surrounded and they start chanting brains. Birchok yanked on the door handle only to realize it was locked. He had pushed the button down out of habit before slamming the door when he parked. He dug into his pocket for the keys and got them out. And then <clears throat> from behind, one of the screaming, chanting sick people leapt up upon him and get, uh, getting him into a chokehold. Let me take that again. From behind, one of the screaming, chanting sick people leapt upon him, getting him into a chokehold. What kind of lepers were these, Feldstein thought, seeing his partner being attacked. He ran over to help out, just as Birchok used some of his army judo training to flip his fiendish attacker over his head. Could you imagine if we got some like some like kung fu judo action from these two guys in the actual movie? That'd be awesome. Um, but three more ghouls were immediately upon him, wrestling him to the pavement in the driving rain, sinking, sinking their teeth into his face and neck. That is something we're going to find out as we keep reading. These, these ghouls, they don't just eat brains. They eat anything. And it's somehow even more terrifying in that kind of way. I mean, really, truly terrifying. Birchok screamed, Stan, help me, help me. He kept punching and kicking as more of the attackers swarmed upon him. Ugh, you filthy, stinking bastards, <laughs> he grunted, punctuating each word with a punch or a kick. When Feldstein joined the fight, more of the ghouls moved in on him. They ripped and clawed at him, wailing, brains, 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 um, hissing their foul putrid breath into his face upon close he could see that some of them were skeletal lumbering hulks mere frameworks of bone barely held together by rotted sinew and blackened strands of skin others were trailing oozing strings of intestine as they shuffled around him clawing and reaching for his throat one of the ghouls chewing on Birchok's throat bit into his jugular vein a uh, bit his jugular vein in two and his bright red blood sprayed out in huge pumping spurts. At the same time, two ghouls seized heavily seized heavy landscaping bricks and bashed in Birchok's skull. Okay. That is a detail that we should have gotten in the movie. I mean, absolutely terrifying. It would have just made so much sense to see these cognitive smart zombies using bricks to, cave in skulls i mean it just would have been that much more terrifying so at the same time two ghouls seized heavy landscaping bricks and bashed in Birchok's skull while he was still thrashing in his death throes his attackers jostled and slashed at each other in a frenzy to start devouring his brain others drank his blood or chewed various parts of his body in an effort to quell their basic dominant hunger for gray matter Oh my God, Don, Feldstein cried, jolted by the shock of seeing his partner, that his partner was done for. Up till then, unable to comprehend the true nature of the threat, his sense of desperation had been muted, his aggressiveness subdued by an overwhelming misma, miasma. Oh, I've never read that word. Miasma? Miasma. Well, I have since I read this before. Miasma of disbelief. I really want to look it up, but I don't want to stop my flow here. Um. <clears throat> Why were these lepers or whatever they were attacking people? Why were these lepers or whatever they were attacking people who were well? Belatedly, when he was just about to be tackled and swarmed under, Stan Feldstein decided that the best defense was a good offense. His largest and closest attacker, attacker was a big beer-bellied man in a brown suit, totally caked with mud, but not as rotten and decayed as most of his cronies. Just as the big man reached towards him with a leering, ravenous smile, Feldstein unleashed a terrific karate kick, knocking the lumbering Hulk to the pavement. 
Having momentarily created a gap in the wailing, chanting mob of fiendish, decaying faces, Feldstein plunged through and dived when he spot the ambulance keys glittering where Burchock had dropped them. He scooped up the keys and scrambled away from the ghouls, who nearly grabbed him. Since the driver's side of the ambulance was blocked by ghouls devouring Burchock's body, Feldstein jinked and darted. <laughs> That's an interesting word, jinked. Jinked and darted for the passenger side, punching, judo and judo chopping, and karate kicking, wailing, chanting, rot-faced attackers out of his way. When it looked like curtains for him, he dived and rolled over the hood, thudding to the pavement and bounced up in a fighting stance. Two ghouls were clawing at him, ripping open his soaking wet uniform. When he managed to get the key into the slot, Dancing through his mind in a mad, disjointed blur were visions of making it into the ambulance, slamming the door, locking it, starting the engine, and gunning the vehicle right through the onslaught and peeling across the lot safely. And police, oh, lot, take that again. This is a long sentence. Dancing through his mind in a mad disjointed blur were visions of making it into the ambulance, slamming the door, locking it, starting the engine and gunning the vehicle right through the onslaught, peeling across the lot towards the safety and police help towards safety and police help and a chance of earning his teaching certificate and marrying the woman he loved. He flung the door open, smacking it into one of the attackers. Then a brick cracked into the side of his head and losing consciousness in a dimming nightmare of wind and rain and ghastly hungry faces. He sagged knees buckling, hitting the concrete mercifully. He was out cold when he was swarmed under. He never felt the sharp teeth biting his flesh, the dirty dead hands ripping out his internal organs, the heavy crunching blows opening his skull for the brain eaters. Whew. My, oh my. What a good chapter that was. Started off a little, little slow with all that backstory. But you know what? I take back what I said. We needed it because it made their deaths so much more impactful, I think, for, for the sake of the story. Um, so we will return next week once again with another two chapters. We're almost through, and I'm, I'm starting to think, what are we going to do when we're done? Well, I have another another story that we can read through that I'm interested in reading. I've got two things actually lined up, um, but we'll see. We'll we'll see what's up. I like this Monday reading uh, audiobook reading. It's fun, a lot of fun. So we'll see you next time. Thanks again. Thank you for uh, supporting on Patreon. Your Patreons are seeing this first, um, as well as the YouTube uh, members themselves. And uh, for everybody else, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Peace and hair grease. Good evening and welcome to another episode of Master From His Peace Theater. From His Peace Theater. That sounds better, right? That 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 rolls off the tongue a lot better. We are on chapter 14 of the Return of the Living Dead novelization by John Russo based on a screenplay by Dan O'Bannon. I can't believe we're almost at the end of the book. Can you believe it? If we had read a chapter a week we could have really stretched this thing out but i gotta tell you um i am looking forward to the completion of this book perhaps we will do more in the future we'll take suggestions but we're talking like we're at the end we're not quite at the end yet so let's let us let us continue on um when we last left off our paramedics who who got vietnam vet backstories they were they were trying to get to the the ambulance so that they could get out of there and you know get better better help for Freddie. I think they were going to take Freddie and Frank to the ER because Freddie and Frank they breathed the two four five trioxin gas and were clinically dead even though they were conscious conscious. And we got um a, just a really brutal, scary, terrifying description of how these zombies operate, how it's different from the ones in the movie and also different from the Romero zombies. These zombies, not they, they want your brains, but they'll eat anything. They'll, they just want to gnaw on something because they're hungry. So they'll gnaw on your flesh and drink your blood. Even if, even if they're not getting what they need from your brains 
and they use they use bricks to crack open your skull and it's it's gnarly and unpleasant to say the least um chapter 14 freddy freddy tina cried joy joyously she ran to him as soon as she entered the embalming room with ernie meat and scuzz when she got a look at him up close the joy melted from her face oh my god freddy what did they do to you uh, i'm sick tina he whimpered really terribly sick me too rasp, rasped frank Tina's eyes darted anxiously back and forth from her boyfriend to her boyfriend's boss. But what do you have, Freddie? She blurted. I've never seen anyone look so awful. You look like, like, she bit her lip, not daring to say what he looked like. Like sunshine, said Freddie, completing her thought in a mournful, self-pitying whisper. So Russo ties the, I forgot about that. Russo uh, ties us back to sunshine. Freddie's trying to get away from being like Sunshine, and he winds up, he winds up ironically being like Sunshine as a result. Um, embalming tables. Embalming tables? This place is something else, cried Scuzz, looking around. One thing, if you're gonna croak, you pick the right place, Freddie. They can work on you right here. Talk about <laughs> gallows humor. Meat came up behind Tina and squinted at Freddie and Frank. Man, you look like death warmed over, he said. He drawled. He drawled. Man, you look like death warmed over. Like, why are you wearing such a little earring, man? And why you got such a square haircut? Who cares about his hair at a time like this? Who cares about his hair at a time like this? Tina snapped. The ambulance came, Freddie rasped. They're going to take us to the hospital and find out what's wrong with us. Where the hell are the paramedics, Ernie Coltenburner said to Bert Wilson. Bert shrugged and took his hat off and nervously ran his fingers through his red hair. I saw they were going to fetch a couple of stretchers. How long ago, asked Ernie. Bert glanced at his watch. I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. Christ, what are they doing? Making the goddamn stretchers, Ernie cried. Gr uh, grimly pursing his lips, grimly pursing his lips. He stared at the embalming room door, and his bony face took on a tense, worried expression. They must have split. They ain't coming back, sneered Meat, ever distasteful of the establishment. Chicken shit bastards, Scuzz cursed. Frank and Freddy both groaned des despairingly. Oh, honey, everything's going to be okay, Tina crooned, putting her arm around her boyfriend. Those medics wouldn't just cut out on us. Those medics wouldn't just cut out on us, said Ernie. They're trained to not panic in emergencies. They might be in some kind of trouble out there. I'm going to go have a look. Scuzz and Meat exchanged silent, silent looks that said, man, anybody who bops, <laughs> anybody who bops on out there on his own is a real queeb. Wow, that's real hit, Mr. Russo. Mr. Russo. Ernie drew his luger from under his belt and flipped the safety catch. Then he threw the door open and raising his arm to shield his eyes against the blinding rain, he stepped out, closing the door behind him. He thought, <clears throat> he thought that it ought to be easier to see even on such a dark, misty and rainy night because the parking lot, because the parking lot lights were on. Then he realized that most of them weren't shining and pointed his gun in front of him. He edged over to one of the lampposts. Something crunched under his feet. Glass. The light had been smashed. No doubt that is what had happened to the others. Ernie felt the sick bile of fear rising in his throat. That's actually terrifying. They're like, we're going to smash the lights so you can't see us so we can uh, uh, attack you. Up till now, the sounds that he had been aware of were mostly that of rain and thunder, but a rising chorus of slurping, moaning and munching sounds suddenly impinged upon his senses. His eyes darted wildly and he spotted a glow that turned out to be the interior light of the ambulance parked with its door hanging open. Ernie hurried towards the glow, but then he heard the chant brains, 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 and realized the devilish voices were directed towards him. Lightning flashed and he saw a corpse looking right up in his eyes with the blood all over its mouth and chin. It was munching on a human arm that still wore a tatter 
of a white paramedic uniform. The corpse was old and hideous, mostly a skeleton held together by tendons and dried decay skin. Ernie fired his Luger at the corpse. The bullet struck it in the forehead with a loud thwack, causing it to reel backwards, but it didn't fall. Instead, it stared, it started towards Ernie, still carrying its meal of a human arm. Out of the rainy darkness, other corpses advanced, screaming, Brains! 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 Ernie fired at some of them, but the bullets had no effect. Utterly terrified, he bolted and ran for the embalming room door, fumbling in his pocket for the keys. He pounded ferociously on the steel door, even as he tried desperately to insert his key into the slot. The door came open. Bert Wilson, who had unlocked it, was nearly bowled over as Ernie hurl herded, hurtled into him. When he saw what was coming out of the darkness, he needed no urging to slam the door shut. His fingers shaking badly, Ernie managed to throw the deadbolt just in time. The steel door was shuddering with the demented pounding and screaming outside. Brains, 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 brains. Ernie sagged against the wall, drenched and feeble from terror. He weakly lifted his arm and started at his gun, trying to and stared at his gun, trying to comprehend how it could have proven itself so useless when he needed it. Them things, we told you they was out there, Meat said. You squares never want to believe us, said Scuzz. You always think that if we say something strange, it's because we're on dope. Well, we didn't make those things up. Somebody caused them, and I'd like to know who. More of them. Bert Wilson wailed. More of them, Bert Wilson wailed, holding his head desperately. More of them like the one we burned. Oh, God, we're never going to see the end of this. All I want to do is just go back to my nice, peaceful life and have a nice, peaceful Fourth of July barbecue. His voice trailed off in ab abject misery. The pounding and screaming kept up outside for several long seconds. Everybody watched the steel door shuddering as it took blow after blow. Is it going to hold, Meat asked. Put something against it, said Scuzz. My supply cabinet, said Ernie. He and Bert helped Meat and Scuzz shove the heavy piece of furniture across the concrete floor. When they got it jammed tightly against the door, the pounding and screaming seemed to diminish, but they couldn't tell if that was because the ghouls were giving up or because some of the sound was now blocked out. Suddenly, both Freddy and Frank groaned in unison, their voices hoarse and raspy like death rattles, and everybody else in the room whirled and stared at them. Struck by the eerie realization about how much of how much they sounded like the beings tr outside trying to get in. Tina kept her arm around Freddy, though. She was going to stick by him through thick or thin. Scuzz ran his fingers through his mohawk haircut, some of the dye coming off of on his hand. Staring at the greenness, he said, man, this dye isn't supposed to run. It's that freaking rain. My skin still stings, man. So does mine, said Ernie. Mine too, meat drawled, his black eyes. Ugh. His, I mean, so, Russo, man. His, uh, what? Oh, I, I see what he meant by that. Okay, never mind. That's freaking, um, his black eyes flashing angrily as he turned them upon Burt Wilson. I just remembered something, man. You said you burned one of those ghouls. I think you know more than you're telling. You better open up, man. All of us are in this together, and all our lives might depend on our understanding of this of the true situation. Yeah, I think you better tell us what's going on, Scuzz demanded. We didn't have to tell you anything, Bert snapped. Freddie let out a horrible groan. Tell them, he rasped feebly. They have a right to know. Tina spoke up with righteous indignation. What did you do to my boyfriend? What's wrong with him and Frank? On cue, Frank rasped. Tell them, Bert, it's the least you can do. Giving in, Bert let his hands fall weakly to his sides, slapping his thighs. <sighs> it's, a, it, it's a chemical, he chokingly admitted. Some kind of chemical that I guess, uh, I don't know, I guess it can make corpses come back to life. There was a long silence, and then Meat spoke up. Chemical? What chemical? Bert backed away, shaking his head, scared that Scuzz and Meat might punch him out. I, I don't know what the chemical, I, I don't know what chemical. I'm not even sure about its properties. It was developed for the U.S. Army. You don't know shit from Shino. 
<laughs> you don't know shit from Shinola about it, Meat scrawled. But yet you do know it makes corpses come back to life? Yeah, I can see a military use for it, Scuzz jeered. We could just let all our soldiers attack right out in the open, hoping that they'd get killed so they'd be buried behind enemy lines. Then when the coast was clear, they could come back to life and launch a surprise attack from deep within enemy territory. It'd be better than dropping in paratroopers. He snickered at the absurdity and the horrendous plausibility of the scenario. Now that is so interesting. I wonder if, I wonder if John Penny or whoever read that or read that from the script and then, use that in the idea of return of living dead part three because here's russo talking about it several years prior and it's actually a really great idea and you would imagine that that's actually the purpose for trioxin that is the true purpose the marijuana was just the cover-up and the true purpose was this very thing it was it's an agent orange element i mean that's great that is really really great i forgot that was in here and it makes it just makes complete and total sense. You just totally would imagine that the that the government um, that doesn't look at people as people and just looks at them as a commodity would in fact do that. Expose uh, or you know let let soldiers just you know crawl up Hamburger Hill, get mowed down, and then dump the gas on the battlefield and turn the soldiers uh, you know give them the incentive uh, of, of brain capsules or something. I don't know. Great idea, John Russo. I mean, that, if that is John Russo, I, I mean, just excellent. And I'll say one other thing, too, before we continue on. It's reading this chapter right now that I realize how much, um, you know, we thought Daniel Bannon, Daniel Bannon's story is supposed to be a page one rewrite, essentially. But it really does borrow heavily from Night of Living Dead. In this, once you get to this part of the story where you have you know, the punks and the, uh, the squares, uh, trapped together in a, in a situation in a house in, in, a, in, a, in the funeral home. And that is just pure night of living dead. That's the, the core of night of living dead. So it, it's great. It's just freaking great. Um, but you can see it. I, I just realized that you can see at its core. That's what it is. Shut up. Scuzz meat said still eyeing Bert. What I want to know is how the fuck did this chemical get all over the freaking graveyard? I don't know. Bert said, all I can tell you is that we were storing it. You need a medical supply. And these two geniuses, he gestured at Frank and Freddie. They managed to open up a drum and let some of the stuff escape. Tina gasped. Is that why? Is that why Freddie's sick? Sick? She stammered, hugging him more tightly. This is all starting to make a... Oh, sorry. That was Meat. This is all starting to make a weird kind of sense, Meat exclaimed, coming over to Freddie and peering at him very closely. I breathed it, Meat. Freddie whispered with great difficulty. So did Frank. What did you do? Meat wanted to know. What did it do to you? Meat wanted to know. I'm freezing. My muscles are sniffing up. Stiffening up. Oh, Freddie, cried Tina, bursting into tears. His professional curiosity aroused. Ernie Coltenburner blotted rain from his face with a paper towel and knelt in front of Fre Freddie and Frank. Stiffening up how, he asked. Well, first, said Freddie, I got a really, really terrible headache. Or as he says in the movie, I got a fucked headache. Then my stomach, my stomach's cramped up into a knot. And now my arms and my legs are cramping. Let me see, said Ernie. He tried flexing one of Freddy's arms. Oh, God! That hurts! Oh, God! Freddy groaned. Frank rasped. Hey, hey, take it easy on the kid. Do you feel the same way as he does, Ernie probed? Frank nodded weakly. Both he and Freddy were still sitting half doubled up. Both still looked very gray with yellowish bloodshot eyes. Ernie rubbed his chin as he stared at him. What's the matter? Tina asked, alarm, alarmed at Ernie's knowing expression. Ah, I hate to say it, he told her, but it sounds to me like rigor mortis is setting in. Tina's eyes widened as she bit her lip to hold her fear. Ernie said, help me get your boyfriend's shirt off. Tina helped Ernie slip off the yellow t-shirt with the slogan, I got my shit together. Freddie screamed and complained the whole time. I'm trying to be gentle, honey, Tina said. 
Ernie pointed at some big purple bruises on Freddy's back. I thought so, he said. Liver mortis. What's what's that? Tina said, aghast. Those purple bruises, Ernie explained. Gravity makes the blood pool up when it's not circulating. Cripes, Scuzz exploded. You're dead, Freddy, and you're going to turn into them. Everybody except Tina started backing away from Freddy and Frank. No, rasped, ra Freddy rasped weakly. No, God, no. Meantime, the white ambulance was out in the lot with its door open on the passenger side. Several corpses were sitting on the wet concrete, slumped against the vehicle like drunken, satiated men. Other ghouls were restless, unfulfilled. In the saving, in the savage competition for the available human flesh, they had not had enough to eat. They stumbled around aimlessly in the rain and the lightning, rasping and moaning, brains brains i love this this stuff because we apart we there's a couple of times we see the ghouls by themselves like send more paramedics but it's usually for like a laugh it's never just to like see how they are like i almost wish that we just got this in the movie it would be really really great um the fat muddy corpse in the brown suit the one karate kicked earlier by stan feldstein was particularly gluttonous and greedy it sat on the ground holding Stan's partially devoured head and neck in its beer belly of a lap. It munched calmly on the back of Stan's head, getting out the last scraps of brain. The fat, muddy corpse raised its head, wiping its bloody mouth on its mud-caked sleeve and blinked its yellowish pig-like eyes. Blink, blink, yawn. Drawn by the glow of the interior ambulance light, the big fat corpse got slowly to its feet. Oh, this is that scene. And wobbled over to the passenger side and with a grunt crawled in. The, the corpse turned on the radio and picked up the microphone. After some fumbling, it got a voice to come out of the speaker. Rescue 12. Rescue 12. Rescue 12. Rescue 12, the dispatcher said. Come in, Dick. Come in. This is dispatch. Over. The fat, muddy corpse with the greedy, piggish eyes raised the microphone to its list lips. Hello, dispatch center, the corpse rasped in its choking, injured-sounding tone. We're going to need backup at the Colton Burner's funeral home. We have a half dozen badly injured people here. Please send another ambulance as soon as possible. Over. Roger, will do, the, dash, the dispatcher said. Over. Smiling a sinister smile, the fat, muddy corpse hung up the microphone. His beating eyes gleamed dully, dully in the glow of the, he loves saying the glow of the interior light as he got out and slammed the ambulance door. He gazed across the dark rainy lot towards the nightlight over the embalming room door where the other ghouls had stopped pounding and were starting to shuffle slowly with a common purpose towards the front of the funeral home where entry might be more easily gained. The sight of the nightlight still burned giving the fat, uh, sorry, the sight of the nightlight still burning gave the fat corpse an idea. He looked out towards the street at the telephone pole with the cable that led from the pole to the funeral home. Then he waddled to the low point of the power line at the side of the building, ignoring the brief, violent flurry of electrical sparks. He pulled the cable down. With satisfaction, he noted that the nightlight and all the other lights of the funeral home went out. So again, absolutely terrifying. Showing the intelligence of these, you know, of these these corpses and, you know, uh, frankly, I mean, the scene in the movie is funny and we love it. And it's, it's ever so brief. This is more drawn out, but I think I like this a lot better. So point, point on Russo's side. Wow. Uh, and it's terrifying. Again, corpses are smart. Why don't they drive? I mean, one of them has to know how to operate the ambulance. Why not just drive it, try to crash it into the funeral home to get all the tasty bits out, you know, clam, you know, smash smashing the clam on your tummy uh chapter 15 
When the lights went out, Ernie was in the process of dialing the police. Everything went black and the phone went dead. And Ernie yelled, don't panic. Everybody stay where you are so you don't go stumbling into each other. I've got candles in my supply cabinet. Groping his way between the embalming tables, he made it to the heavy piece of furniture that they had used to help barricade the door. He knelt and felt for the correct drawer, pulled it out, and found candles and matches. Thank God, Tina said when the first match was struck. Everybody else's eyes immediately went to Freddie and Frank to make sure they were still in the same place and still harmless. We'll have to keep a watch on those two, yelled Bert. Ernie's candles were the kind in glass jars. He got three of them going and set them up strategically around the room, two on the embalming tables and one on the middle shelf of the supply cabinet so that illumination was fairly and evenly spread. Meanwhile, mass hysteria started to set in. We got to get out of here, said Scuzz. Fucking A, said Meat. Anybody here got a car? The Unita van, said the Unita van, said Bert. But I don't have the keys. They must still be in Frank's pocket. Frank? Frank rasped and groaned something indecipherable. He's no friggin' help, Meat yelled. He's practically one of those things. Remember what you said, Scuzz? Behind enemy lines? Yeah, we got two in our mist, said Scuzz, fearfully eyeing Freddy and Frank. Better watch who you put your arms around, Tina. Whatever they got could be catching. You want to start turning into something like sunshine? Freddy's going to get well, Tina said defiantly. And what if he don't? Scuzz challenged. He'll be eating on your brain, said Meat. Bert Wilson turned towards Ernie, who had drawn his Luger and was staring at it. Listen, Ernie, Bert whispered, sliding closer. I'm scared to try and take the van key out of Frank's pocket. No telling what he's liable to do. Do you have your car? Listen up, everybody, Ernie bellowed, taking command. I have a car out there in the lot, but I don't think it'll do us any good. He paused to allow their uproar to simmer to a low babble. He held up his Luger, pointing it at the ceiling. I was out there, remember? This gun was useless. I shot one of those things in the head, and it didn't even phase it. The parking lot is crawling with them. And in the rain and the dark, we never get through them. They'd lurk in the shadows, and then they would mob us. I suggest we try fortifying this place and sticking it out until help comes. I want to split, yelled Scuzz. If you want to stay, then... <clears throat> If you want to stay, then give me your car keys and the rest of us will go get our asses in gear. I'm not deserting. I'm not deserting, Freddy, said Tina. You really are a dumb broad. You know that, said Meat. Meat told her. <laughs> he turned to the other, shouting, who's all for cutting out with me and Scuzz? I'm not turning over my keys, said Ernie, covering Scuzz and Meat with his Luger. Maybe bullets won't work on them, but they will still work on you. This is great. Like. Like, uh, conflict, Russo. Great. This is great. You pull that shit. You better not take your eyes off of us, Meat warned. Just then a siren wailed in the distance and he cuts the tension with, with the siren wailing in the distance. It's great. Just then a siren wailed in the distance and they all listened keenly as if it might mean salvation. The cops, Bert, the cops, Bert bl blurted. His eyes lit up with hopefulness. It's got to be the cops. We're going to be rescued. The siren got louder and closer. Then tires, spelled T-Y-R-E-S, because this is the British book. Then tires screeched and doors slammed and the siren stopped wailing. Sounds like they're out front, yelled Meat. Let's go. He snatched one of Ernie's jarred candles from an embalming table. Man, I never thought I'd be so happy to see the fuzz, Scuzz enthused, following Meat towards the stairs. Tina, stay here with Freddie and Frank, Ernie instructed bert and i will go up and help check check it out in case those other two decide to just cut and run he knelt pulled he knelt pulled a big metal flashlight from the bottom drawer of his supply cabinet and clicked it on the four men the four men got up to the foyer just as a brick shattered one of the glass doors in the reddish strobing light of the ambulance parked out front ghastly figures were clamoring to get in screaming brains 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 there was so much of a mob on the porch that the ambulance itself could not be seen one of the corpses reached through the broken glass not caring that his flesh was lacerated as he tried to push down on the metal bar that would have opened the door from the inside 
shining his flashlight on the dead groping arm ernie smashed and smashed at it with the barrel of his luger repeatedly hammering the rotted wrist and forearm against the jagged slash of glass that remained intact the dead hand fell off twitching on the rug the corpse retreated staring dumbly at the shredded stump of a forearm then other corpses also backed away not so much out of fear apparently but rather because they were drawn towards the strobing light of the ambulance the dead had continued to twitch until ernie rolled up in a carpet runner and shoved it out sorry the dead had continued to twitch until ernie rolled it up in a carpet carpet runner and shoved it out through the hole in the door then he shined what does that mean the dead had continued to twitch until ernie rolled it up I guess he plugged the hole. Then he shined a flashlight out onto the lawn. Douse that light, man, Ernie yelled. Them things is like moth. They're attracted to light, man. No, that's not what's attracting them to the ambulance, Ernie replied in a low, fearful tone. He kept shining his light out there, and the other three men edged closer to have a look. The ravenous ghouls had mobbed the two paramedics that had arrived in the new ambulance. It seemed clear now that the ones on the porch had been drawn away by the scent of freshly butchered human meat. The ghouls were moaning and snarling, fighting each other for a share of the meal. The skulls of the two paramedics had already been broken open and their torsos had been gutted. Now their flesh and vital organs were being bitten and ripped by sharp teeth and clawing hands. Oh my God, said Bert. They're going to kill everybody who comes here. Sickened, he backed away from the door and leaned against a chair, trying not to gag. Ernie pulled his flashlight away from the hole in the glass door. Now, do you two guys see why it would be foolhardy to try and make a break for it? He asked Meat and Scuzz. Badly shaken, they slowly nodded their heads. All right, said Ernie. So let's dig in and fortify. Help me move this. Meat, Scuzz, and Bert helped Ernie shove a heavy leather couch against the glass entrance doors. Then they all pitched in and stacked a couple of armchairs on top of the sofa. It won't keep them out, said Ernie, if they make a determined mass assault, but it'll delay them and buy us some time. I have some hammers and spikes downstairs in my workroom. Maybe they're calling them spikes because that's what they call them in, in England. We've got to board up all the doors in the window so they can't get in no matter how hard they try. What if they try to burn us out, said Bert? What if they try to burn us out? <laughs> I'm so bad at this, said Bert. I have a hunch they won't, Ernie replied with a confidence that he did not entirely feel. Dead flesh burns easier than live than live flesh, he told the others in order to bolster their courage. Cops are bound to come sooner or later, Bert said. The cops are bound to come sooner or later, Bert said. Two teams of paramedics aren't going to be reporting back to their stations or showing up at the hospital. Cops are bound to eventually come and look for them. On, on the hopeful note, on that hopeful note, the group pulled together into a cohesive unit, ready and willing to cooperate in a survival effort. Burton Scuzz agreed to go guard the inadequately fortified front doors while Ernie and Meat went downstairs to the workroom to get hammers, spikes, and wood for barricades. In the embalming room, Ernie stopped to make sure that Tina was okay and to have a look at Frank and Freddie, who were still sick and gray and dead looking. What had happened there? What happened up there? Tina asked worriedly. I heard such an awful racket. She was still staying loyally beside her boyfriend, her arm around his shoulders. Everything's under control, Ernie assured her. But it was touch and go for a while. Bert and Scuzz are keeping watch. Two more paramedics got gobbled up, Meat said. Oh my God, said Tina. In the flickering candlelight, Ernie peered closely at the two sick, chemically infected men to see if meets tactless command comment sorry ernie peered closely at the two sick chemically infected men to see if meets tactless comment might stimulate them in some telltale way like causing them to drool for instance but they remain slumped inert and inscrutable we better get our, we better get our asses humping meat said what's your tools man Shining the way with his flashlight, Ernie led him down a corridor through the coffin display room and into the adjoining workroom. Here there was a bench with a vise, a toolbox, and a pegboard. 
Ernie rummaged in the toolbox while Meat grabbed stuff from the pegs. They armed themselves with hammers, screwdrivers for stabbing would-be attackers, a hatchet, a chisel, a coil of rope and some tape, and a big box of nails. Ernie Kaltenburner couldn't help pondering the irony of his present situation. He who had made a career of uh, he who had made a career of which he was proud uh, proud out of making corpses pretty and lifelike was now battling to stop them from making him ugly and dead. Let me take that line one more time. He who had made a career of which he was proud of making corpses pretty and lifelike was now battling to stop them from making him ugly and dead. It didn't seem like proper gratitude on their part. If they had, if they could only realize how much he had done for them, they probably would have left him alone. Grant him some sort of amnesty. Let him work in peace. If he had ever gotten out of this mess alive, how could he continue in his profession with the same aesthetic attitude he had hitherto enjoyed? How could he look another deceased person in the eyes without wondering what the deceased might turn into? He wouldn't feel comfortable unless he cremated everybody. And even then, who could say what goofy, malevolent chemical properties might remain in the smoke and the ashes? The other major irony pertaining to this crazy crisis, so far as Ernie was concerned, was that he was showing some guts and leadership for the first time in his life. Good for you, Ernie. Um, he was proving to himself that he could take charge over something besides condolences and regrets. The others were following him, depending on his advice, drawing sustenance from his fortitude and resourcefulness. And it wasn't just because he had a gun. No, they sensed that he had seized command of the situation because he sensed it in because because he sensed it himself. He was radiating something new, self-confidence. All of a sudden, he, Ernie Coltonburner, High school nobody, middle-aged bachelor, secretly a Nazi, <laughs> near virgin, ubiquitous funeral director, obsequious funeral director, had emerged as somebody worthy of respect, maybe even admiration. He liked what he had discovered about himself. He liked it so much that even if there ceased to be any more dead people in the conventional sense, as if consequence, his profession would cease to be meaningful and necessary he knew he would find some other and perhaps grander way of fulfilling his creative urges listening to the new sound of authority in his own voice he told meat we'll have to come back down for lumber those planks and two by fours in the coffin room we can break some up we can break up some of the coffins too if we have to i guess ain't nobody going to be needing them if they won't if they won't stay dead meat said with a grim chuckle Ernie was showing meat the way up the steps, balancing a load of tools while directing the flashlight beam, when suddenly a loud, agonizing scream echoed down the staircase. Meat froze and then started to back away from the horrible sound, but Ernie urged him on. Drop everything but your hammer! Let's go! Behind meat, Ernie discarded all he was carrying except the flashlight and hatchet as he ran up the stairs. They burst into the foyer, lit only by an overturned candle in a jar, and saw Bert and Scuzz in a life-and-death fight with two ghouls, which happened to be Morton and Helen Dowden. Stunned. And this never, when I first read this, oh my god, my toes have fallen asleep, and it's really hard to concentrate I'm doing the best I can with my numb with my numb toes. Um, I never liked this part because it doesn't make sense at all plot wise. Like the mythology, the rules, the rules. Morton and Helen Dow Dowden shouldn't be affected. Stunned, Ernie almost didn't recognize them at first because he didn't want to believe what he was seeing, even when the flashlight beam struck their twisted, groaning, struggling faces. Only a few hours ago. He had been massaging the banker and his wife, breaking out the rigor mortis, and now here they were alive again and out of their coffins. Scuzz was screaming because Helen Dowden was biting into his mohawk skull while Bert was punching her, trying to pull her off. Morton Dowden, his legs only partially usable because his torso had, torso had been cut in two and then stitched and harnessed back together by Ernie, was crawling on the floor trying to help his dead wife by tackling Bert's ankles. But Morton had to grope to find the right hole because he was blind. His eyelids had been glued shut. Scuzz screeched, make it, 
Make it let go. Make it let go. The stitches had been ripped loose from one of Helen Dowden's sewed on hands and it was twitching on the floor with her forearms. She had scuzz in a chokehold and tight and tightened her jaws into a bulging knot of muscle. She bit harder into the shaved part of his head. He screamed as his skull gave in with a bony crunching pop. At the same time, Bert went down to Morton Downen's grasp, and Morton clawed and groped, rasping, brains, brains, anxious to sink his teeth into Bert's head. But Ernie was 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 wailing with his hatchet, pulling Morton away from Bert and chopping at the place where he had stitched Morton's torso back together. Since instinct told him that this was his former client's most vulnerable spot, Bert scrambled out of the ghoul's reach. Helen was no longer enjoined in the struggle at this point because she was too busy sucking out Scuzz's brain. Ernie yelled, help me meet Bert. Fetch the rope. Wait, what? Ernie yelled, help me meet Bert. Fetch the rope we dropped on the steps. Glad of the chance to bolt out of there, Bert snatched up the flashlight and skedaddled. Ernie kept on chopping and chopping at Morton down and Meat started pounding his hammer on Morton's arms, keeping him from clawing at Ernie. Helen leaned in a corner, watched a black. What? Sorry. Helen leaned in. Helen leaned in a corner, watching a blank, satiated look in her eyes as she continued to munch on Scuzz's brain. And that brings us to the end of chapter 15. Oh, boy. So things really kick up a, a notch. Like we said, there's a, a unexplained in an unexplained twist. Um, Helen and Morton are also reanimated despite never coming in contact with two, five, four trioxin. I don't, I still don't understand it. I still don't get it. Even reading, rereading it now. I mean, whatever, probably the weakest part of the story, but I got to tell you, these two chapters were pretty freaking great. And, and Russo's descriptions and, coming up with that very creative way uh thing that theory that that scuzz mentions i mean it's it's good stuff it's good stuff um i hope you enjoyed this chapter tune in next week for another chapter of the return of the living dead we will see you then peace and hair grease oh hello again Another week has passed. I am still fogged with COVID brain. It's not fun. I'm going to do my best to do our chapters for this week, despite the COVID brain, because the show must go on. The show must always go on. I just hope that these are not long chapters. (laughs) Where do we last leave off? Lots of stuff was happening. Um, uh, Morton, Morton and Helen came to life. The, the two, uh, cadavers that Ernie was working on before everything had started. I mean, so much stuff was going on. Scuzz, Scuzz was eaten. Um, things are, things are looking bleak. We're, we're near the end of the book. We're on page 128 and there are 176 pages. So probably after this week, we'll have one more week, I would imagine. And then we'll be done. So. Let's just jump right into it. Chapter 16. Chuck wished Casey would relax a bit so he would have a chance of getting laid, but she remained unapproachable. Every time there was a noise outside, a peal of thunder, the wailing of a siren, or the screaming of a hungry corpse, she shivered and huddled tighter into a cowering bundle, hugging her arms across her breasts. Chuck was scared, but not that scared. His horniness was overriding his scaredness. In the cemetery, he had sat by watching suicide ball legs and Casey going off to ball meat. And he hadn't gotten the... Oh, my God. And he hadn't gotten the least little share of the goodies. John Russo's words, not mine. He figured if he could just stay close to Casey now, in this crisis with emotions generally running high and out of control, he might get a chance to score on her he might get a chance to score on her. Oh, my Lord. And <laughs> that he would never have had under normal circumstances. Ooh, smooth one, Chuck. Smooth. 
They were in the warehouse office. He was sitting behind one of the steel desks and she was sitting behind the other. He had tried going over and putting his arm around her a few times, but each time she had stiffened and held her whole body rigid till he went away. What a shame. If they could agree to forget about the ghouls outside for a little while, it wasn't a half bad setting for romance. The warehouse office would have been pitch black except for the candles they lit at one at a time. Uh, conserving, of course. There was no electricity, and the phone was dead because of the downed power lines. They had drunk the half pot of cold coffee on the Mr. Coffee machine, and there was no way to make more. Chuck had tried. So, right. So they do go over to Unita while the others are at the resurrection home. They are, for all intents and purposes, uh, pretty safe in there, I suppose. One, one would imagine. He had used his flashlight to venture out to the men's room for hot water from the tap, but it hadn't been hot enough to make the coffee grinds dissolve, coffee grains dissolve. He wondered if maybe he should have cast his lot with meat, scuzz, and Tina when they had decided to try and make it to the funeral home, but he had let his cock do his thinking for him. When Casey had refused to move because she was too shook up to go out among the ghouls anymore, he had volunteered to stay and watch over her. If he had split, it might have made her split too, in preference to being the only one left behind. Maybe he would have been wiser to be more interested in getting away than in getting laid. But after all, there was no guarantee that the rest of the gang had made it. They might all be dead. Their brains sucked out of their friggin' skulls. At least the warehouse was reasonably safe. The walls were corrugated steel and the tall, narrow windows were locked and barred. The tarry corpse down in the basement pounded and groaned from time to time, but so far it had, had been unable to break out. Chuck, Casey said in a low, trembling voice, do you think we're going to be rescued? He was glad she was asking him that kind of question, depending on him to be wise and strong and maybe start to fall for him a little bit. He might yet he might yet get in her pants. In the orange candle glow, with her long blonde hair and fear-widening green eyes, she seemed especially desirable and vulnerable. Sure, he told her with a lot more confidence than he felt. It's just a matter of time. Someone will come and get us out of here. Someone? Casey stammered. I, I hope it's the right kind of someone. She meant she was hoping it wouldn't be one of the ghouls. Probably the cops will come, said Chuck. You heard... The sirens before squad cars must be out there prowling. They're bound to rescue us sooner or later. How will they know we're in here? Once they find out what's happening, they'll search for human survivors. In a pitch black warehouse, Casey said, why would they look in here? Meat or scuzz or Tina will tell them about us. Chuck said, I wish we could be sure. Casey said meekly and mournfully. What if they don't? I mean, she let her voice trail off looking at Chuck with, her scared, wide-eyed gaze. They made it, he said. They had to have made it. If they did, I hope they don't just forget about us, said Casey. They won't. They're our pals, Chuck said staunchly. Casey gave him a funny look, and he knew what it meant. No one in the gang really was close to him. In fact, they all treated him like a queeb most of the time. They knew he was mainly hanging around with them because he had the hots for Casey. She had been in she had been in his class in the past term, their junior year, but she hadn't given him a tumble. He wanted her so bad, and he had wheeled his way into her crowd, but they sensed he wasn't for real, not really into their punk rock, new wave kind of shit. He was, he was at heart a square, middle-class kid with a heavy crush on a chick who was beautiful but wild. Casey's beauty and the wildness teased and tormented him. When she went off with meat, it blew his mind. He was appalled and jealous that she was an easy lay for a freaked out guy like meat instead of for him. Casey, he asked her, if we get out of this alive, will you make it look, will you make, will it make you look at anything a little differently? She shot him a puzzled look. You mean like becoming more religious or something? Grateful to God for sparing us? Well, yeah, I guess so, said Chuck who really hadn't been thinking along those lines. I admit, I've said a few prayers. Have you? No, I almost weakened, but I didn't. I don't think praying does any good. If it did, lots of people like little kids in can with cancer and stuff would just get better. 
They pray to God, but he doesn't help. Sometimes he does, said Chuck. No, he doesn't. If some people are cured, that's just luck. If God was going to help one person, why wouldn't he help them at all? I mean, we're supposed to be equals in his eyes, right? Don't you believe in, in God? Case Chuck asked disconcertedly. Boy, John Reese Rousseau, you're really, really subverting us with this stuff, huh? Not like most people do. If there's a God, I don't think he's up there paying attention to us. He just made us like toys and wound us up and let us go. We're on our own, and he doesn't want to be bothered. That's why everything is always screwed up all the time. You're agnostic then, said Chuck. I guess so. You don't believe in sin? What do you mean? Like sex, for instance. Isn't it a sin for you to do it with whoever you want? No, it's not a sin, she said. It's not immoral or unethical. Unless I make a personal commitment to do it with only one particular person or even a group of particular persons <laughs> and then go off and do it with other people. But so far you haven't made it, but so far you haven't made that kind of commitment. Uh-huh. She peered at him in the candlelight, obviously wondering why he was on such a subject at a time like this, but she no longer looked quite so scared. Thinking about his questions and answering them had settled her down. He was incredibly horny. We know, John Russo, you told us. Hearing her talk so frankly about having sex with a whole group of people had fired him up worse than ever. Uh, Casey, he said, his throat dry. Uh-huh. Since you don't think it's a sin to do it with whoever you want, how do you make up your mind who you want to do it with? By choosing? <laughs> I mean, like, like a free person is to do? Like, <laughs> Jesus Christ. She thought about it, furrowing her unblemished brow and tossing her long blonde hair back in a careless automatic way that got to him every time she did it. I don't know, she said. I never pick myself apart to find out why. It's just a certain chemistry happens, a certain person, a certain situation. I can feel when it's right, and then I go for it. He held his breath and took the plunge. How about now with me? Because if we don't get rescued, it might be our last chance to get our rocks off. I'll consider it, she told him. But zombies outside don't exactly put me in the mood. We we can push those heavy filing cabinets up against the, the office door, he suggested, anxious to throw her on the floor and do it to her. He was so hard up, he was even scared they might get rescued before he got his chance. I don't know, Casey hedged. I don't know if I can really get into it right now. I mean, it might be bad for you, you know, he said. In the London air raids during World War II, people made love like mad. It was an affirmation of life in the midst of destruction. The zombies could use some affirming, maybe more than bombs, don't you think? It makes a weird kind of sense, she conceded. He got up from behind the desk and with the bulge in his pants, went over to kiss her. Yeah, so in the novel, they do, yeah, he do, they do, they do have sex. In the movie, Chuck is just hard up for Casey. They really sort of don't really play into this, but Russo expands on it. I mean, they get their whole chapter devoted to it, as you can see. Chapter 17, I have a feeling this is going to be a long one. After they got the most vulnerable spots, the funeral home boarded up and barricaded. Bert, Ernie, and Meat returned to the embalming room. There, Tina was watching over Frank and Freddie, both still slumped over side by side, looking very ill, like life-sized ragdolls that somebody had painted a horror horrid greenish gray color. Morton and Helen Dowden were flat on their backs on the embalming tables. They were both tied up with coils of rope round around round and around round around. Try saying that 10 times fast round around and around their bodies. Both were all battered up from the fight in the foyer, but Morton had received the worst of it. His head was smashed and bruised and his torso was nearly chopped in two where Ernie had previously stitched and harnessed it. One of Helen's hands was missing and her mouth was bloody from eating Scuzz's brain, but she seemed almost content to just lie there and watch everything that was going on. Apparently, this was because her stomach was full, her weird appetite temporarily appeased. Her husband, who hadn't eaten anything since coming back to life, kept moaning and groaning in his raspy voice, trying to break the ropes that bound him to the embalming table. I'm hungry and I can't see, he complained from time to time. I glued your eyelids. I glued your eyelids to keep them shut when you were laid out in your coffin, Ernie explained. 
can't you remove the glue? Morton begged. No, I haven't had anything to dissolve it with, said the mortician. Sorry, but I had no way of anticipating this sort of problem. This is actually, that's actually a really funny little scene that would have worked really, really well in the movie. I could imagine O'Bannon uh, uh, running with that. I can see, rasped Helen with a certain smugness. Mm hmm, said Ernie. I didn't glue, I didn't use glue on you, just plastic eye caps. You must have clawed them out. Meat came over and stared with trepidation at the two corpses in the murky candlelight. Are you sure they're tied up securely? He asked Ernie. He still had his claw hammer in his hand just in case something happened. I don't see why not, said Ernie. They're not stronger than humans. Bert Wilson piped up nervously, coming up behind Meat, but no closer. Well, Ernie, I don't understand. What do you want with them? I mean, what are we doing? Let's get it over with. Put them in the incinerator. You're going to burn us? Helen rasped, but she didn't sound the least bit scared. She even smiled ig in ig ig like ig like enigma enigma. I can't pronounce that word. Enigmatically, you know what I mean. I'm sorry. I suck at reading. We all know I suck at reading. Enigmatically. Doesn't that frighten you, Ernie asked? No, nothing can kill us. We just take different forms, said Helen. This, there is eternal life after all, she chuckled hideously. That is really frightening. Ernie asked, does that frighten you? She goes, no, nothing can kill us. We just take different forms. There is eternal life after all. And she chuckled hideously as a result. Wow. We'll see about we'll see about that, Bert snapped. Let's cremate them, Ernie. I want to talk with them first, the mortician replied with calm stubbornness. Man, I don't dig your un I don't dig you undertaker cats, meat drawled. Ernie ignored the objections of the other two men and addressed Morton and Helen. Why do you eat people? he asked. Not people. Brains, Helen told him. Primarily we crave brains. We will eat human flesh to stave off our craving for brains, but plain flesh can't satisfy us completely. Why? asked Ernie. Brains contain medicine for our pain, said Helen. Morton groaned and thrashed miserably. What about the pain? Pause, perused Ernie. The pain of being dead Helen told him it hurts to be dead I can feel myself rot Christ Bert exploded far out meat drawled very interesting said Ernie what does eating brains have to do with it it makes the pain go away Helen informed him oh god I know I know rasped Morton to Ernie and Bert, Meat said, Hey, come out in the hallway for a minute. I want to talk to you guys. Don't leave me alone with them, Tina gasped. They can't get up, said Ernie. They're securely tied down. Babe, you don't have to be scared of the ones on the embalming table. Oh, sorry. That was Meat. Babe, you don't have to be scared of the ones on the embalming tables, Meat drawled. Your boyfriend and his chum is who you got to be scared of. Freddy is going to be okay. Tina snapped defiantly out in the hall. Meat said, listen, how do you kill those things? Y you don't, said Ernie, shaking his head. What do you mean, said Bert? We already got rid of one by cremating it. The split dog, too. I'm not so sure about that, said Ernie. I'm not so sure the ashes or the smoke from what we burned didn't go up the chimney and then get condensed back. I'm not so sure that the ashes or the smoke from what we burned didn't go up the chimney and then get condensed back down out of the rain and make those other ones come back to life somehow. Helen said they can't be destroyed, and I believe her. They're not alive. They're animated. With our own eyes, we've already seen how you could chop them up into pieces, and the pieces keep twitching and jumping around. Oh, fuck. Oh, Jesus, Meat moaned. Shit, said Bert. The only thing we can do is burn them. We got to take our chances with the ashes and the smoke. Personally, I'd rather, I mean, I'd sooner have those things all burnt up where there's nothing left coming after me. But what if we're just making more of them, said Ernie. A few more ain't going to make no difference, said Meat. Oh, that was Meat. Already there's hundreds of fuckers out there. How are we going to burn them all up, said Ernie. 
that's the $64,000 question. Or he says, that's the $64 question. We can at least deal with the ones we have in our midst, Bert said solemnly. So we get a different version. We don't get the uh, the the half corpse that we have in the movie, the iconic half corpse. Instead, we get um, Morton and Helen uh, giving us the lowdown. But yeah, like it is scary. Like the idea that that they just change form, they almost make it sound like the smoke is uh, sentient. And there is something to that. Like earlier in the, in, in one of the previous chapters, um, the smoke uh, seems to have its a mind of its own. So there is something to that in, in whatever Russo is trying to add here. Um, but the exchange is still scary. Uh, uh, nonetheless, Meantime, at the headquarters of the Louisville Police Precinct, including the warehouse district, the 4 to 12 watch commander was being relieved by the one who came in on duty at midnight. The new watch commander, Sergeant Harry McCarthy, I don't remember this part, was told that the call had just come in about the missing ambulances. Two teams of paramedics were dispatched to Colton Burner's funeral home, and neither team has reported in, either to the station or to the hospital. I'll take care of it, said Sergeant McCarthy. I'll send a squad car over there. It's a bad night with this awful storm. There's bound to be the more than the usual number of crazy incidents and fuck ups. Well, the headaches are all yours now. The off duty uh, watch commander said with a chuckle. I'm going home to my bitchy wife. Happy Fourth of July. Same to you, said McCarthy. Going to stop for a shot and a beer to brace myself up before I look at my wife's fat, ugly puss. The off duty watch commander said on his way out the door. The mention of Boo set off a Pavilonian reaction in Sergeant McCarthy, a big beer bellied cop with a red bulbous whiskey nose. He went to the coffee machine and poured himself a cup and then sat down behind his desk, unlocked it, and slid open the bottom drawer. From under a police department flak jacket he sneaked out a bottle of bourbon and poured a hefty dollop into his coffee sipping the black steaming coffee royale he began to check the logbook he grimaced sourly when he noted the huge number of entries long holidays were always hell gulping down some more coffee royale he looked at his watch 20 minutes to 12 it was his habit to show up early to relieve the old watch and the other guys did the same for him at about 7 30 his stint would be done and he had no doubt that he was in for eight hours of insanity, knifings, shootings, drunken disorderlies, what have you. According to the logbook, the holding cells were already damn near full. It was the holiday spirit bringing out the worst in people. McCarthy wasn't in any hurry to radio a squad car to check out Colton Brenner's funeral home. The cops who had been on the fucked up city streets for almost eight hours would be coming in now, dying to knock off for the fourth. They didn't need one more gig to cap off a rotten, dangerous day the last day had that he doesn't realize that yet so mccarthy decided to wait 20 minutes till some of the cops on the midnight shift came out of the locker room armed and uniformed and then he'd send a couple of fresh rested up guys to check out colton burners i i i guess from like a narrative standpoint in this story that makes sense but that was just such an un we this 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 beginning of this chapter is so unnecessary. All of that explanation, just unnecessary. Didn't need it. Tina Vitali was in total anguish. Her arm around Freddie. Sorry. Tina Vitali was in total ang anguish. Her arm around Freddie trying to protect him. He sat slumped in his terrible sickness, moaning from time to time, but saying nothing to her as if he was far too ill to carry about her or anything else anymore. His boss, Frank, was the same way. Both men looked worse than ever, their jaundiced skin, a deep, more repulsive shade of gre grayish green. Tina recalled that it was the same way Sunshine had looked after he died of an overdose. I mean, we, you, Russo, you've said this like three times now, but his body had smelled really bad and Freddie's didn't. She clung to this sign as if it meant hope. If Freddie didn't smell, he couldn't be dead. He couldn't be turned into one of those things. But Tina knew that Bert, Meat, and Ernie didn't see it the same way that she saw it. She feared what they might do to Fre Freddie and Frank because of their rising panic. A while ago, she had watched them trundling the tied up bodies of Morton and Helen Dowden down the hall to the crematorium. To her, the Dowdens were talking thinking nearly human or at least once human beings she could never have brought herself to burn them alive but bert meat and ernie hadn't hesitated 
tears streaming down her face. Tina had clasped her hands tightly over her ears in an effort to blot out Morton Downton's awful, raspy moans and groans as he was slammed into the crematorium oven. For some reason, his wife, Helen, who had been cremated ahead of him, had done nothing but chortle before she went up in smoke. When Meat, Bert, and Ernie strode back to the embalming room, they had a pers purposeful glint in their eyes that Tina didn't like as they stared at Fre Frank and Freddie. She stooped and hugged her arms tighter around her boyfriend. Shit, said Meat. That friggin' ghoul lady laughed at us when we were burning her up. She didn't care diddly squat. She knew she'd come back at us in some different form. But I ain't sweating for now. At least we're rid of her ass for the time being. Damn right, said damn right, said Bert. We did the right thing. A man's gotta do what a man's gotta do. Look, I went along with you guys, but I'm not all fired morally certain about it. I'm not so all fired morally. Look, I went along with you guys, but I'm not so all fired morally certain about it, Ernie cautioned. Um, I love this what they are insinuating at. And had the movie gone this direction, it would have been very interesting. The idea that now Bert, Meat, and Ernie are going to turn their sights to burn Frank and Freddy. Um, in a sense, the zombies really do outside once they're boarded out. They sort of completely take a backseat to the fact that the main conflict or drama could have been, and as they're insinuating in this book, the fact that they now have to deal with Freddy and Frank, who are potentially a liability. And that would have made for some very interesting choices in an alternate version of O'Bannon's story. Uh, and it's ultimately the story that O'Bannon didn't want to go. But if if O'Bannon got the chance to do what Romero did and did like his own like remake of his own film, I would have loved to have seen him explore this area. I ain't staying in here with them, Meat said, pointing his arm at, pointing his arm like a poker at Freddie and Frank. Damn right, we gotta do something about them, Bert told Ernie to his face. Tina squealed fearfully. Do do what? Freddie groaned, holding his stomach. So did Frank. Oh, it hurts, it hurts, they both rasped. I think they're getting hungry, said Meat. And we'd better get our asses in gear and dispose of them before they come to realize that what they're hungry for. Because it sure as shit ain't chitlins. Dispose of them, cried Tina. Dispose of them how? Well, said Meat with a meaningful glance towards the hallway that led to the crematorium. You're not going to burn them, Tina shrieked. Oh, yes, Bert began. But Ernie cut him off. Now, hold on. Let's not go off the deep end. I'm not for doing in anybody that's technically still human, technically still a human being that could be construed as premeditated homicide. Then let's throw them out. Meat suggested angrily. You bastard said Tina. Why don't we throw you out? Because he's not the, because he's not the dangerous one. Bert yelled at her. Ernie pleaded with everybody to calm down. Look, look, we don't have to throw anybody out but maybe it would be a lot lizer, wiser if we say contain Frank and Freddy. What do you mean contain? Tina asked suspiciously and belligerently. Man, this chick is so damn loyal, Meat jeered. She don't even care to save her own ass. Quiet, said Ernie. I have an idea that should please all of us, even Frank and Freddy. We can lock them up in a room by themselves, so if they start acting up, they can't hurt anybody. And that way, if the cops do come, we can get them to a hospital right off the bat. Why don't you lock yourself up? Tina snapped. Look, don't be such a feather brain, Bert told her. We aren't proposing to do anything to any of them, for Christ's sake. Let's just lock them up in another damn room uh, for a while till we can figure out how to get help. Damn right, said Meat. I don't want one of them deciding to bite on my skull like they did to scuzz and suicide. Ernie, is there some room where we could put them in, where we could lock them up? Uh, yes, the chapel. That the chapel is what I had in mind. It has no windows. It would be perfect. He eyed Tina pleadingly. Will you go along with it? I really believe it's the best thing for all concerned. She nodded her head slowly and reluctantly. Then she said, I'm coming with you to make sure you don't stop off in the crematorium. We wouldn't sandbag you like that. I give you my word, said Ernie. Well, I'm coming with you anyway. Watch how you watch how you pick us up. Frank rasped timorously. P Please be gentle, begged Freddie. Tina and Ernie got their shoulders under 
Freddy's arms and Bert and meat did the same for Frank. But as soon as they tried to pick up the two chemically contaminated men, they both started screaming. No, Oh God, it hurts. It hurts. Let's let, let's let them alone. I can't s- let's let them alone. I can't stand it. Tina yelled. It's either this or we burn them. Bert threatened like moaning, groaning, injured football players being hustled off the field of action. Frank and Freddie were lugged and pulled up the stairs to the chapel. Tina was completely unnerved by the screaming pain of her boyfriend, by the screaming pain her boyfriend was obviously under. His body rubbing against hers felt stiff, arthritic, paralyzed. Every jolt and jingle brought forth an agonized wail. So it was great relief when they all finally got inside the chapel room, which was lit by glowing red novena candles huffing ernie said let's just lay them down here on the carpet over there frank and freddie both screamed louder than ever as they were lowered onto the floor tina knelt over her boyfriend and cried oh freddie oh freddie taking what he felt was a hell of a chance bert dug into frank's you need a uniform pocket and pulled out the van keys and then jumped back jingling them triumphantly got us some whales now he enthused that's good said meat Let's just leave them in here and hightail it. I'm not leaving Freddy, Tina snobbed, sobbed. You gotta be the dumb you gotta be the dumbest chick in the world, said Meat. If you stay in there, if you stay in there with them, we're locking the door, said Bert. Think what that'll mean if I can't leave him. We're supposed to get married, she whined miserably. Till death do us part, Meat scoffed. Please, Tina, be reasonable, Ernie begged. This is not an ordinary situation by any stretch of the imagination. I think you could be forgiven for not making yourself part of a necessary quarantine. I'm staying, she snapped with an absolute defiance. Okay, whatever you say, Ernie said, shaking his head sadly. He and Bert and Meat hurried out of the chapel, leaving Tina with Freddie and Frank. Just as Ernie closed and locked the chapel doors, Meat and Bert shouted from the foyer. The cops, the cops, they're coming to rescue us. They're pulling up right outside. Ernie came to peer through the glass of the double front doors, which had been broken and then boarded and barricaded. Meat and Bert were crouching and leaning into uncomfortable positions to see past aspects of the nailed up wood and piled up furniture that blocked the entrance. What if the ghouls, Meat blurted, giving voice to fear that all three men had, that the cops would barely get out of their squad car before they'd be swarmed under. Peering into the dark, hard-driving rain towards the headlights and flashing strobe of the police car, Ernie and Meat and Bert couldn't make out the presence of any corpses. Instead of giving them comfort, this filled them with ominous dread. They were all three thinking ambush. There was a thick, nailed-up plank flush against the place where a jagged hole had been smashed in the glass doors, and Ernie doubted that his voice would carry through it, but he pressed his face as close as he could and yelled, look out, they're out there, police, you're going to be attacked. Oh shit, they can't hear you, man, Meat moaned. We're screwed, we're screwed, Bert whined. Two big, strong-looking cops, one black and one white, had climbed out of their parole car and were moving in a slumped way in the driving rain. So far, they had not drawn their service revolvers because they could not see any need to. They had parked behind the second ambulance, the one parked right in front of the funeral home, and apparently hadn't noticed the one in the pitch blackness of the side lot. One of the ghouls must have turned off the ambulance lights. They were no longer flashing. Ernie tried yelling again. Help! Police! Be careful! Draw your guns! The cops didn't react. The pounding storm drowned out whatever muffled sound might have otherwise carried through the barricade. Getting soaked, the black cop and the white cop were both grazing, were both gazing at the ambulance, wondering why it was just sitting there so dark and useless. Ernie started hammering on the glass and the boards with his turned on flashlight. The racket got the cops attention, but they still didn't unholster their weapons. They started walking towards the porch of the funeral home. At the same time, shadowy figures edged out of the rainy darkness. Out of a frantic desperation, Ernie pulled his Luger from under his belt and fired two fast booming rounds into the ceiling, bringing down a shower of plaster. Now the cops scurried behind a couple of maple trees on either side of the walkway. 
both drew their revolvers. They weren't sure where the shots had come from. They peered from behind the fat tree trunks. Uh, when they had spotted some of the ghouls advancing, they cried, Halt! But of course, the ghouls didn't pay any attention. A dozen, no, two dozen of them kept coming out of the stormy blackness. Freeze or I'll, fall, I'll blow, freeze or I'll blow your fucking brains out, the white cop yelled. Brains, brains, the corpse, the corpses started chanting in their hideous death rattle voices. We're screwed. We're screwed. We're screwed. Bert Wilson lamented once again. Not us, man. The fuzz. Not us. Man, the fuzz is in worse shape than we are, Meat said in a philosophical but horrified drawl. The ghouls kept coming towards the cops, hands outstretched, screaming, brains, brains. The cops both started firing at the same time, their service revolvers flashing and roaring. The white cop plugged one of the corpses right in the forehead, and it must have been a particularly rotted, decomposed corpse because its head went flying and landed with a thunk in the sopping earth. But the corpse didn't go down. It just reeled and staggered and kept kept on coming. Holy fuck, the white kid. The white cop said and fired again and again. The black cop had his own mob of ghouls to deal with, coming at him from the opposite direction. He kept squeezing the trigger till his revolver gave him nothing but dead clicks. None of his slugs phased the ghouls. He threw the gun down and started to run back towards the cop car. The white cop was dragged down by a group of stinking, rotting corpses who ripped and clawed at his body, tearing off his uniform and biting into his flesh. One of the frenzied attackers chomped at his skull, splintering the bone in grotesquely powerful brain seat in ugh. One of the frenzied attackers chomped at his skull, splintering the bone in grotesquely powerful brain-seeking jaws. The black cop yanked open the door of the squad car and got the shotgun from under the dash. He whirled and fired, blowing one of the ghouls apart, blasting flying chunks of gristle and bone and dead meat out of its abdomen so that its torso was cut in two. But the two halves of the thing continued to writhe and crawl in the muddy grass. He let off two more shotgun blasts before the ghouls dragged him out of the car. They swarmed on him in a mass ferociousness and the crawling half of the corpse and the crawling half of the, of a corpse chomped into his brain behind the barricade front behind the barricaded front doors of the funeral home. Bert meat and Ernie watched in futile terror as the cops were killed and devoured. Oh God. Oh God. Ernie moaned in sick revulsion as he turned away from the glass. This place is like a black hole, said Bert. This place is like a black hole. Everybody that comes in gets swallowed up. Meat's face shined with fear induced sweat. So what are we going to do? He ranted. Just stand around here and kick our heels until the corpses find their way in. Man, there ain't no way we can stop those things. We got to get out of here. There's the van, Bert said. If we can make a break for it. No good, Ernie squelched. We're too damn surrounded. I'm scared to stay here anymore, said Bert. I'm almost willing to take my chances on an escape. You guys saw what happened to the cops. It pretty much shoots the shit out of any. It pretty much shoots the shit out of any hope of being rescued if we stick around here. There's a last ditch hiding place we could use if it comes down to it, Ernie said. Where? asked Bert curiously. He his curiosity tweaked. Yeah, how come you never told us about it, man? Meat said indignantly. Never thought about it, Ernie told them. It's the attic. There's a trap door and a pull downstairs. I guess I was figuring if we could open if we could open it, then the ghouls could too. But now I'm thinking that we could pretty easily fix it so we could bar the trap door once we were up there so nobody else could pull the folding stairs back down. Fuck, I ain't barricading myself in no attic, Meat said. I'm all for getting our act together and trying to cut the hell out of here. Show us where the attic is, just in case, anyway, said Bert. Ernie led the way down the hall, past the main slumber parlor with the two empty caskets uh, that had lately contained the mortal remains of Morton and Helen Dowden. Shining his flashlight up at the trap door, uh, inset into the ceiling, he reached up for the pull cord and yanked on it so that the door swung down on its hinges, revealing the darkened loft, and pulled down the wooden steps that led up. Hmm, not bad, Bert admitted. 
rumbling, r- rumpling his hand through his red hair. I wonder if the ghouls are even smart enough to notice the pull cord. Shit, them things ain't such dummies, said Meat. Ernie folded the wooden scare- stairs and scampered up into the attic. On his way, he shined his flashlight beam all around so that boxes of funeral parlor junk could be glimpsed. We could cut the pull cord off if we had to take refuge, he shouted down to Meat and Bert. And I can see right now it would be pretty easy to make the attic secure. All we'd have to do is leave a hammer and nails up here handy. The plywood flooring isn't nailed down, just laid across the beams. We could pull the stairs up behind us, then nail some of these thick ply nail some of this thick plywood right across the hatch. He came back down the stairs. What do you guys think? Fine, as a last resort, but nothing I care to stake my life on, pronounced Bert. But it can't hurt to put a hammer on some spikes up there anyway. What the hell for, Meat bellowed. If we're splitting this place, we ain't going to need no hammer and nails in that attic nowadays. You ain't chickening out on me, are you, Bert? No, I only mean to put a hammer and nails up there in case something happens before we get our escape plan together. I'm staying here, Ernie said coolly. I was out there once already, and I think I'd be stupid to take a chance on going out amongst those things again i feel relatively secure here maybe because it's my own place more cops are bound to come in fact they're certain to hit this place in force once they get wise that their fellow officers were wiped out the fuzz might not win Mm, the fuzz might not win against these ghouls said meat so far it's flesh eaters two and fuzz zero suddenly bert had a burst of inspiration his face lit up with a glow of impending salvation the freaking U.S. Army, he shouted in exhilaration. That's who can mop up those damn ghouls. That's why the phone number was on the drums. What phone number, asked Ernie. What drums, asked Meat. The freaking phone number, Bert said. The stale drum in the basement of the, Uni- of the Unita Medical Supply that contained the mummified corpses. Like the one that got suicide, said Meat. Yeah, it came out of one of those drums, see? Thanks to Frank and Freddy. There's instructions stenciled on every drum. Property of the U.S. Army and an 800 number to call in case of emergency. Well, what's the number? asked Ernie. Bert scratched his head, and and some of the enthusiasm went out of him. I can't remember, he murmured murmured desolately. Shit, I must have run it a thousand times every time I went down to the basement, but now I can't even think about it for the life of me. In a frenzy, Meat grabbed Bert by the collar and yanked it to his face. Think, think, you red-haired honky. Our Our fucking lives are on the line here. I, I can't come up with it, Bert stammered. It's 1-800-something-something-something, and I don't know what. Easy, Meat. You can't scare it out of him, Ernie said. Meat turned Bert loose. It gives us a real reason to try and break out of here, Bert said. Of all the times, my memory to fail me. Not that it's ever been worth a shit. Mind if we have to get back to... Mind we have to get back to the phone anyway, and the one out of here is... And the one here is out of whack. If we could go to the warehouse, we'd kill two bears with one stone. Get the U.S. Army phone number off the drums and phone them from there. Two small problems, said Meat. One, the phone there is dead, too, because we tried we tried it before we cut out of there. And two, the monster that chomped on Suicide's brain is still down in the basement. So we'd have to figure a way to clobber him before we can get to the drums. Let's go down to the embalming room and lay out a plan of action, Ernie suggested. I want to get a hammer and nails down here anyway to leave up in the attic. You still stay in here, man? Meat challenged him. It's a good military strategy, Ernie told him. I'd be unwise to squander all of our forces in a frontal assault. Um, If this was the movie and Ernie said that, you would think that he's referring to some of his um, background as being a Nazi. So next week is chapter 18. Oh my God, we have chapters. Let's see what we have left. There's 18, 19... 20 uh is there 21 if there's 21 we'll do two up so we have two more weeks after this week of of the story um it really it it presents a really cool alternate way to sort of view the story that's in the movie by reading the book and it's just been really fun and yeah again uh seeing helen and morton just sardonically you know, view their fate and be okay with it. Very scary, very scary stuff. In any case, thank you again for joining me. And uh, again, apologies for my 
additional struggle this week with my uh, COVID fog, brain frog, COVID addled brain. Um, I'm almost 99% better, but it was a little bit more difficult reading, I guess, than normal. I don't know. I think every week is difficult reading, but uh, yeah. So until next time, peace and hair grease. We will see you. Hey now, hey now. We are almost through. After next week, we will have completed the entire novelization of Return of the Living Dead by John Russo, based on a script by uh, Dan O'Bannon. I have a bit of a frog in my throat. <clears throat> I did not. Well, oh, my God. Terrible way to start a show. <clears throat> I did not want to let it stop us from our task at hand. So I, <laughs> apologies for that unpleasantness. Um, where we last left off, our friends were in dire straits. Um, and as I recall, you know, what, what was really interesting was they were sort of presented with this new conflict that I had forgotten about. And that is, you know, barely sort of hinted at in the movie, but like is totally there. And, you know, it's kind of a shame that they, I don't know, I wish that they had kind of expand on it, this idea of like, you know, Frank and Freddie um, needing to be like this sort of conflict of like, no, we got to protect them because they're our friends, but no, they're going to harm us. And obviously they lock them in the chapel in the movie and here, you know, but, but um, I feel like they could have taken it a few steps further and the book kind of allude alluded to that a little bit better. That was in the, the last um, chapter. And, uh, you know, Ernie said in the last chapter as well, I'm going to stay here. You guys can go. They're going to try and uh, get back to the barrel, as we know from the movie, which doesn't work out too well. It ends up sealing their fate. Um, but now our our squadron is about to uh, split further as they see like the, the, the everybody that comes there is getting swallowed up. As we know, um, these these ghouls are not messing around. They're knocking out the streetlights. You know, they're breaking the streetlights. They're luring uh cops in there and uh have having a having a an extended buffet also uh the mortons uh no sorry morton and ethel i believe it is uh they are both uh Dowden. they are uh cremated as well as the uh cadaver was so they go the way of the cadaver and they don't really care because they can't to them they can't really die they just sort of change shape that making making it seem like the the smoke is sentient. So all that stuff is happening. Let's go. Chapter 18. Locked in the chapel. So they're locked in the chapel now. Tina was still trying to give Freddy what comfort and solace she could. Solace she could. But he and Frank had passed into a stage of their chemically induced illness where they were beyond comforting. In the reddish glow of the novena candles, they lay in fetal positions on the red carpeted floor, their teeth bared in horrid rictus. That is terrifying. You know what rictus is? Rictus is like, it's like where you're, you, you get, it's like the Joker, basically. That's what it is. Um, Out of both of their mouths came an agonized growling that was unnerving to hear. Suddenly, Frank began to foam at the mouth and rolled around on the floor like a dog with hydrophobia. Kneeling by Freddy's head, Tina watched the other sick man with horror. Freddy turned his head slowly and looked up out of her out of a corner of his jaundiced eye. Jaundiced means that uh, you're lacking, uh, whatchamacallit, you're lacking, uh, or, or it's everything's yellow. Jaundiced is yellow. I believe that's the the best way to <laughs> to to look at it. Um, oh God, jaundiced eye, rictus grin in his hoarse, weak voice. He told her, "Tina, darling." He had never used that particular term of endearment on her, and for some reason, it sounded weird. Um, it hurts me. It hurts more than anything you. Can imagine, he went on, as if merely ta talking gave him great pain. So as merely talking is giving him great pain. And now I can see the one thing. 
and only one thing can relieve my horrible suffering. What, honey? What is it? She asked him, desperately wanting to be of more help. Live brains, he rasped. And suddenly he twitched as if he wanted to make a lunge at her. She jumped back, screaming and cowering against the wall of the chapel beneath a fake stained glass window. It gave off some sort of phony glow, almost as if light was coming through, but it wasn't really a point of exit. Freddie held himself in check in check with a force with a fierce effort. Yeah, Freddie held himself in check with a fierce effort. You see, darling, he rasped. I must have human brains to eat now, and I, I don't want them to be yours, Freddie. What are you saying? She sobbed fearfully. You must escape, he hissed. Before I can't control my hunger any longer, open the door and go and lock it behind you so me and Frank can't come after you. But Frank, foaming at the mouth, was already up into a half crouch coming towards Tina. Brains, brains, he murmured in his hoarse, sick whisper. So we have a, a, a very different, this is very different from the movie. <coughs> we have. Freddie reluctantly not wanting to eat Tina's brains. And we have Frank who in the movie still has his wits about him and ends it in the most macabre, horrible way. You can imagine he, he operates the cremation machine himself and throws him in, uh, throws himself in there and, and burns up. And here he is. Um, he's interested in, in a snack. Um, she flung herself at the door and started pounding on it, screaming for help. At the same time, Freddie, who had been lying behind Frank and Tina, grabbed at Frank's legs in an effort to stop him. Uh, so Frank is trying to stop. So Freddie is trying to stop Frank from grabbing at Tina. Frank fell on top of Freddie. I mean, this is another great thing that they just did not. They could have done in the movie. You could have had this conflict where maybe Freddie is going after Tina and then Frank is trying to stop him before the guys come back in there and 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 uh, throw acid in his face. Frank fell on top of Freddie and the two nearly create the two newly created ghouls fought each other, biting and slashing as they rolled on the floor. Tina screamed and pounded for someone to come and let her out. Ernie, Ernie, please help me. Luckily, the wiry, sandy-haired mortician had been on his way up from the embalming room with a hammer and nails to stash in the attic. Hearing Tina's desperate cries, he started running. Tina! Tina! He yelled, hammering his fists on the locked chapel doors. Let me out, she pleaded. Please! He wants to eat me! Ernie fumbled for his keys, got the right one inserted, and yanked open the chapel doors. He jumped back, ready to bash Freddy or Frank in the head with his hammer if they got near him. But it was Tina who rushed out into his arms, almost bawling him over. Freddy was still fiercely fighting to prevent the attack on his girlfriend, summoning whatever last visages of humanity were yet part of him. So what is sort of, you know, really focused on in Return of the Living Dead Part 3, but with John Penny, who was the assistant editor on this film it was one of his first jobs um i mean it's here in the text this sort of like reluctant i don't want to eat you because i love you sort of thing uh just not done nearly as well or as brilliantly as john penny would do it um before ernie slammed the chapel door shut he saw frank use his superior weight and strength to get astride freddy and ram two prongs of a candelabra down into freddy's eyes so the acid is not here i forgot about this part but he gouges out freddy's eyes with a candelabra the younger weaker ghoul's anguished scream reverberated in the corridor even after the doors were closed and locked yeah i'm blind i'm blind was freddy's muffled raspy cry Oh, that poor creature, Tina wailed, stunned by the depth of his love that he would sacrifice himself to save her, even though he was turning into a monster. Ernie hugged and tried to comfort her. Don't you worry about Freddie and Frank. There's not, that's not them in there. They've gone to heaven. 
Those things in there are just dead bodies that want to eat our brains. Um, you get a little bit of Russo, Russo religion right there. It struck Ernie that the speech he just made wasn't too different from the ones he made many times at the funeral parlor to bereaved friends or relatives of loved ones. Frank, or maybe Frank and Freddie, were now pounding on the chapel doors, making them shake and vibrate so much that the lock probably wouldn't hold for very much longer. The racket had bought meat and Bert up from downstairs, brandishing a hammer and a hatchet. Turned on you, huh? Meat sneered. I told you, you dumb broad. Lay off her meat, Ernie warned. What are you going to do about it, Undertaker? Shoot me? You probably like to have corpses walking around here. You're so used to hobnobbing with them anyway. Splinters flew from the doors as they, as they threatened to give way. Help me, Ernie shouted to the other two men. We've got to get some more lumber and nail these doors shut. We're ready to split, man, Meat said. If you're dumb enough to stick it out here, it's going to be your own ass. Bert? Ernie asked with a serious level glaze. What do you say? You got me into this in the first place. Yeah, but it's coming apart at the seams, Bert said in a cowardly whine. I'm not trying to desert you, old poker buddy. I'm giving you the chance to come with us, but you're making the wrong choice. Get going then, Ernie snapped sarcastically. Don't let us hold you back. See, that sucks. I love the camaraderie between Ernie and Bert in the movie. Hey, that favor you owe me? Yeah. Uh, watch yourself out there. It's great. It's just it's so great. So much is conveyed with such with with such few lines. You know, the doors continue to splinter at the jabs. Russo is very good at writing suspense. The lock seemed to be holding, but the hinges were being torn loose. Tina, Meat asked, "I'm staying with Ernie." She replied bravely. Ernie, we're gonna bring you. Uh, Ernie, we're, Ernie, we're gonna bring the army. Bert promised. You'll see. We're gonna make it, old pal. He was desperately trying to convince himself with his own words. They all headed to the embalming room. Tina and Ernie to get lumber for the bar for barricading the chapel and Bert and Meat to launch their, es their escape attempt. On the stairs, Bernie said to Meat, you'll have to cover me. Beat the zombies back till I can get the till I can unlock the driver's side of the van. Meat said, yeah. What about the zombies between us and it? We'll just have to storm them far the way through. If I get behind the wheel, I'll, unlo I'll unlock the passenger door for you. I'll unlock the passenger side for you. Shit. How come I got to be the last one in? Meat complained. You got a better plan? Bird asked. No, let's do it. They listened at the embalming room door, decided it sounded quiet enough out there, and gave each other a nod. Ernie unbolted the door and flung it open for them, and they charged out into the rain, brandishing their weapons. Meat with the hatchet and Bert with the upraised hammer. Uh, un upraised hammer. Ernie slammed the door shut behind them. They had to cover a distance of about 30 yards to get to the Unita van through the wind, rain, and ghouls. But it was their good fortune that most of the brain eaters were up at the front of the funeral home feasting on the dead cops. They only had to contend with about a dozen of the ravenous creatures coming up, at, uh, coming at them in the side lot, moaning and rasping, brains, brains. So it's so interesting here. How like so much has changed. Uh, this is very different from from the the movie. Uh, some good, some bad. Um, I would say. Uh, Bert swung his uh, Bert swung all his might with the hammer, knocking the head off of a decomposed female. Then delivered a hard kick at her still animated body, knocking her to the wet pavement. Meanwhile, meat chopped and chopped with his hatchet, lopping pieces off of arms and fingers from the grasping, clawing ghouls. Bert managed to unlock the van and climb in, then punched the lock down. He dived to the other side to unlock the other door for meat, who was running, trying to scurry around the front of the vehicle ahead of the two shuffling, relatively slow-moving zombies. Now they're slow-moving. Meat, meat got in and slammed the door and locked it, but zombies were attacking the van itself and, their, and in their frenzy for fresh human meat, pounding the windows with bricks and beating the metal sides with their fists. The, windsc the windscreen cracked and a brick came hurtling through, narrowly missing Bert's head. The zombies massed around the van and began rocking it sideways, trying to tip it over. But Bert got the engine started and rammed into gear. The van lurched out, squealing on wet concrete, smacking into two corpses and rolling them over with a crunch crunch. 
Suddenly, a corpse dangled down over the top of their van, holding on to the wind, windscreen wipers. Instead of windshield, they call it a windscreen. Windscreen wipers. It's snarling, decayed face staring at Bert and Meat. Bert turned the wipers on, but this didn't dislodge the corpse. It started beating on the windscreen, and then it reached through the hole it made made by the brick. Its dead fingers were clawing inch, inches from Bert's throat when he swerved the van, wrenching the wheel to the hard left. The corpse slipped onto one side but hung onto the rim of the hole in the windscreen glass. But one of its fingers was cut off and fell, twitching in Bert's lap. He screamed, Ah! and swerved the van hard right again and back to the right. Meat screamed too ah! and covered his eyes with his hands. Bert drove the van right up onto the sidewalk, scraping the clinging corpse's legs against the side of the cemetery wall. And at long last, it lost its grip and fell off. Bert cut the wheel and brought the van back out onto the street. Christ almighty! Christ Almighty, Meat exclaimed, during his, uh, daring to pull his hand away from his eyes. Bert slammed his foot on the accelerator, bail barreling through the rain towards the Unita warehouse. The finger! The finger! finger! He yelled. Get it the hell out of here! We, we, we remember where that's from. That's in Return of the Living Dead Part 2. It's interesting. That seems to have found its way into, uh, or originally was in this writing and found its way into that script. He flicked it on. He he flicked on the interior light, and Meat looked down at the twitching finger on the floor of the van. He yanked open the glove compartment and found a dirty rag, dived, and used it to snatch up the animated finger and threw the whole squirmy bundle out the side window. Shaking all over, he wound up the window. And if in the movie when they're doing this and they're driving, and uh, Spider is telling him he's a crappy driver, and Bert says "fuck you." Um, it's like a video game. It's almost like a, like a old school first person shooter video game, uh, where you would have to be in like the car, you know what I mean? Uh, to, to sort of, uh, do that. Oh, it still says the dad night. Hmm. Meanwhile, Ernie and Tina were on their way to, uh, on their way with the lumber hammer and nails, trying to make sure that Frank and Freddie remain safely locked up in the chapel room but they no sooner turned the corner following Ernie's flashing beam when a loud splintering noise, uh, when with a loud splintering noise, the door hinges ripped away from the jab. Freddie and Frank tore the door open and shoved it out of their way as they came plowing through. Frank was in the lead, snarling hideously, crying, Brains! Brains! Freddy groped behind him, feeling his way with his dead gray hands, dried blood caked in his eye sockets and in rivlets and in rivlets on his cheeks. Tina screamed, Freddy, don't. It's me, Tina. I love you. It's me. Frank and Freddy started coming after her with vigor, shuffling and groping in the hallway. Desperate, Ernie whirled around and looked up at the pull down stairs that led to the attic. He yanked Tina around and pulled her up after him. Then he tugged on the cord and the stairs opened a crack on the trapdoor hinges. In a mad panic, he got the wooden steps unfolded and down. Then with his hammer and nails, he scrambled up into the loft. Tina came tumbling in after him and they both tried to pull the steps up, but Frank was already climbing them and they couldn't lift his lumbering bulk. Thinking fast, Ernie slid a section of plywood flooring over the hatch, and then he and Tina both used their body weight to sit on the plywood to stop Frank from pushing it away while Ernie frantically drove in nail after nail. Freddie kept pounding and screaming for live brains. Sorry, Frank kept pounding and screaming for live brains. So it's not Freddie doing this, it's Frank. Frank is the one that's doing it. Which makes more sense. I mean, it's in the movie, it doesn't make as much sense. You know, with, or, well, once Freddy is blind, you would imagine that he'd just be stumbling around. He wouldn't be able to locate them the way that he does. Freddy, in his groping blindness, called out, Tina, where are you? Oh, Freddy, she wailed in misery and terror. Ernie didn't stop driving nails. So if I'm understanding this correctly, and I don't want to like reread the whole thing, I guess they couldn't lift up the stairs but 
because Frank was already climbing up them. So if you can imagine the door, the, the, the hatch comes down, Frank is holding on to it. So they just start boarding it up. The open space is being boarded up even with the trap door down because they can't, that's what they have to do. Um, which is really terrifying to me. Chapter 19, lying on one furniture mat and blanketed with another, Chuck and Casey were snuggling in a, poise, in a post-coital embrace on the floor of the warehouse office, wishing the world could begin and end with the nest that they had made here for themselves, wishing that there was no danger outside. They had made love like there was no tomorrow, and now they were torpid, satiated, torpid, interesting word, satiated, and once again scared out of their wits. They clung to each other in their nakedness, craving the warmth of each other's bodies and the mutual assurance that they existed and therefore might continue to exist as ordinary mortals despite the occasional raspy cries and frenzied determined pounding of the zombie in the basement who wanted to eat their brains. Suddenly, there's that suddenly, suddenly there's, there was a, suddenly there was a commotion from a different direction, the front of the warehouse and Casey screamed, Chuck jumped up and started pulling on his, pulling on his Chino trousers. They thought they heard a screech and a door slam and a human shout. Then the entrance door rattled, followed by rushing footsteps and loud cursing. Them damn things, one of them damn near bit my, them damn things, one of them damn near bit my arm. It's meat, Casey cried joyously. It's meat's voice. He's back. Who's in there? Bert yelled, pounding on the office door. Not recognizing the second voice, Chuck shouted, meat, meat, is that you? Who's with you out there? He had his stri striped shirt half on and was crouching, fumbling with his shoes. Casey was struggling into her tight purple slacks and white turtleneck. Meat, she called out timidly. Are you you? I mean, you haven't turned into one of them, have you? Casey, Meat yelled. It's me, babe. Open up. Bert rattled a key into the lock, then swore. God damn it. The door won't open. What's going on here? Chuck and Casey, still partially undressed, shoved the heavily filing cabinet out of the way so that the door could swing in. Bert and Meat rushed into the office, ready to start swinging with the hatchet and hammer. Arms upraised, Chuck and Casey yelled and backed away, trying to duck behind one of the steel desks. Casey, Casey dived onto the floor, curled into a ball and whimpered. Chuck bawled, it's us, it's us, Meat, don't kill us for Christ's sakes. They all froze and each other, they all froze and eyed each other suspiciously for several long seconds, and then Meat and Bert lowered their weapons. Chuck pulled the, the whimpering Casey to her feet. Meat stepped towards them, sniffing, smelling odors of recent lovemaking, and casting a glance at the balled-up furniture mats on the floor. Hey, babe, he said. Looks like you found something to do to pass the time. There wasn't any malice in his voice, only amusement. Chuck, you couldn't get it on with her any other time, place, or way, he said knowingly. Chuck and Casey hurried, hurriedly finished fastening and pu pulling on their clothing. Bringing them up to date, Meat said, Scuzz bought it. Tina's okay, but Freddy is just about all the way turned into a ghoul. Oh, shit, said Chuck. Poor Freddy, Casey sobbed. I wouldn't be so quick to say poor Freddy if I was you, Meat informed her. Looks like that fucking queeb and some cat he worked with here at the warehouse caused this whole shit and mess. How? Chuck cried, totally flabbergasted. Um, no time to get into the gory details right now. No time to get into the gory details right now, Bert said. We gotta go down to the basement, get the phone number off those drums. Cripes, do you know what's down there? Chuck said. Atari rotted mummy, and what's left of suicide? It ate suicide's brain. That's why it's still hungry, Meat joked. It didn't hardly get enough to eat. Ha <laughs> ha. Nobody laughed. Suicide's brain would barely be an appetizer, he added, but still nobody dug the word. So after his friend dies the most horrible death imaginable, being having his brains eaten by a zombie, he's like just sitting there be like, ha, 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 must have barely been a meal. Ha, 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 that sort of thing. It's pretty funny. Um, we gotta stave the mon we gotta stave that monster off, said Bert. 
just long enough to get to the emergency phone number. Then the U.S. Army will come and rescue us. I don't know, Chuck said doubtfully. Have you seen that thing down there? It's a real ugly one, all black and runny. Maybe we can decoy it, Bert said. Decoy, Meat repeatedly repeated skeptically. Yeah, instead of trying to keep it in the basement, let it come out and chase one of us. Then someone else can run down and get the phone number. She, who's willing to be the bait, Meat drawled. Well, I've always been a gambling man, Bert said. He slid open the top drawer of his desk and took out a pair of plastic dice. He rolled and got a five. They gamble to decide who should go. Um, low enough to make him sweat while the others took their turns. Chuck came up with double fours. Then Meat rolled Snake Eyes, the lowest possible score. Trembling, Casey rolled and got a Snake Eyes, too. It was between her and Meat. They both had to roll again. <laughs> this time, he got a six and she got a three. Sorry, baby, told her, but he didn't he he didn't offer to take her place so casey was the bait i totally forgot about this part so casey ends up having to be the bait for the tar man since meat had the next lowest role bert told him that he had to be the one to run down and get the phone number he argued and cursed but accepted the assignment all because of a dice roll or it could just be like hey fuck you old man i'm not doing it um that's really funny uh although he said it would really would have been fairer for him and the other two men to roll the dice again for the honor. They worked out their plan and made one of its essential elements out of a length of nylon rope and the two heavily padded furniture mats that Casey and Chuck had used for a lovemaking nest. Then they all took their strategic positions. Casey and Meat went to the basement door and, and Meat started unboarding it, pulling the nails out. The chemical mummy heard him doing this and stayed right at the bottom at the top of the stairs banging on the door and moaning brains 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 meat now fe now felt better about his part of the plan because he knew what Bert and Chuck had to do and it wasn't a piece of cake but he was still scared if anything went wrong both he and Casey would be goners she stood there shaking all over, wondering if she was going to have the strength to run when the moment came. Her legs were rubbery and weak. She was afraid to die. It would be so unfair. She had barely turned 17. Her entire life. Now we got to get some backstory. And like, like It's the end of the book. Her life was supposed to be ahead of her, but she was facing a quick ending at the hands of a stinking, rotting, clawing, biting corpse. Finally, the last nail popped out of the barricaded door. Meep. Meat leapt back, flattening himself against the wall, screaming, brains, brains. The black tarry chemical mummy bashed open the door, which swung outward, blocking meat from the monster's view. It saw Casey and lunged towards her. She screamed, stumbling and uh, stumbled and ran. She screamed, stumbled and ran a jolt of adrenaline giving her the energy of mindless panic. The oozing monster came shuffling after her, rasping and moaning its craven hunger. When they were far enough away from him, Meat squeezed out from behind the door where he had flattened himself against the wall. And that, this is like, it's this kind of stuff that like you'd rather just watch it than read it because it's just the description. Ugh. Um, When they were far enough away from him, Meat squeezed out from behind the door where he had flattened himself against the wall and dashed down the basement stairs. He remembered the broken third step and avoided it just in time, saving himself from a bad fall. Casey ran down one of the tall steel aisles of the warehouse shelving, knowing which one to take because it was l lighted by candles placed along the floor. At the last candle, she stopped in her tracks and faced the monster that was droolingly coming after her hissing its putrid breath. She cowered, she cowered, act too petrified to run for her life anymore, which was almost the truth. The monster lunged for her, and she whirled and jumped back. At, at the last instant, the homemade net of furniture mats and rope dropped, dra draping itself over the tarry ghouls. So they made a net to drape over the tar man. And Bert and Chuck jumped down from their perches onto the parallel tiers of the shelves. This is like Scooby-Doo. They wrestled and tugged, pulling the monster off its feet and rolling it into a bundle on the floor. 
Help us, help, help us, help us, Bert cried. And Casey forced herself into action, throwing her weight on top of the thrashing, heaving bundle, while the two men frantically wrapped it in coil after coil of rope. So it took three living humans to, to subdue the tar man. By the time Meat had come back from the basement, he had also helped to wrap up the monster. So now you have four people. Did you get the phone number? Did you get the phone number? Bert shouted into Meat's face. Got it, he shouted back. Did you write it down? No sweat, man. It's in my head. They dragged the bundled up chemical mummy oozing slime into the warehouse office, and Bert slammed the door and locked it. Then they all took a breather before battling their way out to the van. The next step was to get to a phone. Okay, I forgot that. They're, they 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 go back out to the van after getting the number. So, like, this is where you can tell the difference between um, a storyteller like Dan O'Bannon and John Russo. Because John Russo goes to, like, these lengths to, like, tell us about this, like, Scooby-Doo booby trap we're going to use these mats as a net and it takes four people whereas in the movie they pry open the door because bert told them to and he knocked its block off with a, with a baseball bat they go into the basement there's a working phone they get the number off the stencil the, the stencil number off the side of the tank they make the phone call i mean it's just it, it's so it work it makes so much sense visually in the book, it's like just this super convoluted thing. We have to get the number, but then we have to leave again, I guess, because there's no phone in the basement because they have to get to a working phone. But, you know, it just I don't know. I guess it's a it's a money and time saver um, for production, for all that stuff to just conveniently be in the basement. I think it works. It makes sense. The movie ends where it begins in that basement. So, um. I know what's coming, but one thing I do remember very clearly not being there is there's no trash. When trash gets eaten, that's it. They don't bring trash back at all, which is a shame because it's interesting to see her sort of change. Although, you know, she's sort of like mindless. She doesn't have any brain because her brains were eaten. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe, maybe they barely ate her brains. Um, in any case, next week, as I said, final chapter and then we'll move on to something else i have a couple of ideas as to what that could be i might take a small break um but i enjoy doing this reading stuff and i can't believe that so it took us almost uh almost three months to get through uh two chapters a week of return of living dead next week though we'll have three chapters because they're incredibly incredibly short chapters it's gonna be a, a short finish for next week so until then Thank you so much for joining me. See you next time. Peace and hair grease. Oh, hey, how you doing? Um, it's Monday again, which means it's time for us to somberly finish up Return of Living Dead, the John Russo novelization of the Dan O'Bannon script. I can't believe we've, we started in the first week of January, and now here we are. At the end of March, um, it's it's bittersweet. It's bittersweet, but it's been it's been a fun ride. I've really thoroughly enjoyed reading this with you guys, and um, we'll think of something else to do next time for sure. Um, we're going to do three chapters because they're all a bit on the the short side of things, and that will bring us to the end of the book. So where were we when we last left off? Meet and um, Bert have met up with Casey and Chuck. Casey and Chuck finally have made it, as all the kids would say. They, they got it on, and now they're they want to. They set this elaborate Scooby Doo like trap to um, to subdue the Tar Man so they can get the number in the basement. But now they're leaving again. They have to leave again because there is no phone in the basement the way there is in the movie. So. Now we're at chapter 20. The police watch commander, Sergeant Harry McCarthy, was now drinking straight from his secret bottle, not, bore, not bothering to pour slugs into black coffee. Remember, we had that chapter with him at the beginning when they first started calling uh, the cops. Well, now he's just 
pouring. Now he's just drinking straight from the bottle. His whiskey nose was a brighter shade of red and his baggy eyes were baggier and more bloodshot. His gray hair was a rumpled mess from scratching his thick fingers through his scalp, trying to figure out what the hell to do. Why couldn't his watch be plagued by ordinary by ordinary incidents, stabbings, shootings, R.A.P.E.S. assaults, accidents, domestic squabbles, stuff that he could handle instead of whatever the fuck was going on out there that kept making cops and squad cars and paramedics and ambulances disappear as if they had been swallowed up by the Bermuda Triangle. His second team of officers had presumably gone out to Colton Burner's funeral home over an hour ago. At least that's at least he had radioed them to go there. But since then, he had no communication from them to confirm that his orders had been followed. He assumed that they had. So now he was down four men and two cars and had no idea on God's green earth. Why should he send another team of cops into oblivion? He slugged down some more whiskey and pondered the excellent odds that he would be kicked off the police force and lose his 20 year pension yeah, pensions. That, that's a, that's a thing that's gone the way of the dodo uh, just when he was only a half a year away from being able to claim it. Could you imagine that there was a time in life where you could claim a pension like that? I mean, they still do exist, but they're just not not as easily accessible. All right, all right. He wouldn't just send another squad car. This time he'd give them air support. He'd send a squad car and a helicopter. Encouraged by this whiskey-inspired brainstorm, he radioed the police chopper station. I feel so trapped up here, we, Tina wailed. Remember, Tina and Ernie are now up in the attic. They've boarded up the thing. Uh, Freddie had his eyes gouged out with a candelabra, and Frank is rabid. How in the world is anyone going to rescue us now? Ernie put his arm around her. They were sitting in total darkness in the attic loft. He had turned off his flashlight to conserve the batteries. Feeling the young pretty girl's warm body, body shivering against him made him feel manly and protective, even in these dire circumstances. Up till now, he had always been shy and awkward in the presence of desirable women. But now, because of his newfound self-respect, he believed that he if he ever got out of this alive in the conventional sense, he would deserve and maybe even land somebody as nice as Tina. He wasn't even tongue tied with her. In fact, he did a pretty good job of coming up with consoling words. When the police started understanding the scope of this emergency, they'll mobilize. They'll get here in force and they'll have sophisticated weaponry, not just regular guns and hatchets and hammers like we have. If it takes flamethrowers and bazookas, that's what they'll bring in. Whatever will destroy the ghouls. Then they'll comb all the buildings around here for human survivors. When they come into the funeral home, we'll have to yell and stomp to let them know we're up here. We won't come down until we're sure it's safe. What if the cops shoot first and ask questions later? Wink, wink, nod, nudge, nudge to Night of Living Dead. Um, we'll just have to be careful, said Ernie. You know, we don't really have to unboard the hatch till we know it's all clear. Also, we're white and don't have to worry about cops shooting us because we're black, like in Night of Living Dead. Um, we can wait for the ghouls and the cops and everybody to be gone. That sounds like the best. That sounds like the best idea, said Tina. I guess I could stick it up, stick it out up here for a long time if I knew I had to. If only it didn't always have to be so dark. It's pitch black up here and it gives me the creeps. You know, that's what's funny. That is the interesting thing about Night of the Living Dead is that Ben is in the same situation. Um, he's down in the basement. He's waiting for it to all to boil over. He comes upstairs. Oh, look, the police are here. I'm safe because that's what police do. They protect and serve. And it's left kind of ambiguous. But in today's climate with all the cell phone footage out there sorry getting political sorry sorry i shouldn't be doing this i can't help myself um that's what that's what makes the the, the ending of night of living dead just so crazy though like when you plug in that ending today i've talked about this before on the show i mean it's it's there man the subtext is there um in any case tina 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 and um uh ernie wouldn't have to worry about that um, it's so pitch black up here. It gives me the creeps. 
I think I can fix that, Ernie told her gently. There ought to be some graveyard candles in one of these cardboard boxes. He clicked on the flashlight and started to rummage, stirring up dust and irritants from the fiberglass insulation. Just then, he and Tina heard through the roof and the patter of continuing rain, the whirling of a helicopter blades. They listened hard. The whirling didn't fade. It just hovered and got louder. It's them. It's them. It's the cops, Tina cried, hopefully. From directly beneath the hatch, through the plywood barrier, came Freddy's sick, raspy voice. Come on down, Tina. I'm waiting for you, Tina, darling. Look what you did. You made me break my hand clean off. But it don't matter, darling, because I love you. That that wasn't all written just there. That was just me ad-libbing. The powerful searchlight beam cut a, a, a conical swath downward through the night rain as the police chopper moved in a hovering circle above the funeral home and its side lot. The pilot and co-pilot spotted a dozen or more scurrying figures down below, scuttling like cockroaches out of the re- reach of the beam and into the surrounding darkness. With its siren and flashes going, the third squad car of the evening rendezvoused with the helicopter, pulling into the lot and parking by the second squad car and the ambulance that had brought Birchok and Feldstein to their deaths. The cops in the car radioed the chopper pilot for a briefing. Your immediate, your immediate vicinity looks clear at the moment, the pilot said. Proceed with the utmost caution. We're dealing with some kind of mob scene. Maybe a riot that's winding down. Some of the participants split when they saw our beam. We're going to give chase and expand our surveillance over. Um, John Russo needs to ru- work on writing cop dialogue. He did a really good job in Night of Living Dead. Um, they're dead. They're all messed up. Okay, we'll check out the scene here, the driver of the squad car said. Hunching their shoulders against the rain, he and his partner got out of their vehicle, shining their big red rimmed flashlights seeing no immediate danger they did not draw their revolvers the helicopter moved off slowly towards the cemetery its low flying blades beating loudly and its searchlight be- beaming in yellowish brilliance out of the blackness of the rainy night the two cops on the ground approached the squad car that had they had parked next to shining the red tinged light on its rain beaded windows They could have sworn nobody had been in there just a minute ago, but now they glimpsed somebody sitting on the passenger side. They both had the same thought. It could be an injured or dazed cop who had managed to get himself up from the seat or the floor. The figure moved and the door of the car swung open. An apparent policeman got out. Keyword being an apparent policeman got out. Manko Donaldson, he called out in a horse hurt sounding voice oh this is good let me let me take that again an apparent policeman got out manko donaldson he called out in a hoarse hurt sounding voice he was of course a corpse he had heard the correct names of the approaching officers over the police band radio in the car he was wearing a dead officer's uniform manko and donaldson were lulled by being called by the name by what they thought was a fellow officer had been hurt. That is terrifying. They squinted through the rain, trying to make out the face. By the time they saw the rictus grin, it was too late. The bogus cop had pounced upon Manko and was biting into his skull. Then five more ghouls came out of the shadows at Donaldson. He drew his revolver and squeezed off around, shooting at Manko's attacker in the head, but to no effect. The ghoul cop just kept biting, crunching into Manko's skull. Donaldson hurried fire Donaldson hurriedly fired three more rounds and was positive they had been direct hits. In the beam of his flashlight, he had seen chunks of flesh flying when the where the bullet struck. But his attackers kept coming, screaming and hissing. Brains, 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 brains. To his horror, he saw their faces were dead, half rotted away, and he turned and ran, but not for his squad car because that was blocked by a mob of ghouls. Instead, 
he dashed for the side door of the funeral home and pounded on it for all he was worth. Help! Help! Let me in! He yelled as the ghouls shuffled towards him in mass. Suddenly, the helicopter's searchlight beam lit up lit up the ghouls and machine gun bullets began shredding them to pieces, strewing squirmy, twitchy body parts all over the wet pavement. That would have cost a lot of money to do, but it would have looked really cool in the movie. But even the decapitated or dismembered ghouls kept coming at Donaldson, limping and crawling, staggering in their relentless pursuit for living flesh. Some were already too close to him to be singled out for a burst of machine gun fire from the air, and he couldn't fight them off. They were reaching and clawing and snarling. In sheer desperation, he fired another slug smack into the face of his nearest attacker, attacker and felt his own eyes bulging in disbelief over the grim that somehow did not fade, even though great bloodless gaps were blown in the gray gums and yellow teeth. Ooh, that is terrifying. Let me read that one more time. Um. In sheer desperation, he fired another slug smack into the face of his nearest attacker, right into the face, and felt his own eyes bulging in disbelief over the grin that somehow did not fade. The grin did not fade, even though a great bloodless gaps were blown in the gray gums and green yellowish teeth. Then the side door of the funeral home opened, and Donaldson entered the fleeting, terror-stricken home. It, well, then the side door of the funeral home opened and Donaldson entered the fleeting terror stricken hope that he might be saved. But Frank Nello, now full fledged ghoul, came out choking Donaldson and biting his face as the other ghouls joined in, ripping and tearing and chewing. I forgot about that part. So Frank does get himself a taste of flesh. I, the, the only thing I remembered was what's coming next. I don't want to say because we're going to read it. But um, I forgot about that part. The cops in the helicopter had stopped strafing the area since their machine gun bullets seemed to have so little effect on the ghouls. But they continued to circle and observe with their bright searchlight. To the watch commander, Sergeant Harry McCarthy, who was by now half drunk, the pilot of the police helicopter radioed the following berserk message. Command, this is Air 3. I repeat, Air 3. We got terrible, unbelievable situation here. Terrible. Manko and Donaldson have just been killed and devoured. We saw it with our own eyes. I know it sounds crazy, but there are mobs of cannibals down there. And they can't, I repeat, cannot be killed by bullets. Our men have been murdered. Overwhelmed by bloodthirsty, ravenous, fiendish assailants. Perhaps mutants of some sort or, or, or robots or creatures from another planet. McCarthy downed another big swig of whiskey and tried to calm the pilot down, even tried to talk to the co-pilot, but the same kind of blubbering bullshit kept coming out of both of their mouths. And there were normally, and they were normally hard nosed, straight up and down, no nonsense police officers. McCarthy could feel it in his guts that something weird was going on out there, but it couldn't be as fucking off as the wall but it couldn't be as fucking off the wall as the chopper men made it sound. Could it be a mass hysteria? McCarthy hoped so. Even if it was something weird, he wanted it to be something explainable, something that he could eventually, that, that could eventually be analyzed and understood, not something that would give him nightmares in his alcoholic old age, not something that would cause him to lose his badge just when he was almost ready to retire. To placate the babbling half loony chopper men, he had promised to send a dozen riot wagons and a dozen squad cars. He had promised to put up a blockade around the whole warehouse district. He wondered if he should follow through or if he should refrain from pushing the panic button just because some other people were pushing it. The duty phone rang. He picked it up and heard more babbling. Hello, police. Thank God. This is an emergency. I'm Burt Wilson from... Sorry, we got to do the voice, guys. We got to do the voice. The duty phone rang. He picked it up. So they never explain where they're calling from, or maybe they do. I, I don't remember. He picked up and heard more babbling. Hello, police? Thank God. This is an emergency. I'm Burt Wilson from Unita Medical Supply, but I'm calling from a payphone, and I got to talk fast because ghouls are going to attack us if I stay on the line too long. You got to help us or we're goners. Okay, so he's calling from a payphone, but they never say. Ghouls help you, the watch commander bellowed. What the fuck is going on out there? Is everybody going bonkers? 
I've lost six, six look at that. I've lost six good men and nobody can tell me from uh, nobody can tell me a damn thing that makes any sense. I heard everything from ghouls to cannibals to robots from another planet. Well, I don't want to hear that kind of shit. Either hit me with some logic or phone in somebody else, buddy, like a shrink or a funny farm. Maybe Bert said, I'm going to, I'm going to call the army, but I wanted to let the local authorities first. It's it's, I couldn't explain it if I tried, but see the graveyards full of people who aren't dead, who are stark stirring met <laughs> but see the graveyards full of people who aren't dead who aren't dead who are stark staring mad and will kill you and eat you if they catch you it's a disease see it's like rabies only faster lots faster and it keeps making people turn dead but not dead listen i know it sounds crazy but i sergeant mccarthy slammed the receiver on the cradle utterly disgusted and confused he polished off the last two inches of whiskey and slammed the bottle into the bottom drawer of his desk that is like so accurate, though, as to like what a dude would do. And that's like an alcohol cop, I feel like, would do in that situation. I get it. Um, in a tired, sad, slurred voice, he mumbled to himself, a crank call. I can dismiss this last one as a crank call. But what about the chopper pilot and the cold pilot? Nerve gas, brain damage. Maybe I'm the one who's brain damaged. Hearing things, imagining that I'm losing all my men like some deranged battlefield sergeant. While the watch commander was mumbling to himself, Bert was sagging against the wall of a phone booth, letting the receiver drop to its side. Meat and Chuck, armed with a hatchet and a hammer, were guarding the booth, keeping an eye out for ghouls, although there didn't seem to be any in the immediate area. The van was parked by the booth, <clears throat> and Casey was staring anxiously out the side window. What's up, man? Meat said to Bert. Don't the fuzz believe you? The damn cops! Bert cursed. The situation is way above the fucking heads. The army. I got to call the army. He hung up long enough to break the connection. Then he put a quarter and dialed the operator. What's that number? He said to Meat. Give it to me. What's that? What's that number? He said to Meat. Give it to me. Meat recited it and Bert repeated it. 1 800 454 8000. The number of their doom. Bert stood waiting very tensely. With the phone in his ear, it rang once. Click. It was picked up. An expressionless male voice said, Hello? Bert said, Yes, I'm calling the number stencil on the side of some steel drums. Your name, please? The voice said with the same lack of expression. Bert Wilson. Stay on the line, Mr. Wilson. You're being transferred. Bert heard a click and a beep. Beep, beep, beep. Then a tinny filtered voice, different from the first one, said, This is Com Q Denver. Go ahead. Denver? Bert mur muttered perplex perplex perplexedly, but he hung on the line. Another filtered voice. Denver, this is Wichita. I have a C-L-Y priority on a 113. Who's up? The filtered voice from Denver said, that would be that would be Colonel Glover, Grover, San Diego. I'll put you through. In the phone booth, listening to all of this meticulous filtered dialogue in great suspense, Bert gave me. A baffled look. It was a quarter past midnight California time, 15 minutes into the 4th of July, when the special phone at Colonel Horace Grover's bedside didn't ring, but went beep, 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 beep in his Spanel, in, a, in his Spanish style villa by the Pacific Ocean. The Colonel sat up wide awake as if he had had a dream premonition that the long awaited phone call would come. He stared at the beeping phone, the glowing red light. Horace, what is it? His sleeping wife muttered. As usual, he ignored her. He grabbed the phone and stuck it to his ear. His heart was pounding with wild hope that this could mean an end of Operation Drummer Boy. Into the phone, he said, this is Drummer Boy Eagle at Station 3. Come in, please. He listened to the filtered voice with rising excitement. It was Wichita. Something was really up. Yes, Captain, he told the filtered voice. I see. Very well. Put that call through to me. Yes, put him on. The colonel's wife sat up in her wrinkled night nightgown, her hair in curls. She was cooking two pork chops. No, I'm just kidding. She wasn't cooking pork chops. Um, the flesh in her arms and shoulders, flabby and pallid. The colonel grimaced at her with distaste, knowing that she would interpret his expression as one of dire seriousness over this particular phone call. In the orange glow of the bedside light, he punched buttons on the phone console, 
lighting up half the board, and at the same time, he grabbed for a pencil. Archimedes, Rutabaga, Alpha, Niner, Hot Dog. <clears throat> a babbling idiot named Bert Wilson came on the line. The colonel listened, then replied with F, it, mm, but then replied with enforced calmness in his voice, even though he was sure now that Drummer Boy was about to break. Uh, yes, Mr. Wilson, where are you speaking from? Payphone, Lou, Louisville, in the warehouse district, Unita Medical Supply. The colonel took rapid notes as the idiot continued to babble. Mm hmm. Yes, I see. When did this take place? He listened and scribbled. Uh, and when was the first drum breached? He scribbled some more. And uh, why didn't you call this number immediately? He got a stupid, half incoherent excuse, but he wrote it down anyway. I see. It's understandable. What happened next? Uh huh. I see. I see. And did try and did you try to stop them? He scribbled. Were you able to stop them? Wilson got louder and louder in his pandemonium, raving and cursing about chemicals, ghouls, brains, twitching pieces of bodies, and what have you. Then the colonel gave up trying to get it all in his notepad. I see, he said. He he said what he could when he could get in a word edgewise, I mean. He said, I see. He said when he could get in the word in edgewise. Nothing short of total reduction to ash, I see. Wilson wanted to keep babbling, but the colonel had all the information he needed now. So he cut the man off. Yes, I see. Of course. Thank you for your assistance, Mr. Wilson. I'm going to switch you back to Wichita now. And an officer there will talk to you. A, gle a gleamy eyed grin on his face, Colonel Grover punched the lucky call over to another line on his phone console and then swung his white bony legs out of bed. Despite the heaviness of his paunch, his legs were sparrow thin, giving him his white, giving him in his white t-shirt and shorts, the appearance of an egg mounted on two pipe pipe stems, clutching her throat. His wife touched his arm and he recoiled from her touch. Dear, is it? She whispered tensely. He nodded putting on his black flannel robe, his blue flannel robe, and went out of the bedroom and into his study, hitting the light switch and shutting the door. He opened the liquor cabinet that contained more electronic equipment, inserted his key card, punched a single red button as he picked up the phone and put it to his ear. After three muted beeps, General Milton Dunstan, the supreme commanding officer of Operation Drummer Boy, answered Colonel Grover's emergency call. Grover said, Sir, this is Drummer Boy Eagle. Sorry to disturb you at this hour, but we're at a Q2 status. Yes, sir, at last. It looks like we found that lost consignment of Easter eggs. Are you absolutely sure, Colonel? The general demanded. Yes, sir, pretty sure. They've turned up in Louisville at an outfit called Unita Medical Supply. It rings a bell, sir. That damn defector, Aston, was familiar with Unita and its connection with some of our other operations. Not only that, sir, but our tap on the civilian law enforcement network has been feeding us some intelligence on some pretty weird communications within the Louisville Police Department. When you put it all together, it constitutes pretty hard confirmation, sir. Louisville, Kentucky. Well, this is good news, Colonel Grover, the general said. Well, it would be good news, sir, except the eggs have hatched. Oh, my God, General Dunson said. That's horrible, is it? I mean... Yes, sir. I'm afraid so, sir, Colonel Grover said. It looks like our worst case scenario. You mean, the general sputtered. Yes, sir, Grover said in a tight, awestruck voice. I'm afraid I have to ask you to confirm the order for extreme urban sanction. In, okay, so before we read the next part, so what is interesting and doesn't really get conveyed in the movie, but does co get conveyed in the novelization, this is why you always have to read the novelization because you get information you you might not pick up on or maybe it's implied or maybe it's not outwardly said. Burt Wilson sort of seals his fate. Colonel Grover, or Glover, depending on how you're pronouncing it, is basically debriefing Bert Wilson, because they need to know what to do in the situation. I guess their contingency is to for total an annihilation because of Bert Wilson telling them that there's no way to kill them. So in effect, that's one way to interpret it. At least that's how I was interpreting it when I was reading 
when he when he said i have all the information he said uh he he cut the man off because he had all the information that he needed so in any case he's now asked for extreme urban sanction whatever that means in louisville Bert Wilson was still on hold on the payphone after answering more questions put put to him by the Army Communications Commander in Wichita. Meet and Chuck standing by with their weapons and Casey leaning her head out of the side window of the Unita van were listening with exhausted intensity. Hey, man, the suspense is killing me, Meet said. At least give us some kind of hint as to what's happening on the other end of that line. Bert cupped his hand over the mouthpiece. mouthpiece. These army people seem pr sound pretty confident. They seem to say they've been waiting for this to happen. Apparently, they've got a contingency plan to deal with it. That's great, Casey said. What is this great fucking plan, Meat said suspiciously. I'm not sure, Bert Wilson admitted, but they want us to find shelter and hold up. Don't leave the city under any circumstances. I never, ever trust the army, said Chuck. But this time, I guess none of us have much choice. We can't beat those things on our own, that's for sure. All of us might already be contaminated. Yeah, man. Did you ask them about that? Meat said to Bert. Not in so many words, Bert replied nervously. But I'm sure they got my drift. They understand this thing. They said hold tight and they'd solve all our problems. I I don't like the way that Russo has written this in the book. I like it's so much better in the movie. What is it? What is it? The, the army says it's just we get these glimpses of the conversation. We don't get the full conversation. They've been waiting for this to happen. They have a contingency and that's it. And, and, and then it goes, do you hear that? Because the, the bomb is coming. Tina. Chapter 21. When the order for extreme urban sanction was confirmed down through the chain of command, the final telephone in the top secret Operation Drummer Boy link up began beeping. This phone was picked up by 22-year-old U.S. Army gunnery sergeant. He was sitting in a little cab at one end of a long, flat railway car parked on a quiet spur out in the middle of nowhere on a forest of low scrub pines. On the bed of the flat car was a huge brown cannon and a 150 millimeter howitzer. Blech. Smoking a cigarette, the gunnery sergeant gazed out the window of his duty cab, admiring the sunrise. As he spoke into the telephone, the the reb orb, the reb I think it's supposed to be the red orb of the sun. It says R-E-B. The red orb of the sun was just peeping into view over the tops of the low, scraggly pine trees. This is Drummer Boy 7, the sergeant said, on station for red alert. He wasn't nervous. He wasn't alarmed. He believed that this was just a drill. He believed that because he had been told so, that his cannon contained a live shell capable of being fired but without a nuclear warhead he had never fired his cannon before previous drills had never gone this that far but even if he did fire it it was his belief that that spent shell would parachute harmlessly down somewhere probably way out into the ocean where it ran out of propulsion energy he listened and dutifully wrote down the code numbers and he that he was given by his superior officer yes sir Oh, my God. They have them in here. Archimedes, hot dog, rhubarb, niner, zero. Gotcha, sir. Archimedes, hot dog, rhubarb, niner, zero. Gotcha, sir. So good. The voice of the superior officer continued with more instructions. Bearing mark 220. Yes, sir, said the gunnery sergeant. Gotcha, sir. I have bearing 220. He began dialing the information into the howitzer's mini computer. The huge cannon swiveled around, rotating from one compass point to another on giant purring gimbals. The sergeant listened to his superior officer as he was given range and angle coordinates. The long muzzle slowly rose until it reached the desired arc, aiming above the trees out to the horizon. With a beep, the word locked flashed on the screen of the mini computer. A huge Artillery shell bearing a red and yellow radiation symbol rolled into the breach and was chambered snugly with a loud metallic clang. Already here, sir, the gunnery sergeant said. Over the red alert phone, his superior officer, who he had never met, gave him the order to fire. Unconcerned because he was so sure this was just one more harmless drill, 
He enjoyed the flaming belch and the terrific kick of the giant cannon as it rocked the railroad car back on its springs. Chapter 22. Oh, God, this is great. This is so great. Tina and Ernie were still huddled in the attic, but now they had a candle going. She felt a little better not being in the pitch dark anymore, but she was still glad that Ernie kept his arm around her. She knew that she could be a lot braver and not so scared if Freddie wouldn't keep talking to her, yelling up through the barricaded hatch. In a way, she still loved him, even though it wasn't him anymore, but somebody, something that wanted to kill her. She trembled against Ernie as her boyfriend, in his altered state, spoke to her in a hissing, pleading voice. <clears throat> Tina, this is Freddie. Come to me, darling. Oh, dear God, Tina gasped. Easy, 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 Ernie said, hugging her. Freddie's raspy voice permeated the love. Tina, it was wrong for you to lock me and Frank up. He blinded me when I fought him to let you escape from him. But I forgive you, darling. And I know where you are. Even if I can't see you, I can smell your brains. Tina moaned and buried her face in Ernie's shoulder. Freddie said, I'm coming, Tina. I'm coming. He started pounding more fiercely than ever on the plywood that was nailed over the hatch. Some of the nail heads looked like they might start to pull through, but just as abruptly as he had begun, Freddie stopped pounding. Tina emitted a scream of terror and relief. Freddie then resumed, pleading with her. <laughs> Tina, listen to me. We're always meant so much to each other so please please open the hatch it's wrong awfully wrong that you should keep me locked down like this crash the block hatch shook as something smashed against it from below tina and ernie scuttled away as fast as they could underneath them through the barricade they heard freddie's raspy anguished moan then he said Oh, see, now look what you made me did. You made me hurt myself again. In fact, you made me break my hand completely off this time. But I don't care, darling, because I love you. And you've got to let me eat your brains. <laughs> Wham! Again, Freddy banged his arms and his one remaining fist against the hatch. Tina screamed and clung to Ernie, shaking all over. He held her and patted her tear-dampened long black hair. Freddy rasped. Raise! Raise my darling's brain! He tilted his ghoulish head, listening to Tina's anguish sobs. Then he heard something else from afar, a whistling sound. <whistles> Tina and Ernie heard it too. They listened keenly. The eerie whistling sound got rapidly louder, overwhelmingly loud, drowning out all other earthly concerns. It was the sound of doom, and it was the last thing that any of them ever heard. Psh, Tina. Dude, how great. Okay, that Russo crushing it right now. Ready? Um, it was the sound of doom, and it was the last thing that any of them ever heard. Perfect. Just perfect. And then we get this really weird epilogue chapter. Chapter 23. Final chapter. The defectors. Uh, Guy Burgess, Donald McLean, and Raymond Ashton were gleefully preparing to drink a toast of Russian vodka at Ashton's Dhaka outside Moscow. They stood by a huge fireplace in the darkly furnished study when Ashton filled three large glasses. The morning, uh, that morning of September 5th, 
Raymond Ashton had a conversation with Gregory Zortov, the first director of the KGB division to which all three defectors were assigned. Uh, Zotov had briefed Ashton on the events subsequent to the obliteration of the city of Louisville, Kentucky, by a half a kiloton tactical nuclear artillery shell. The city no longer existed except for the remains of melted, twisted rubble. Its occupants had been vaporized. Thousands of people on the periphery of the massive explosion miles away from the mushroom fireball had been maimed, smashed, roasted, blinded, and poisoned by radiation. Morgues and hospitals outside the devastated area were overflowing with the dead, sick, and dying evacuees. It's like honestly terrifying. And, you know, I take that back. I actually really love this epilogue because we never get, not that you need one, you don't need one in Return of the Dead, but it is kind of interesting to hear this now. So here is the, the, the aftermath from this point of view. <clears throat> the American government had explained the incident by calling it an act of sabotage. According to an official news release, uh, uh, a hit, hit, or, I can't pronounce that hetero, like, you know, here in to I can't say it. I can't say it. I know what the word is. I can't hit her toe, a uh, hit her toe, hit her toe, unheard of leftist terrorist, blah. a unheard, heard of leftist terrorist group calling itself the Green Brigade. Oh my God, I suck. Calling itself the Green Brigade had wired the State Department to take credit for the disaster. They claimed to have detonated in Louisville's warehouse and refinery district, district a small nuclear device fashioned from stolen plutonium. The entire nation was in a state of panic and hysteria, not only because of the sudden awful destruction of one of its key cities, but because no one could be sure where the terrorists might strike next with their homemade nuclear bombs. That is terrifying. That is truly terrifying. When the three glasses were filled with vodka, the the beamingly elated defectors raised them high, uh, high and clinked clinked them together. Raymond Ashton proposed uh, a toast. Here's to Operation Drummer Boy. May it plague our enemies forever. So the bad guys win. They guzzled and tossed the empty glasses into the fireplace where they crashed and shattered from a tray on his desk. Ashton took clean glasses and started pouring another round. Here's the best part. He said to the other two men, the American military establishment has prevailed upon the environmental protection agency to help them the, with the cleanup. They so avidly desire the EPA has ordered the removal of tons and tons of soil and debris from the contaminated area. At this moment, that stuff is residing in 175 railroad cars parked on an unused railway line in South Dakota. Ha! Guy Burgess exclaimed, grinning with his wide, fish-like mouth. That's splendid. What are they planning on doing with it? What indeed? The frail, weak-chinned McLean chortled in insepidly. Even if they've diluted themselves into thinking they can decontaminate all that soil and debris, he pointed out, they still got an insurmountable problem. Because what about the water supply? What are they going to do about that? Ashton's pale blue eyes gleamed with humorous enjoyment of the predicament he helped cause for his former countrymen. They don't know how they're going to safely dispose of any of the contaminated stuff, he said with a soft chuckle. Rich, very rich, Burgess bellowed breaking into helpless laughter. You mean, asked the timid McLean as ramifications dawn on him. Yes, exactly, Ashton said with a smug triumph in anticipation. It's bound to happen again. It's only a matter of time, and the terror will be loosed upon our enemies once again. They drank to it and tossed their empty glasses in the fireplace. The end. You know, I actually like the epilogue, whatever that final chapter, a lot more than when I first read it. I mean, the first part's really stupid, and the idea of the Russian subplot is stupid. However, uh, considering our current events right now on the brink of World War III with with Putin invading uh, Ukraine, um, you know, the this, this concept of Russia as uh, our number one arch nemesis from the Cold War has... It's very contemporary once again. Um, not not the Russian people, um, but the the government, the 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 figureheads like Putin and whatnot. Um, 
I really, really enjoyed reading the book again. It was way more terrifying. The first time I read it, I was terrified. That time, a little less so. But still, there are some real bone-chilling moments, I think, in that book. And it kind of makes me wish that, like, I almost want, like, like fan fiction like expansion or you know john russo still alive like i would love for him to write a follow-up i don't know maybe i wouldn't actually maybe i would really hate it i don't know maybe maybe brian use now i'd love for someone to continue the return of living dead series in novel form that would be very interesting maybe maybe um there's still talk that we will someday get a, a another return of living dead movie i welcome them uh, especially as long as they're in vain of the original film, even if they're not quite, you know, cause like look at return of living dead three, it's not quite in the vein of the original film, but it's a great movie all on its own. If you gave me a bunch, give, give us Brian Houston's original concept for return of living dead Four, hell Mary, that would be great. Um, so yeah. So next, so here's what I'm thinking about reading next. Um, no, I'm not going to tell you, I'm going to leave it as a surprise. Um, and if you're a Patreon, you will you will know before everybody else. That's one thing. So make sure to join the Patreon, yada, yada, yada. Um, thank you so much, guys, for taking this journey with me. And uh, I'll see you real soon on another video. In the meantime, peace and hair grease.